Thank you and good morning. Welcome to the March 19th, 2024 Urban Planning Committee meeting. Um, I am delighted to call us to order and to take a moment to reflect uh, that we are located in the heart of Treaty 6 and the heart of Edmonton. From time, time immemorial, diverse Indigenous nations have stewarded these lands, including the Nehiwak, Nehegwiniwak, Nakota Iska, Dene Salina, and Nitsitsapi. Many more First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples have gathered, traded, and celebrated on this land for generations. This place also forms part of the Métis homeland and is within the Métis Nation of Alberta. The signing of Treaty No. 6 in 1886-87 created a foundation of good relations, welcoming peoples to this area from around the world. Today, Edmonton carries on this tradition of welcoming peoples from many nations as we continue to live into the spirit and intent of treaty. I'll go now to a roll call of my fellow committee members. Councillor Tang. Good morning. Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Uh, and Mayor Sohi. Good morning. And we are joined in chambers by Councillor Jans and Salvador. And online, we are joined by Councillor Knack, Councillor. Good morning. Rice, Councillor Wright, Councillor Principe. Good morning. Oh, sorry. Okay, Councillor Wright, Councillor Rice. Good morning. Councillor Principe. Good morning. Count and that's it. Thank you. Councillor Tang, could I turn to you for the adoption of the agenda? Sure. Yeah, uh, I move that the March 19, 2024 Urban Planning Committee meeting agenda be adopted with the following changes. The additions of 7.1 new residential parking program curbside management strategy update to 7.2 options to address surface parking lots in center city and the quarters recommended regulatory options and 7.8 exhibition lands planning framework and outdoor festival space. Sorry, do, uh, I, do I need to read the published on the dates? Uh, no. Oh, but okay, the and then um, also just to uh, replacement attachment 7.4, uh, bus network service plan update attachment three, um, and this item will also be postponed to April 9th, uh, 2024 Urban Planning Committee. Thank you. So just to, to reemphasize, we're going to postpone item 7.4 to the April 9th Urban Planning Committee meeting. Excellent, thank you. Um, not seeing any questions, please vote. I am a yes. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Yes. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. And we're just running into some issues with East Guard, but we will correct it in the minutes. But we had a vote of four. Great. Four in favor. So that's that's carried, thank you. Next, I'll look to Councillor Tang for the approval of the minutes. Um, yes, so move the minutes from February 27th Urban Planning Committee and March 6th Urban Planning Committee, non-regular. Thank you. Any errors or omissions? If not, please vote. Yes. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. Next, we will select items for debate. Colleagues, please like to sign up. I don't think we're able to, oh, there we go. Uh, Councillor Tang, oh, sorry, Councillor Cartmel. Uh, 5.1. Okay. Councillor Tang. Oh, yeah. Um, yes, I like to select uh, with we have speakers. So seven point one, two, three, five. I know Councillor Rutherford wanted to select uh, seven point seven. Okay, I'll select uh, seven point eight. Any others? Seven six. Seven six. Uh, did we select seven four? We've postponed seven four to our next meeting. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. 
Great. Uh, let's then vote on items not selected, which I believe is 7.9. Please vote. Confirming you were the mover, Councillor Stevens? Yes, thank you. I don't know if the vote, oh, there we go. Yes. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. The, the vote doesn't seem to have come up on our end. What did for you? Okay, well, I'm a yes as well. Thank you, we have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. Uh, uh, Clerk, would you like to read back what we've completed this morning? Absolutely. Thank you, Chair Stevenson. This morning, Urban Planning Committee has passed the recommendation of the following report without debate. Bylaw item 7.9, bylaw 20743, omnibus amendment to drainage bylaw 18093 will go to council for approval. Thank you very much. I'll now uh, turn to Councillor Tang for requests to speak. Oh, yes. Um, I'd like to move that the Urban Planning Committee hear from the following speakers and panels when appropriate. For 7.1 new residential parking program, curbside management strategy, uh, we have John Collier from Windsor Park Community League Development Committee. Uh, item 7.2, options to address surface parking lot in Center City and the quarters. We have Alex Horitsu from Downtown Recovery Coalition, Punita McBrien from uh, Downtown Business Association. Uh, item 7.3, Heritage Places Strategy Options. We have Kyle Scholey, uh, Wendy Antoniak from Old Glenora Conservation Society, Lynn Odinsky from Old Glenora Conservation S Association, and David Riley from Edmonton Heritage Council. And on 7.5, Transit Priority Measures Implementation Update, we have Stephen Rates. Thank you very much. Please vote to hear from these speakers. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. We're just missing one vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. Um, I don't see any requests for time, specific time on the agenda. Anyone with a councillor inquiry? I'm not aware of any. Um, Next, then we will go to 5.1. Councillor Cartmel, I believe you had some questions on that. I do, yes, thank you, Councillor Stevenson. And I'm not sure there's anybody here to answer them, but um, it, so uh, maybe by way of a bit of a preamble, there is a site, a school site, uh, immediately adjacent to the Twilliger uh, Recreation Center, the TCRC, which, uh, I know is not ever going to be used for a school. It's not going to be built. Uh, it can't be built. There's no space for a school there. And uh, that site is uh, ripe for uh, some sort of a affordable housing facility. And I've been uh, working in the background on this for over three years. I first talked to Mayor Iveson's office about this. And I've been waiting for the public school board to declare that site surplus. And it's my understanding that that they are reticent to do that until there is some sort of meeting between the school board and council. Uh, so I'm not sure if it is this meeting or this report or this thing, but I'm wondering if anybody can tell me when we can get on with getting on with either the meeting or the declaration of that site as surplus so we can get on with very badly needed housing solutions in that corner of the city. Sure, is there anyone from administration who could speak to the, the right process for that? Councillor, uh, so you're, you're correct in terms of uh, that first step in terms of the public school uh, deeming it surplus to their needs. Uh, once that's done, the city has uh, that first right of refusal uh, and that's where your sticking point is. Uh, I think we can take that back um, and convene with the teams uh, to look at it. I don't, it's not the, uh, the right time in terms of 
I guess pushing pushing that forward, uh, we can work through the joint use agreement and our contacts with the Edmonton Public School Board uh, to impress the importance of that. Uh, however, that is ultimately their decision, um, and that's what what the hang up is, as you've mentioned. So I've asked this question repeatedly for a very long time, and I'm going to keep asking this question now publicly at every single meeting where there's anything to do with with school board land until this particular parcel is declared surplus and we can get on with this sequence of events. Um, I am very, very frustrated. The community leagues and the area council keep asking me when this is going to happen so that they can begin to build those community things around what will be a affordable housing or some sort of um, housing facility in this community next to a rec center next to a library next to a transit center uh, it's time to get on with this so uh, I hope that uh, my repeated questions will actually see some action happy to move this item Councillor Stevenson Thanks, Councillor Carmel. We'll take that as a motion on the floor, and I'll go next to Mayor Sohi. Yeah, I know if anybody here from uh, uh, housing, we we stressed strongly last time we had this conversation to get going with our meeting with the with school board. Right? I don't know how hard we can stress that meeting to happen. I think that need, that meeting needs to happen. Uh, I. Can you, can you anyone give us indication when that meeting is scheduled? I think it was supposed to be scheduled very very quickly. There's a email from the city man or the city clerk about a scheduled meeting on March 12th that was sent to us. Okay, good. So, okay, great. That They're working we'll on look, finding a date. We we'll look forward to that conversation because uh, Councilor Cardinal is right. Like you know, these things move very slowly and they should be moving very very fast. Yeah. Great. And just uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Appreciate yeah. that. Maybe just a, a final clarifying question to administration. Is there, uh, is there direction that you need from, from council to help expedite this? Or do you feel that you have what you need to, to move forward at this point? We have what we need. Uh, just to add to that, the, the meeting is scheduled for April 9th. Oh, wonderful. That's great news. Thank you very much. Really, really appreciate. And, and thank you, Councillor Cartmel, for, for flagging this for us. Uh, so, Councillor Cartmel moved the recommendation to post uh, to revise the due date until May 22nd on item 5.1. So, please vote on that. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. So, that brings us to our first public report, item 7.1. New Residential Parking Program Curbside Management Strategy Update. And I'll invite our administration down to provide a presentation. Uh, thank you, thank you. We'll go now to administration whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're here presenting the new residential parking program council report and uh, recommending that it be received for information. With me today is Craig McEwen, branch manager of Parks and Road Services, Shweekar Ibrahim, uh, director of traffic operations, and Jenny Albers, the general supervisor of planning and permitting. And I'll pass it over to Shweekar and Jenny. Thank you, Eddie. <coughs> Good morning. In order to achieve the vision of city plan and support a city that will grow to a city of two million people, we need to evolve and adjust our approach to the demands on our transportation system, including curbside spaces. The curbside management strategy recognizes that these spaces are not only a part of the road network for moving people and goods, but also one of our largest public spaces and a valuable public asset. 
Traditionally, we think of curbside spaces as parking spaces, but with the city plan, we've expanded the vision of using our space or this space to include looking at the, using them for bike or micromobility parking, temporary patios for restaurants or cafes, street activations such as street labs where we install parklets or curb extensions or planters, or for the installation of separated and active transportation lanes. The need to modernize the residential parking program is outlined as a key action in the curbside management strategy since the program has not substantially changed since it was introduced in 1978. The new residential program strategy aims to make parking easier to find and more convenient for all, respond to and direct the intensifying competition for limited curbside space with emphasis on accessibility, efficiency, and mobility equity. Support the city plan target of 50% of trips by transit and active transportation and align with Edmonton's shift to open option parking. I will pass it along to Jenny to walk us through the program information. Thank you. So in April, May 2023, administration gathered feedback from Edmontonians, including those who lived or visited residential parking program areas on their experience with the program. So the online survey received over 2,689 responses and 3,600 people visited the engaged Edmonton page. The attached What We Heard report outlines the full results, um, but some key findings included. Uh, only 56% of respondents had positive feedback about the current program. Respondents identified the need for additional available visitor parking to support residents, guests, or access to home businesses. Respondents requested regular bylaw enforcement of parking restrictions as well. Uh, administration also conducted a jurisdictional scan of other North American cities that were similar or larger size to Edmonton, um, as well as those considered leaders in parking management as per attachment two. Key findings included, all of these municipalities have year-round residential parking programs, which include annual service fees ranging from $10 to $900, and visitor parking ranging from 24 hours to 28 days. Uh, most required to either have a traffic generator, so a landmark that is likely to attract a higher than expected volume of people driving the neighborhood and or high occupancy. So when evaluating Edmonton's 19 program areas, it became clear that they were not always applied consistently or as a solution to parking congestion. In the past, the only criteria that was required uh, was for a neighborhood to garner two-thirds support for a residential parking program. This was measured using a survey that residents would conduct and provide back to the city. There was no criteria used to account for parking congestion or traffic generation. Program areas varied in scope and size in between areas. So as an example, some programs were entire neighborhoods while others could just be a block or two. There is also substantial variation in the parking restrictions that exist. So some residential parking programs have resident-only parking at all times, while others have restrictions on event days or specific days or specific times of the day. Finally, once areas were implemented, there was never an evaluation to determine their effectiveness. So the main objective of the program moving forwards will be to address congestion caused by high parking demand and ensure the alignment with the curbside management strategy which considers curbsides as a public asset. Administration has recommended program changes that will ensure that they are data-driven and will create consistency between program areas. We will evaluate the parking demand and congestion in the area to determine if a parking program is suitable. Finally, we will be regularly evaluating areas with the program to ensure that the program is balancing the needs of both residents, residents and visitors for access to curbside space. Next slide, please. Uh, for the new residential parking program, a program framework was developed to modernize the program and align with the curbside management strategy and to support the goals of the city plan. So in order to create a data-driven framework, clear criteria has been established to capture parking, parking demand and define traffic generators. So for the program, a program area will require at least one traffic generator. So that would include post-secondary institutions with at least 5,000 students, major event venues with over 10,000 attendees with no private parking options, or an active LRT station with adjoining transit center with no public and or private park and ride facility. 
The program area must also be located within a set distance of the traffic generator. So an area needs to be within uh, 800 meters, so about a 10 minute walk of a traffic generator and should be not separated by an arterial road. As mentioned, consistency is another driver for the new program framework. So the program will be yet residential and year round and the parking hours in the residential parking program will align with e-park hours to ensure consistency in people's expectations around parking. So that's Monday to Saturday, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., and then Sundays from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., and then outside of those hours, it's unrestricted uh, parking. I'd also like to highlight that even if an area may not be eligible for residential parking program, there are alternative parking strategies that we can implement, such as e-park or time restrictions. Residential parking program is one tool in the toolkit of measures that is available to manage parking needs. Uh, so with the new residential parking program, there are several program features to increase the equitability of the program. So the first one's the fee structure. So one of the actions outlined in the curbside management strategy was to look at introducing a fee for the residential parking program areas. Since the program is rolling out this fall, partial fees would be introduced this year, so $40 from September to December, and then the full fees would be $120 per year. Discounted rates would be available to students and low-income residents, uh, which would be consistent with the city's leisure access program and ride transit programs. Uh, permits will also look a little bit different, so we will be issuing digital permits to improve the efficiency of data collection, but also for enforcement. Uh, active program areas may request up to two permits per household to park their vehicle on street during program hours. Um, however, student permits would be exempt from the two permit maximum. So for students enrolled in the post-secondary institution, um, that's adjacent, adjacent in their program area. Uh, residents living in multi-residential buildings of all sizes that are located within an active program would be eligible for parking permits. So as previously, the program only allowed multi-residential buildings of four stories or less to be included. And then finally around visitor parking. So all program areas will include two hour visitor parking with no permits required during the program hours. This will improve equitable access to the area while ensuring parking turnover for competing demands. And I will pass it back over to Shrikar. Thank you, Jenny. <clears throat> Administration considered three options um, for the new residential parking program to keep the existing program but with, limited, with some limited changes, to keep the existing program and introduce the new paid permits, and to implement the changes recommended previously. Unless otherwise directed, administration will proceed with the implementation of the new residential parking program as outlined in this presentation and as detailed in attachment one of the report. Of the options considered, this is the only op approach that ensures that we are in alignment with the city plan and the curbside management strategy and this option also reflects the learnings from the 2023 public engagement, a Canadian jurisdictional review, as well as a review of the current program operations. It also balances the needs of the residents who live near major traffic generators where parking is consistently limited without other options that are available to them. And speaking of the next steps, all 19 program areas have been reviewed and the majority do not meet the new criteria. The pink zones uh, represented on this map are the areas that will continue to have a residential parking program. We plan to communicate program changes to all impacted residents beginning April 2024, as all active residential parking program permits will expire on May 31st. New digital permits are planned to be issued before then for areas that do meet the new framework. However, um, yeah, sorry, that meet the new framework. Um, program areas do not, that do not meet the new framework will be removed. Some program areas that are continuing will be reduced in size to align with the new framework. Alternative strategies, as Jenny mentioned, may be reviewed and implemented for areas where non-parking related concerns such as speeding may have been a factor in the original program implementation and we will continue to consult with communities as necessary. We will also complete a parking utilization study before and after the changes to assist with understanding the impact of the new program. Parking program sign removals will start in June and continue until completed and program areas will be prioritized by, based on seasonal needs and applications will be open for new program areas starting in 2025. We're happy to answer any questions after the speakers. Thank, Thank you very much. We'll go now to our speaker on this item. Uh, John Collier, are you there? <coughs> yes, I am. Am I coming through? You are, yeah, loud and a little quiet if you're able to, to sit closer to the microphone. Um, in case you haven't spoken to committee before, just a reminder that you will have five minutes to speak. Uh, there's a timer up on 
the screen. Uh, it will be green for the first four minutes, yellow when there's one minute left, and then flashing red. We have quite a heavy agenda, so I will be strict on that timeline. Um, I think you're the only one speaking on this item, so when you're done speaking, uh, my colleagues on committee and council will have an opportunity to ask you some questions, so please don't go anywhere. Um, and just remember to mute your microphone when you're not speaking, and uh, refrain from using the raise hand function. If you have any technical difficulties, you can reach out to the clerk at city.clerk at edmonton.ca. Thank you very much, and uh, over to you. Thank you very much. I'll be very brief, and I apologize for having a cold, though I'm glad to have a cold remotely, which is a lot better than what might be. Uh, just a couple of quick comments. Number one, um, the survey was great. Thank you so much. But there is no ongoing consultation with the communities. So I'm going to raise one point. Uh, structures more than four stories with residences will now be allowed to have permits. So we have a school area, and there are two... Uh, major projects going in. There's going to be 300 new residences. And, you know, I think that there be might be an uptake in uh, in parking permits. And this area is a narrow street. During pickup and drop off, the street is completely full of parents picking up their children. And I just I'm concerned that this one particular area, the changes being brought into effect are, are go we're going to have problems. And we would certainly appreciate the Transportation Department actually meeting with us to discuss strategies for this area and how we are going to deal with a sudden increase in people with permits wanting to park in that area. Um, the other thing I want to bring up is that I'm not entirely sure <clears throat> that the... Uh, the designated 800 meters or whatever the 10 minute walk is, is going to be sufficient. Um, I I'm certainly want to go ahead and try it. And if it works out, hallelujah, that's great. I walked down to Emily Murphy Park this morning, 7.30 in the morning. There were 42 cars already parked down there. And no, they are not recreational users. That parking lot is jam packed every day that the university is in session, people park down there for free and they walk up and then they walk back down. And that's more than the 800 meter zone. By the way, I'm not suggesting that you get in there and close the parking lot or anything. I'm just bringing this up as an example of what people are willing to do. So uh, they get a nice walk and also they get to join traffic outside of all the schmozzle that happens on the various traffic circles and intersections. They can just go straight onto Grout Road or straight onto River Road. So I understand the motivation, <clears throat> excuse me. So I just really concerned that administration is gonna jump in, wholesale, get rid of all the signs, spend 40, 50, 100,000 or whatever dollars they're gonna spend and then we're gonna to have to go back and do something differently. Um, those are my concerns. I appreciate you listening. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much for, for presenting to us this morning. Um, I'll just look to my colleagues to click in with any questions they may have. Um, maybe I'll, I'll start if, uh, if I'm not seeing anyone else there. I really appreciate uh, the discussion today. Um, so you, you mentioned that you took part in the survey, which is really great. Um, was there, did, did that sort of get you on a mailing list where you received other updates about the project? Uh, not to my knowledge. Okay. And then what, what is your feeling and what are you hearing from neighbors about the introduction of a, of a fee for the parking pass? Um, I can only speak personally on this. Sure. I, I have no problem with a fee. I understand the administrative costs necessary with uh, with running this sort of program and that the city has considerable expenses, expenses and we don't want to increase taxes. So personally, I do not have a problem. Okay, great. Well, that's really helpful. I appreciate it. Uh, I think your presentation was very clear. I'm not seeing any other questions from my colleagues. So um, you're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting, but but your your role in it is is now completed. Thank you again so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Great. Uh, so thanks, colleagues. We'll go now to questions of administration. Just give a moment for people to, to click in. Councillor Jans, I see you up there, so happy to go to you first. I have no committee members first. I just want to ask administration to respond to uh, or thoughts regarding um, 
uh, guest callers' concerns around um, uh, both, in particular, the the multi unit plex across from the school and the limited the limited parking on that loop there, with 87th Ave being an arterial, and then um, uh, also the the potential concerns about rollout, about when like when this will start, and is there value in a delay? I can I can probably get started on that, and then I'll go to the ask the team for a couple more details. I think in general, what what we wanted to get across with this report is um, this present or sorry this this program in particular is is really intended to um, refresh the program. It hasn't been updated since uh, the late 1970s, and the uh, the reason for the RPP program in these 19 particular areas um, came together for a number of reasons. Uh, and they're not consistent. The timings are, uh, or sorry, the, the restrictions are inconsistent. Uh, and so really what we wanted to do is, is to look at other major municipalities across uh, Canada and, and, and North America and say, well, what makes sense for the best use of public roadway? So this is public space. It's public roads. Um, we're not looking to, to create a, uh, a quasi-gated neighborhood by, by having only residents park in certain areas. Um, so it is public space available for the public. Um, and so what we're trying to do is, is look at what are the major drivers for traffic um, that are unavoidable. Uh, and so recognizing that we, we don't want to uh, completely get rid of the entire program, but update it um, based on the, the research uh, and, and the trends we're seeing. Uh, and so in this particular area, reducing it, but not eliminating it in this particular area was, was the way to go um, to try to try to really have it narrowed in for the, the purpose of this residential parking program. Um, so in, in general, that's what we're trying to achieve with this report. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll just ask uh, Shweka or Jenny to speak to the particulars around that one, but, but that one road. For sure. Um, I think overall, so in, including the multi-residential buildings was a mention on that end. So that aligns with the open option parking piece. So we're allowing them to be included in the parking program so that they're also able to park on the street, which they weren't before unless they were four stories or less. Um, overall, though, there should be enough parking for both visitors and residents, uh, but with the turnover and occupancy that comes with it. So with the new parking program approach, it's maximum two hours parking for a visitor. Um, so that should minimize the impact from students that may want to park in the neighborhood because it's only two hours to park there within the parking program hours piece. Uh, the other piece I was gonna mention about Emily Murphy Park, that's something we could take a look at as well because there's the parking space uh, in the park specifically. So we can take that away to see if we could add some time restrictions that support more for the park users versus uh, students parking there for the full day. And about the delay in the program, what would be the effect of starting at say in August instead of May? So we did plan it to start in like September officially the program. The idea is that um, we know that this is a post-secondary school rush, right? Yeah, area, and that's the thing. We would do the sign changes off season of post-secondary. So we do the sign changes between June to August when there's less parkers coming into the space, and that they're ready to go for September. So that change of behavior is all ready to go to change for September once the students are coming back in as well. Okay. I, I could also add that the. Um, we have been communicating with those who are in the different programs to say that, hey, we've heard your feedback, um, that this isn't, uh, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the residents that are in a residential parking program area um, have expressed concern with the program. Um, we have communicated that there will be changes coming. Um, we have delayed the report a couple times in order to gather feedback from council and, and, the, uh, uh, and the public. Um, so at this point, I feel like there, are, there is anticipation for, for change, for an update. Um, and so that was that was based on, or sort of the timings are based on that that, um, that coming all together. So May is sort of end of the university semester, and then there's summer school. Is that sort of the the rationale for doing it in May and and like making the change over the spring summer? Uh, yes, for the sign changes. So we'll mostly focus on Commonwealth first for the sign changes because of their event season coming up, and then the post secondary. Um, or programs adjacent to post-secondary, so Nate, Windsor Park, Garneau would be next, um, but it'd be more off-peak season of the school year, so it'll be easier to create those sign changes and be ready for the September influx. Yeah, so Councillor Jens, if I can just <clears throat> clarify, so the changes to the program, since there are 
a number of program areas that have to see the signage changes. It's going to begin because we can't do them all at once. So we got to do them phased over over the next couple of months. But the effectiveness of the actual program wouldn't actually come in, like it wouldn't be in effect until September. Got it. So okay. it's just that the phased approach of introducing or making the changes or the removals <coughs> is going to begin in May after we've had an opportunity to communicate to all of the residents in the oh, okay. area. Okay, okay, so, that was my misunderstanding. Great, mm -hmm. thank you, Councillor Jans. Mayor Sohi? Thank you. Uh, you want to focus on more of, more of the equity lens to this. Uh, you know, if somebody owns their private residence and they have a garage, they have a, you know, driveway, they can park on their private property, but someone living in an apartment building or somebody renting a basement uh, or, uh, you know, or somebody renting a room, uh, they don't have access to public transit if they don't, uh, are we not burdening the people who are already struggling with the affordability crisis at a time when everything else is going up, right, by asking them to pay this fee? So, um, Mayor, uh, there's, there's a couple of different options. So the fee that's introduced, um, not everybody that lives in the neighborhood has to pay that fee. It's only if they would like to park on the street. So if people have um, parking garages or driveways. Yeah, I'm not like, yeah, I, it's, correct. they have, the, 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 those correct. people have choice. Yes. Right? Somebody living in a basement suite may not have a choice. Somebody yeah. living in an apartment building may not have a choice, right? Correct. Those are the people I worry about. Like, they're already struggling. They're in the... In the in the in the in the bottom of the uh, you know economic uh, yeah. ladder, however you want to describe it, right? So, are we not further penalizing those people? Yeah. So, so there's a few things. So, one is we are seeing uh, much fewer RPP areas than we have in the past. There's yes. Yeah. A significantly lower uh, number of locations that would be candidate for the program, and um, there would be discounted fees for anybody that's um, like from anybody that's from like a low, low income or from the students as well. So okay. I, I understand that, but I think what we're seeing with what would we expect to see anyway is is um, wanting to make sure that there is parking that's available to them if their neighborhood is expecting to see an influx of uh, traffic as a result of a landmark, right? Yeah. So it's it's for sort of providing a little bit of space for them in order for them to be able to park, but then also taking an equity lens by making sure that it's discounted and within within their means to be able to. Oh, is, to is, it, would the fee is this spot reserved, or you still have to look for a spot on the street? The 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 hundred twenty dollar fee per year uh, would be um, not a specific spot in front of one's residence. It would be to allow unlimited parking in that particular yeah. zone. They then still have to find the spot, right? They, they still have to find a spot. And I will mention that um, the discounted rates, it would align with the leisure access pass okay. and the ride transit programs. Um, so then residents are able to apply for those discounted parking rates through the through the new app. What is that discounted rate, sorry? Um, they're they're going to be available for low-income households, students, and other needs, as other special needs groups um, that are defined by uh, CRA annual low-income cutoff figures, but I'm not sure what the, the rate is. Yeah, we would be working with our um, colleagues in assessment and taxation to to come up with the with the rate that makes sense for for the for the income level. Okay, for example, for leisure access program, we don't charge anything for uh, for low income. So it'd be similar to the more of the transit, uh, the, tra the transit ride program. Oh, I see. Okay, which is a discounted rate, but you still correct still still charge. Yeah. So currently, the hundred and twenty dollar fee is about ten dollars per per month right to, to be able to park according to the to this calculation so we would look at what what the discounted rate would be have you looked into calgary situation i think it really blew up in calgary right it uh, was a huge amount of opposition from residents yes how, how is this different from calgary um calgary's is also a cost recovery model for the program piece so i know that they had quite higher permit fees up front um, that had a higher cost to residents because um, when we looked at other jurisdictions, I'd mentioned like the fees range from like 90 to $900 a year. So having that 120 lower fee overall should be supportive within that. Um, but also we've looked at reducing our programs a lot more. Um, so in uh, removing a current program area, we're actually providing more access and availability to residents to park on their street. Okay. Um, so having that sort of shift um, compared to Calgary should help to support residents. With so the, the geographical areas are shrinking, right? 
and the fee is less than what Calgary was proposing? Yeah. Yeah, they, yeah, and that's what I was mentioning. It was more cost recovery, so they had quite a higher fee to be able to cost recovery the whole program. <laughs> we're able to do it within our operational budget to support the program, and then with a small fee to residents um, for the convenience of having the program in their neighborhood. Okay. So that 120 covers for a little bit of the cost recovery, or like about a percentage of cost recovery? Correct. Know? So uh, part of it would go towards the cost of the just the digital fee from the app that we would be using. Okay. And then the other part of the cost would be to uh, towards employ towards uh, bylaw enforcement. Mm -hmm. So ensuring that some of that funding is going towards increased presence of enforcement in the neighborhoods. Got it. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you for those questions, Mayor Sohi. Just wanted to, to clarify my understanding. I think in attachment two, we see that Calgary is up to $105. So did they change They change their fees? Okay, great. Yeah, I, I think when the program was first introduced, it was in the higher, uh, like, I, I want to say maybe $600 to $700. Okay. I, think it was, I think it was a little bit on the higher end. And then there was a bit of a change, a revision to the program um, after, the, after the reaction. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I just want to start by saying I think this is really exciting work and, and really necessary work. I think anytime we've had a program in place for multiple decades and haven't haven't reviewed it, it's really ripe for that that review and discussion. So really appreciate the work that's been done and, and the analysis that's happened. Um, I, I wanted to dig in a little bit more um, in terms of some of the changes to the, the boundaries and areas. So a first question was just sort of around whether there was an analysis of um, the existing number of permit holders in these areas. Did we look at, like, are there some areas where there's more uptake, less uptake? What, what did we see when we looked at that? Um, so overall in our 19 residential parking program areas, it's about 5,000 permits as a whole. So we have had that two hour or two permits per household cap for the last couple of years. Um, so that would be about 2,500 household pieces of it. Um, over the last program uh, areas. However, it's been free for residents to apply. So most residents usually apply for the two permits if they have two vehicles, um, and then they have the availability to use it on street if they like um, for the convenience. And did we look at sort of the number of households in, in one of the areas versus the number of permits that, that were held? Uh, we did review um, the different areas to see, especially with the including of other multi-residential buildings um, above the four stories piece. Um, but we did review overall. We did take a look at the um, in the survey as well um, to ask uh, who was using their permits and why they were using for their permits. Um, but we mostly heard permits were used for convenience or um, not enough space in the garage or not backing in certain vehicles. So. Um, overall, that's what we heard. We only heard about 16% actually required the permits because they didn't have any private parking options available on site. Sure. And did we ask in the survey if they would still get a permit if, if there was a fee attached to it? Uh, no, we did not mention any um, pieces about the fee specifically in the survey. Okay, because I, you know, something that occurs to me is um, I know previously our policies required thresholds, so a certain number of households in the area had to had to agree that they wanted this. I'm just wondering what happens if, you know, when we introduce the fee, we see a, a sharp decline in the number of people wanting passes and what that means for the program. Um, yeah, so, and I think we will probably see a decline because there is a fee associated. It is up to the resident to decide if they would like to park on the street. Um, within like the program hours. Um, residents could also park for two hours on street or overnight for free and not um, require permits. So it's really based on their individual needs. Um, they may also decide to clean out their garage and be able to park in the garage and not have a permit on the street. So most likely our permits will reduce a bit um, because of the fee piece. However, we're also including larger multi-residential buildings in the program. Um, so it will depend on their parking behavior changes um, they may choose to park on street versus parking uh, in the parking area mm -hmm. of the building. Yeah, and I just wonder how, you know, would there be a point at which there wouldn't be enough participants to justify the, the program continuing? And we can take that, like, we, we, we can review that, Councillor Stevenson. I think it's, it's tough to make those decisions right now since we're, we're not really sure how 
like what, what the impact is going to be to the permits. We're also significantly reducing the number of RPP areas as well as yeah. part of the review pro of the, the program, but we absolutely commit to being flexible and nimble and reviewing, doing the evaluations, understanding what the changes are and what, what next steps could look like for, for the next round of RPP areas. Great, great. Well, you know, and that, and that sort of aligns just in terms of some of the boundary changes. So we've, we've connected in the past just about the proposed changes in uh, the we Quentwin neighborhood and how, um, you know, those are very small micro areas, uh, primarily, I think, exclusively servicing single detached heritage homes that have no on-site parking and no ability to add on-site parking. So what, what is the approach in those areas? I think, I think the approach in those types of areas would be to try to open up additional parking for everyone in that area. So in some of those neighborhoods, there were uh, e-park or time restrictions in adjacent areas. And so removing those would open up additional options. And, and so, so I, I, I appreciate that point on one side. However, I think, I think our overall curbside management talks about how parking management is what helps with availability, right? Having time restrictions, having e-park is what, what creates the turnover and creates availability. So I'm, I'm struggling if, if we remove all of those regulations, how is that going to enhance availability for the, for the residents? Um, I think as a whole, so heritage homes or historical homes that may not have private parking on site, that might have to be a larger review as a whole because mm. um, outside of the neighborhood, they're across the city. Um, so that might be a larger review to take away um, to review how we can support parking on site where they might not have private parking options, but want to be included as a residential parking program is the best strategy. Perfect. Thank you. I've gone over my own time. Um, Councillor Tang, next. Um, great. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I'm just wondering do you, if you have any uh, response to some of the feedback from residents like the speaker today around that, that period between May and September. Yeah, councillor, so the, the May to September is mostly like a transition phase for us to be able to make the signage changes. Mm -hmm. So um, it's it's just going to be a phased approach because we wouldn't be able to go in and make the changes all at once. So, so even if you delay it, let's say you extend instead of... May 31st or whatever until a little bit later. You still need a transition period for installation. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, so the program itself wouldn't. Oh, sorry. Uh, the program itself wouldn't come into effect until September. Yeah. So the May to September is just is just to give space for folks. So as an example, if um, if some of the residents have you know things in their in their garage that they want to take time to right. clear You're out, giving or, people that. Yeah. That, or whatever that whatever time. alternative strategy. So it's more of a transition time for 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 the public, but also for administration to be yeah. able to roll out the program. Yeah. I mean, I think some people. Loved it so much. They want to don't they don't want that period to be, um, but I think it sounds like your team really need that. Um, I was wondering, um, what if people? Oh, so the so the new neighborhoods can apply for the program starting in twenty twenty five, and and there will be a fairly straightforward process to do that. They can phone through round one and be directed to the website, right? Okay, and then is it neighborhoods in those designated area or? What about if they're outside? Of it, the it could be any neighborhood. And okay. so really what we're going to be looking at is the overall criteria. Is okay. does, it, does it connect to those large facilities okay. that have um, is over 5,000 uh, um, attendees uh, right. and those large, like, those large traffic generators? That'll be the first criteria. Is it so within then, that So then if, they're, if they don't fall into that, it'll be like, sorry. That, that's right. We'll be waiting for the next phase or something. Right. So correct, Councillor, but also it depends on like what the actual concerns are. So if the if the yes, RPP is absolutely. not the, is not the ideal solution for You'll the issue that we're seeing tools. there, there are other alternative strategies or other programs across the corporation that we can utilize as well. Right, and then just um, in terms of the definition of the traffic generator, you know, a hospital, for example, is not on that list because presumably they have their own parking, et cetera. But like, don't post secondary also have their own parking? They do, um, but as mentioned too, like yeah. um, there are students going to post-secondary, so we assume that students will want to go for right. the free parking. They also have post-secondaries have different, um, like they're quite large in the different right. utilization that they have. Because I'm thinking of the hospitals too, because there's patients and families and, and there's that volume as well, despite yeah. existing parking space, predominantly for, you know, staff. Um, we did say for post-secondaries, 5,000 or more students, so it wouldn't be all post-secondaries. That's no. why the University That's a good distinction. of Alberta and Nate are included. They're over 5,000, but for example, Concordia is under 5,000 students and wouldn't be included. Would you ever consider hospitals down the road 
I'll just put this out there. We've had this conversation about gray nuns, for example, in Millwoods. Um, you know, they've had parking issues for a long time, but it's hard to know still with the RT there and how that's a impacting traffic and parking? Yeah, Councillor, our, our approach is to really make sure that the program is servicing the needs of the visitors and the and the, and the and the residents as well, right? Yeah. So it's not to, like if, if we, once we're doing the evaluation, if we see that we need to change the criteria or modify it or add something or remove something, we're open to that as well. So it's, it'll be a flexible process. Yes, absolutely. Okay, and then you'll be taking some of those feedback in. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's very clear, thank you. Um, I think, yeah, I think I think that's it for me. Thank you, Councillor oh Tang. Um, we will start on the second round with uh, uh, Councillor Chance. Oh, just to speak to it. Okay, Councillor Salvador. Sorry, your first round. I apologize. No, no problem at all. Thanks so much. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I really appreciate the the report and. Um, the overall data-driven approach. I think uh, it's it's evident to me that there's equity and fairness embedded in this approach, which is a, an important change from how the program was uh, functioning in the past. So my questions are just around um, some of the rationale for the traffic generators. Uh, so for example, like with post-secondary institutions, I'm just wondering how we arrived at the 5,000 student threshold. Um, so we did do a jurisdictional scan and reviewed uh, different traffic generators in other areas. Um, Post-secondaries, we saw 5,000 was a good threshold um, for the city of Edmonton. If we look at Rogers Place, so we do a Rogers Place event zone, um, and we activate that when it's over 10,000 individuals on that end um, for one-time events, so 5,000 was a pretty good cap. We did review other universities to see um, if they were close to the 5,000, but they're quite significantly lower, such as Concordia. Um, Norquest wouldn't be included because it's not in a residential area, it's in a commercial area. Um, so the 5,000 was a good fit for the city, um, but there wasn't sort of a close contender that didn't meet the mark on that piece. Okay, that's helpful. And yeah, my question was specifically around Concordia. Um, and I guess to your, to your earlier point, uh, could you... Could you maybe just take a moment to outline some of the other potential tools um, beyond the residential parking program that, um, yeah, could be could be in play in the future? For sure. So I think first off, it's looking at if it's parking related. So if there's high demand in an area due to parking specifically, and then if it is parking specifically, we could look at different options. We can add in time restrictions, so like a two hour, three hour max time restriction that helps with turnover of the area. Um, we can also add in um, max times for specific times of the day, so we can um, add in that there is no parking during certain times of the weekday or the weekend to ensure there's turnover. Um, also, we can implement e-park paid parking um, might help or sort of like adjacent to neighborhoods where there's a lot of commercial area um, because sometimes residential can be bordering commercial and that e-park might help um, as well nearby. Um, so we definitely have some different uh, parking uh, pieces in the toolkit, but then it's also reviewing if it's not parking related, um, how else can it be supported? So if it's more about uh, speeding in the neighborhood, if it's more just increased congestion in the area, or sometimes we've heard too, it's more around safety or noise or littering. So what other community programs mm -hmm. could support that rather than um, parking restrictions? Because we do want to still provide access to the neighborhood. Um, and a parking restriction might not always be the best fit. Right, right. Okay, that's super helpful. Um, I also just wanted to uh, ask about the, yeah, the major event venues uh, and the minimum 10,000 plus capacity with active year-round events. How are we defining active year-round events? Um, so active year-round, uh, it would be overall, so it wouldn't be seasonal because we found that some event venues are very seasonal, sort of that June, July, and August piece. So we really want to make sure traffic generator is year-round. Um, so Commonwealth was included. They do um, events outside of the spring, summer season during the winter. Um, and we wanted that stability for the Commonwealth program because right now it is based off of the events only and it's very confusing to residents and visitors if there's parking program or not. Mm. Um, so that was included for that specifically. Um, Any, did you have a specific event yeah, venue? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I have questions about um, Expo Center and 
yeah, whether whether the frequency and scale of the events that happen there on, on a year-round basis um, would tip into this. That's, that's where my questions are okay. coming from. Um, for the Expo Center, so it is a larger event venue, however, it has a lot of private parking on site to manage those pieces, so that's what also came in. Um, so, for example, at Commonwealth Stadium, they don't have a park and ride on game days. They also have an LRT transit center there. They don't have a lot of private parking options, whereas the Expo Center does have quite a substantial parking option on site. Um, programs in that area, too, were added in due to the old stadium in the past, which isn't, like, would maybe make sense if it was still active, but as it's not active, those programs would be removed. Okay, I'll, I'll come back for another round, but thank you for those answers. Thank you very much, Councillor Salvador. Um, I'll, I'll continue on with a few questions in a similar, in similar vein. So just wanting to understand the criteria piece again. So um, I understand one of the criteria is an LRT station with a transit centre. So I was just unclear then why Century Place and Southgate were removed. Uh, yes, so it's an LRT with a transit center with no public or private park and ride. So Century Place does is uh, yeah, it is an mm. LRT station with a transit center with no public or private park and ride. Um, but when you put the radius of the 800 meter piece on it, um, there's two major arterial roads. Um, so a part of our program would be stopping the program at the arterial roads. So if you look within that radius, it's only like commercial university area. It's not residential. So a program wouldn't be implemented there because the idea, we have two major arterial roads, it's over a 10 minute walk outside of that 800 meter radius to go and park in those neighborhoods, which should be a deterrent on that end. And if I can, and, if I can add, Councillor Stevenson, as well as um, you said, the Century Park has been in place for quite a bit of time, and the residential parking program that's on there is actually on the other side of 111 Street. Like it's not even on the on the on the residential side um, to the east. So we did take a look into like what the current operations are and the parking requirements that are that are that existing or the parking demand that existing into consideration as well. So that's that's one of the reasons why we had taken it out, and and, and similarly for. The, the new the new LRT as well um, goes in operation, and I you know and I think I think there's there's logic to that for sure. I'm just wondering how we've grounded that in in evidence and and research. I, for example, I know <clears throat> a, a two hour parking restriction was brought in in the Belvedere neighborhood, and it was because people were were parking sort of on 66th Street, I think, and they would cross Fort Road, which in my mind is a very large arterial um, from the transit station and, and LRT, so. So I feel like we do have evidence and that, that people will, that those aren't necessarily barriers that prevent people from parking in those locations. So just wondering what, what we've done to tease that out. Um, I think it's also a bit of a boat shift with the city plan as well. So we're not deterring all, like to be able to park in a neighborhood and then take the LRT or the bus is also aligning with our mode shift of 50% of all uh, trips by active transportation or transit. So that is encouraging them to shift in that direction. Um, so we still want to um, be able to provide that opportunity, um, but of course reviewing. So in the future, if we do see there's high parking demand, um, as you mentioned, like we could add time restrictions as well to ensure that there's a bit of turnover in the area as well. Okay, so I'm sort of hearing that <clears throat> that we would we would consider that we would consider sort of on street park and ride to to be acceptable to. I, so I think Councillor Stevenson, when, when we were looking at this program, the, the guiding principles for it was that the, the curbside space is, is sort of a public asset, correct? We wanted to make sure that we, we are prior, prioritizing the need for that parking to be available to residents in areas where we're expecting to see a large influx of traffic. So the guiding principles for, for the criteria itself was either looking at the operational impacts and parking demand that existed in Edmonton, like at existing locations, how is parking being utilized, what, are, what have been the current strategies that we've had, what have been the concerns that we've been hearing from the public. That was also aligning with the jurisdiction scan to understand how other jurisdictions are defining um, their, their, their criteria as well. Um, as well as looking at, at part of the research. So it's not it's not necessarily that it's a it's a blanket decision everywhere. Like I think we were trying to be nimble and 
and flexible in, in understanding what the current, what the local context is that's required as well, right? And so if there's any changes that we would need to do, like we are committing to evaluating the locations to understand the changes before and after the changes were made, whether it's removal or, or, um, or maintaining or there's or the slight reduction. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And I think, um, you know, where, where I'm kind of leading and, and certainly happy to hear more of the questions and discussion is maybe, maybe sort of, pausing on that 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 boundary change just to do a bit more of that that assessment and and digging into those pieces but um certainly have some more conversations uh on that yeah i did just want to go back again to that question of you know sort of the potential actually you know what i'll i'll just wait there and i will um uh, go next to Councillor Rice for questions. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Chair Stevenson. Um, uh, thank you very much and for the presentations. There are lots of uh, uh, new information there. And so my question is related to the Century Park station. Uh, Century Park is the only LT station in South Edmonton, and is not actually serves so many, so many our Edmontonians who take the ART and to the different direction. So right now, based on assessment results, because there's no traffic generator, so this removed and from the uh, program, uh, that is assessment results. So I just want to ask a question and then with this change, this Century Park take out and what type of information, what impact and for the public need to know and then for their planning, their, um, their uh, transportation and for other type of for parking. So I would like to have a little bit of information and in the record for the public to know this change, what the impact could be for the public. Yeah, Councillor Rice, and, and part of the communication plan with the rollout of this program would be to send a mail out to all of the residents in all of the areas to advise them of what the changes are. And so, um, uh, and, uh, uh, so that so the, the the residents in the neighborhood where you're mentioning on the other side of 111th Street across from the LRT station would be receiving uh, a notice advising them of what the changes are and and um, and and if they have any questions we would you know either uh, forward them to 311 or to contact us directly if they have any specific questions around how they can find parking or or even to share their feedback around experiences um, after the change as well. Uh, so there are two points here. The first one around Century Park is not only one uh, neighborhood, the like Brook Hill, and we, we had a discussion about the Brook Hill before, and also Stanley Hour and the Ehrman Skin, and uh, right across 23rd Avenue is uh, Skywater. Um, so for those neighborhoods, is what I heard here is only one neighborhood. So you just cross 111th Street, that's his Brook Hill area, receive the notice for the change. And how about the rest of the neighborhoods? In, in the residential parking program, the way um, those boundaries are defined, it was just, it's one area, but um, definitely recognize that it bridges multiple different uh, neighborhoods. Like, so it's, it's just the different language you're using is that one particular uh, labeled residential parking program is, is is one, but it's it is over uh, a few, and so that one that's beside Century Park, as an example, um, does bridge south of Twenty Third Ave into the Sky Rattler neighborhood, um, but we yeah. just have it labeled as the one Century Park um, residential area. parking program. Yeah, so it's quite far in terms of okay. some of those neighborhoods on the Twenty Two A Avenue area, uh, all the way down to Twenty One Avenue, um, are within the program, um, but are quite a distance and a, over the arterial of 23rd Ave away from Century Park itself. Um, so that is uh, for, the, for the surrounding neighborhoods. And then for the public who actually come to Century Park Station to take RT and for those uh, are Edmontonians and there, I believe there's a huge number there. So what's those change impact on those people? Yes, so the public in any of the residential parking program areas that'll be removed, um, the public will see when they go into that area that'll be unrestricted parking, so they can park there maximum 72 hours as per the traffic bylaw. Um, but it will be t depend if they change their behaviors to go into the neighborhood. Um, so we'll watch that shift of now these uh, residential parking programs will be removed. They'll be able to park um, where they might not have been able to park previously and be able to visit friends, families, or home businesses nearby. 
So is that proper to, is that uh, is that proper to say and then for the public who are come to Central Park Station to take her tea and they have more spaces in the surrounding neighborhoods and for their to park their cars? No, Councillor Rice, it wouldn't be necessarily advertising that there's that there's more space that's available to them. Like the information would be available, would be posted publicly. Um, it would be posted on the website. There'd be information that would be available for the public. But it's mostly just on, like communicating the, the changes to the program area specifically. So as people are uh, um, approaching the neighborhoods, they might start to see that the signage are not is not there. For instance, for the parking restrictions. But like I said, we would be evaluating the program to see whether we do see any changes in the driver behavior, if we see more parking use such as that's happening in a, in a neighborhood as an example, and then what alternative strategies might be there as well to address oh. that, to address that demand anyway. Okay, so uh, I, I still have a few questions, but uh, I, I would like to follow up offline regarding this and because there is balance and between the demanding for the parking and also the concerns and in the surrounding neighborhoods and for increased parking in the neighborhoods. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, Councillor Cartmel. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. So I understand that you're going to review these as they go. If, it, if there's problems, then we'll revisit just generally. Yeah. As, as part of the program, yes. Yeah. yeah. So I think there might be a bit of a metric you're missing in the deep south suburbs. And I, I, I understand that you're saying how far will you, would a person walk, how many arterials will they cross. Here's the one I think you're missing. My option is to stand at the transit center and wait for the bus to take me to the deep suburb or bring my car and walk a little farther. So in our house, if you arrive at South Campus later than quarter to six, you don't get home. It, it's about a 45 minute wait for the bus. So if you can park a 15 minute walk away in Windsor Park from South Campus, you will. And you'll cross three or four roads because you'll get home a half hour earlier. So if, if, you're, if you wanna go to the Century Park Station and take the LRT in, and you know your return trip is going to mean that you're going to not get an on-demand or you're going to have to fight for one or you're going to have to wait for one. If I can drag my car to within a 15-minute walk, I'm doing that. And I will cross roads, busy roads. I will walk a mile because I will save that time at the end. So I think, you're, I think the idea that people won't walk any farther than five minutes or, or 10 minutes, I think you need to compare that to the alternative bus route that takes you to your destination. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing. I think we can definitely review and see, like it'll take a while for once we remove some programs for people to change their behaviors too, yeah. so their parking behaviors, how they do transit. Um, it was interesting with the Valley Line LRT with the new station, so there was quite a lot of worry in advance that individuals thought that people were gonna park by the Mutart, um, by different stations and the residential area would be full of parking to be able same thing as like your starting or ending place um, But we're not seeing that with the new Valley Line LRT piece because um, we were ready to add some restrictions But we're not seeing that so it will sort of depend how uh, Behaviors change and we can definitely monitor that as we go. It, it leans to the anecdotal I would say but I you know, the, what I get a lot is that there's no park and ride. So for instance, with Twilliger, there's there's plan but no funding for a park and ride in Windermere, right? That would get you on the bus on the lane into South Campus. Uh, but that that is unfunded. Um, I The number of people that have said they would take the LRT into downtown or, or to the hockey game or to the football game if they had park and ride. And there's uh, three by my count, maybe more, stations on the Northeast line that have that park and ride, there's none on the south line until you and until the line gets to sent to uh, Heritage Valley. Uh, so I think that there's some that might eye this as an opportunity, and I think I think there could be pressure on those neighborhoods, and perhaps more than you think. That more than comes sorry more than comes out of that criteria that walking criteria. Yeah, and and Councillor Carthmel, I think I think the issue is that right now. Based on based on jurisdiction, based on existing situations, we don't know what that like what that impact is going to be. And yeah. so the current the current strategy that um, we're kind of following with the with the residential program is to be in alignment with the curbside management strategy and city plan. In that, we are opening up the spaces to be more than just for a particular uh, group. Right. So 
that we might see a, a little bit of a change but or a big change but I think understanding what that change is and where the source is and what the opportunities are that are available to address them is going to be what's key because so the source is going to be tricky because there are there you know another thing that I've heard and again it runs a little anecdotal because I don't have the data is that we get a number of people from out of like I'm going to say out of town so to speak County Leduc Leduc uh, you know the very very deep south that will drive to Century Park but there's such limited opportunities for parking there now that uh, it's all gone, you know, very early in the day. If people realize they can now park in the neighborhoods, that, you know, but you won't necessarily know if they're coming from Riverbend or coming from Leduc. Correct, but I, I think for the Century Park example, like on that on that one side of 111th Street, like there is no residential parking program yes. in place, right? So yeah. we would have seen that parking, that influx of parking in the residential areas right now if, if that were the case. So it's, it, like I understand where it's coming from, from like a little, little perspective, I know it's, I know it's, parking is is a valuable asset that we have yeah. um, an abundance of in Edmonton and so we, we understand that and we appreciate that that's a, a, a piece that people will feel very strongly about I think and, and worry about the the availability but the program approach that we have is to is to provide more of that space uh, available to folks and if we do see that it is actually creating a pressure on the neighborhoods in that the residents aren't actually able to find parking we are going to be looking into what we would need to do to modernize the program as well it's just at this point in time based on this current status in Edmonton based on the jurisdiction based on the research based on experiences from other um, areas we don't see that that need to include that a little bit more now, especially since a lot of these RPPs have been in place for such a long period of time. There was no evaluation at the time of, there was no evaluation even after. It was very much a sort of, a, it's installed and kind of left in. So we'd need to understand what the impact is and how the behavior is going to shift mm -hmm. to be able to understand what the next steps could look like. Great, thank you thank very you. much. Councillor Salvador. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> thank you. So I, just wanted to follow up on um, some of the questions I was asking about uh, Expo and and Exhibition Lands or Northlands um, are related to the the event events that are yeah uh, kind of happening on a rolling basis. I recognize that there's a seasonal aspect to that as well. Um, can you? And I'm asking this so I can communicate it to folks who I'm sure will have questions. Um, in those months where we are seeing events basically on a, a weekly or bi-weekly basis that are generating significant amounts of traffic in, into the neighborhood, what types of measures can be in place? And, and what does that transition look like? Like if we are going in and removing the residential parking program, um, is there gonna be kind of a lag between any new measures that are implemented or new tools? Um, we'll definitely be reviewing as we go on that end. Um, it's interesting the Expo Center because there's the Expo Center, there's the old stadium yeah. um, from there, and the parking programs are very much put in for the old stadium piece where they are on the map too. Um, so in removing them, we'll see same thing, how that change of behavior happens. Um, nearby, there's also Borden Park, which I know has a lot of festivals and events right now because Howard Lock Park is closed. Uh, but yeah, that is definitely seasonal influx in demand for parking for short periods of time, um, which we've, we we see across uh, the city. Um, so we'll kind of have to see how it goes because there's some pieces we can do for specific events and the road closure, if that's where it's coming from specifically, right. or if it's coming from the Expo Center of more long-term pieces, we can add in more time restrictions, e-park kind of to border that area. Right. Um, so that uh, the visitors are sort of parking in those areas. So right. And maybe I should, I should have provided further clarity. I mean, I, when I say Expo Center, I don't actually mean Expo Center now that I'm thinking about it. I'm talking about um, mostly south, actually, of 112 into Virginia Park, uh, where, yeah, with Heritage, Heritage Days um, or even Youth Fest, those, those and concerts, um, that's really what I've been hearing from, from community members are some of those higher traffic generators. So, yeah, not Expo itself, because I recognize there's a fair amount of... Um, private parking that is available uh, on the, the east side of the site, uh, but it's really when when that parking space is actually being utilized for event space um, that, that we're noticing that increase. So um, yeah, that's that's just the point of clarity that I wanted to provide there. Um, but it sounds like there, there will be opportunities for additional tools going forward. And we would, yeah, and we would be working with our colleagues within civic events as well, with like any of the with any of the festivals to see what 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 makes sense. As Jenny mentioned, some it could, it could be road closures, it, it could be the parking restrictions. So it's it's 
I, I understand where you're coming from, Councillor, where it's 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 uh, individual events are kind of happening more more totally. frequently throughout. Um, but I think with with this program, at least anyway, we wanted to change the scope to be that it's it's sort of year round um, residential. So that's not to suggest that it wouldn't be applicable for um, like for, for those events, but it would be alternative strategies as part of a different program to kind of maintain that. Um, scope and not and not be in the same position we are right now where we're having the scope creep with our program over yep. the last several years. Absolutely. Great. That's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. I just had a few a few last questions. Um, just want to clarify my understanding of the two hour parking within the areas. So that would be that would be open to any any Edmonton any user for the two hour parking? That that's right. Yeah. Excellent. And so the intent there is to try to, you know, feedback we heard from the public was um, who, those who are in a residential parking program right now and need to get visitor passes mm -hmm. uh, or guests who want to stay the night. Um, there's a process to get in a, a visitor permit. Um, here, two hours for free anytime and overnight. And so the timings of the program are after 9 p.m. So really, if you wanted to have guests over for Thanksgiving, you know, they can park at 7 p.m. and then stay all the way through until 8 in the morning. No permits needed for, for those guests. And so we're trying to get rid of some of that red tape for those visitors who are wanting to go visit their family and friends in those yeah. areas. Yeah, no, I think that's a really excellent approach. And, and I think really, again, just recognizing that a curb, curbside is for, for every every user. So I think that's really positive. Just wondering if there was some thought just around the 9 p.m. start. I, I appreciate the logic of wanting to align with e-park zones, but as you've just flagged that scenario of someone coming over for dinner, my four-year-old eats at about 5.30, so we, we, you know, we have people coming over earlier in the evening. So just wondering if there would be consideration of maybe um, like a 6 p.m. time, for example. Um, we did align it with our e-park hours, as we mentioned, to align with that consistency piece. Um, but of course, it might be a little bit of shuffling of vehicles on there. So if that resident has a permit, maybe that frees up the space on a parking pad in the back if they want to park earlier than that time too. So there may be a bit of shifting. Sundays is 10 to 5, so you could park as early as 3 o'clock um, mm -hmm. on that as well. Um, but we've seen with our new e-park hours for the last year that um, they seem to be quite consistent with um, sort of the needs of the community. And I think I would just flag that e-park, you know, as far as far as I'm familiar with e-park, is that it is it is predominantly in more commercial areas rather than residential. I don't know if that's that's true. Um, but just just recognizing that there's maybe a different dynamic or pattern of use in commercial areas versus versus residential areas. Um, we did uh, when we asked in the public engagement survey, like we did ask of how long do you stay, and most people said it was two or two hours was the maximum stay. Mm. So we did check because we had asked like would three hours be longer for visitor parking, mm. but based off the survey results, two hours was enough time to visit family and friends or a business nearby. So we did base that on what we heard from the public as well. Okay, um, a couple other just equity questions. Um, would there be sort of an automatic free, I'm just thinking of um, accessibility needs. I know that there, there was a proportion in the survey that, that identified that. So if someone, for example, had, a, had an accessibility ramp in their front yard, you know, my understanding is they would be able to apply for an accessibility spot. So even if that was within a residential parking area, they would still have that spot. They wouldn't have to also get the residential parking permit. Uh, so they could apply, they would still be required to get a permit, um, but if, because we have a program where a resident can request an accessible um, zone in front of their home, that is available to anyone that parks in the neighborhood though. Um, so they can definitely still request and we can add that in, um, but them along with anyone else who would like to park in that spot would have to follow the same restrictions. So the two hours maximum, or if they wanted to park for longer in the accessible parking spot, they would need a permit. Okay, and again, if they were facing financial barriers, then we would look at the, the cutoff, and so they could potentially still be eligible if there was a financial barrier. Yeah, absolutely, the, the, for Great. the discounted rate, yeah. Okay, and then just in terms of communication with residents, so so I understand there were the notices that were handed out um, in, in the program areas, current program areas, um, you know, some opted in to, to take the survey. So I just wanna clarify, the sequence of events. So is the is the next thing that folks are going to hear is your permit is up for renewal in April and there'll now be a, a fee moving forward? 
Uh, yeah, so it'll be sort of the letters, we've traditionally sent out letters in the mail in the past, so we were gonna use that same communications tactic um, to make sure we have that alignment. So there'll be two separate letters. Um, if you are in a program area that's being removed, you'll receive a letter that shares communications about the change to the program um, and when the removals will start. So as early as June, their current permits can be used till the end of May within their program. Uh, if they're in a residential parking program area that is continuing, a part of the new program piece, they'll receive a letter with that information. It will have information of how to apply for their digital permit online, um, and they'll be able to apply, receive a digital permit from sort of June to August. So they have a couple months to go through the process, applying for a permit. That's sort of how it's worked in other jurisdictions of that shift to a new digital system. And then they'll be all ready to go with their accounts um, to order to add in payment starting in September. Okay, great. So they'll, they'll be informed in April, May that starting in September, there will be a fee. Okay, that's excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing anyone else with, with questions at this point. Councillor Jans, did you still just wish to speak? Okay. Or, or no, we can remove, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm working on it. Um, so I'm, I'm prepared to put a motion on the floor and I'm just uh, looking to administration for that wording. We may need to, to tweak a little bit as we, as we go. Um, but we'll get that wording up and I will Just take one moment, thank you. I might finesse some wording as, as I go, um, but I'd like to move that administration proceed with option two as outlined in the March 19th, 2024 city operations report CO02129 and that administration return with a report on the residential parking permit uptake in the various zones um, following the May 2024 implementation and further refinement of the program criteria. And happy to provide a bit of, oh, and that I will recommend that to council. Um, so that was a bit of, of motioning on the fly, but I'll take two minutes to introduce this and, and very much open to refinements recommended by administration and for many of my colleagues as well. But the intent here is, you know, to first of all recognize the really, really excellent work that's been done. I'm really pleased that we're moving forward with refinements to this program. I think the addition of more equity pieces in terms of making it accessible to all residents in the area, not, not only based on um, building type, um, and also ensuring that there is consideration of uh, folks experiencing low, lower income, um, and also opening up all the, the um, residential parking areas for two hour parking management. That's very much in line with how we as a, as a growing city adequately manage our uh, parking resources. The reason I'm hesitant to change program boundaries right now is that I think that there, as has been discussed, there's a number of considerations that, that I think we need to, to at least pause and reflect on a bit further. Uh, Councillor Cartmel spoke earlier about, you know, some of the assumptions that are being made about people's willingness to, to walk for, for free parking or easier mobility access. I think um, that's, that's certainly something that anecdotally we've, we've experienced and maybe witnessed. Um, certainly, of course, we don't want to go by anecdote, and I think we would just want some, some clearer understanding of, of the, the data behind that. Um, for me, too, I also do have concerns with uh, heritage homes in high, high traffic areas, high demand areas that have no, no option or ability to add on-site parking. Um, you know, those are, that's a very unique condition, but one that I think we need to be sensitive to as we, as we move this program forward. Um, I think that introducing the fee is also a great opportunity to understand if there continues to be interest in, in these program areas. I think that if, if residents get notices in May and they don't indicate a desire to continue with a permit pass and an area sort of gets below a minimum threshold, then I think that speaks very clearly to there not being a need in that area. But again, that allows those residents to, to make that, that choice um, to inform that. I'm not sure where, 
we are on the time, but I'll stop there and uh, perhaps we could get the motion um, loaded and I'm happy to uh, take some questions from colleagues once we've got that up for clarity. And you know what, the, the original wording is probably fine. I can restate that. Um, perfect, great, thank you so much. Uh, Councillor Tang. Great, thank you. Uh, to, I guess to administration, um, initially, if, if it were to be received for information, you would just follow the next steps, which would be option one. Uh, no, it would be oh. option three. In this option report. three, yeah. oh, right, yes. So this would be a change to the uh, direction that we're headed in. I guess thoughts or immediate response. Yeah, the, the main concern is um, keeping all of the residential areas as they are. Um, we recognize through the research and the re uh, jurisdictional scan that um, there is not a traffic generator in all 19. It was closer to five. Um, so the concern, and, and this was an option considered, which is why we wanted to put it in the report and then in the attachment three, we just highlighted that the, the risk with this is some residents, about half the residents who live in an RPP program uh, don't like it. Uh, and so there might be a risk of those residents saying, there isn't a traffic generator in my neighborhood and now you're adding a fee. And uh, while they can opt out of the fee, uh, that would mean that they would be limited to two hour time restrictions mm -hmm. in those program timings. Uh, so that was, that was the risks with this option, but we did explore it uh, and, and plan for uh, option three based on uh, the traffic generator uh, drivers. So based on all those risks, that's why you didn't recommend option two. That's right. Um, uh, any, I guess, financial implications here with the fee being introduced earlier? Um, I was just going to add to you on that one. Um, so there is a risk that these programs that started in the 70s were based off of engagement for residents. So they completed a survey, they received two thirds engagement put in their program. So there can be programs that start in the 70s, there's change of folks that live in the neighborhood. So in keeping all the programs, introducing a fee, they may not want to have a program. If we don't have a traffic generator, it doesn't mm -hmm. align with curbside management strategy. They were not a part of the original engagement. As well, we're adding in multi-residential buildings that were never part of the program before and are now included and wouldn't have been part of the engagement. Um, in the past, so there are a few risks of do we allow that engagement piece to happen in order to remove a program, um, and that, that kind of shifts from the program criteria piece to more resident feedback if they would like a program or not. Um, the financial pieces, we didn't say anything specifically. I will say that, that uh, all 19 program areas will need all sign changes, so originally we we're doing sign changes in four neighborhoods and removing signs we will need to create new signs across the board and then if the program were to change in the future we would have to do that once again um, there would be uh, increased permits most likely but it also would we wouldn't know if that um, would be the case or not in the neighborhoods okay great thank you very much thank you councillor cartmel thank you so i guess first to the mover the the effect of the motion as written would be more or less leave it as it is, raise the fees and bring back a report on how many people pay the new fee? Uh, so it would be to introduce fees and then come back with some potential refinements to the program criteria. So it's not precluding that existing areas may eventually be reduced or removed entirely but it's just getting some further analysis again, what the impact is to historic homes uh, that don't have access to parking um, and potentially walking distances as you've highlighted in terms of what, what's constituting a generator. Yeah, I offered that as a further data point, not necessarily as a, a reason to not follow option three, but so I hear what you're saying. So maybe to administration, if we keep the boundaries and keep the zones essentially as is, but introduce an increased fee, do people really have the option whether they can pay or not? Am I missing something here? So, <coughs> Councillor, it would still be the same. If, if, they, if they have alternative parking that's available for them on oh, site, they wouldn't, they wouldn't, have to. They wouldn't need to, but right. it's, a, it's a significantly larger scale of neighborhoods that now would be impacted with the fee st still, and then, of course, the timelines um, of introducing all of those changes 
um, this is going to be a bit of a and we haven't done to... so we don't have the if we keep the boundaries exactly as they are now and raise the fees that might motivate some to find parking on their property do we have an analysis of how many people have that opportunity like we might be creating a bigger problem than just the heritage homes Based off our engagement survey, we said 16% overall in the 19 neighborhoods didn't have parking on site. So outside of that 16%, they may have private parking options available, but it will significantly change. Like there will, with that option, we align to the e-park hours and have the two-hour time restriction pieces. Yeah, but, um, that, but yeah. it wouldn't, in an area that doesn't have a traffic generator or a need for a program, they would still have a program, but now they'd have to pay for it. So that backing of the data piece wouldn't really be there. So if I, the way I understand, I'm trying to limit my time here. The way I understand it then is that uh, the way option three would work, uh, we reduce the, the four home, but we may have a few heritage homes that don't have on-site parking. So it's a problem for those few heritage homes. If we follow this plan, then we've got a problem for 15% of all of the, 16% of all of the programs that currently exist, which sounds like it's a higher number of actual properties yes and you would yeah so we that's why we had recommended only four programs continuing so you would have 15 programs that are continuing for not a specific traffic generator reason that we'd be adding in a fee piece um, the heritage homes as as a whole as we mentioned we can review a different parking strategy because there are some out of make some um, exceptions different neighborhoods. Or something. Yeah, yeah there's definitely other things we can do for that piece and do it on more of a across city approach rather than just the ones that currently have a residential parking program. And I feel like you've already done the analysis on the parking demand criteria and program areas. That's what this is. Correct, correct yeah. Councillor, exactly. Yeah. And and, um, and and just to, to highlight again, like I think it's really important to see the behavioral change as well as um, how people are responding to, to the parking piece. Like I think there, yeah. there's that worry that that's going to open up all the parking spaces available, but I think what Let's we've seen see. is yeah. correctly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, um, okay, th I'm disinclined to support this motion. I would support a motion if for option three. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. No, appreciate that discussion. Um, and you know, I am also, I'm also being swayed against my own motion, to be honest. This is a really helpful conversation. Uh, so just circling back in terms of what opportunities there may be to address. So, so I think, you know, I appreciate there's a tension. If we make exceptions for properties that don't have on-site parking access, that works against the whole ethic of open option parking, which is that if new buildings can choose to not have on-site parking, knowing that there's sort of this trade-off that they might not have guaranteed on-street parking. I, again, I do feel that the historic homes, and I will, I will be uh, selfish enough to, to speak specifically of, uh, in Wequentowin as well, just recognizing that it is, you know, I would argue, uh, um, I think in the report it talks about just high usage areas, just a very high density area. So I think, I think the conditions there are a bit unique. So is there another way that we could, we could get to that um, that you would advise me for? So option three plus? Yeah, and, and Councillor, that's that's exactly what I was was going to reference. Is that I, I think we are we're we're currently having a discussion on something we we're, we're not really sure of the mm. the impacts, right? So I yeah. think what we're asking for with this report and with option three is to allow us to we will still be nimble and flexible. We will still understand the intent is to provide parking for folks um, that need it, whether it's residents or visitors. But I think right now what we're saying is the program and in the way that it exists does not actually help us understand whether there was that parking need or not. So proceeding, um, and, and we would do like a, an annual review, understand what the changes are. You know, we obviously hear from the public uh, through 311 and through, you know, the, the app and all that stuff. So understanding what the lived experience is. So absolutely, we, we would we would move ahead with, if, 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 an, if a committee would like, we would move ahead with option three and still do an evaluation, not just for the historic homes, but even all of the areas that are going to be removed or changed, we would do a parking utilization study there to understand what the changes are before and after, and then identify what the next steps could look like. So it's not that we're, we're removing it and, and, and then that's, that's it. it. Yeah. <laughs> like we, we, what we want to understand is what is the impact of that? And that's going yeah. to take time as people know and realize and, and understand what that is. I think, I think the, the concern around the scarcity of parking that's available 
Um, we feel based on the jurisdiction scan, based on what's happening in Edmonton, is, is probably not very substantiated from a data perspective, and that's what we want to analyze in order to be able to be equitable in the space that's being, in, the, in, in allocating yeah. the space that's being provided. Yeah, I appreciate that. So so just so I understand the, the different remedies that may exist. So again, I'm thinking of, you know, a resident reached out. Um, they're in one of the historic homes on 103rd Avenue or 102nd Avenue. And they, uh, for example, they have a family. They would be, um, if the residential parking program was removed, you know, how would they unload groceries, for example, when they're coming home? So is there going to be provision in terms of, potentially providing loading zones in that area, like what, and, and maybe just talk me through the sequence. So if we announce this, this, this decision gets made today, you hear immediately from the owners of those historic homes saying, hey, this is totally unworkable for us. What, what are the next steps? For sure, so our team's already been reviewing those areas around the historical homes, so I think we would remove it, um, but review, we have different parking sensors we can add in. Um, to review the occupancy specifically in those areas, understand that lived experience, the needs of the residents, um, and then we can review what parking strategies. So yeah, as you mentioned, we can add in pasture loading zones, we can do time restrictions. Um, we can look at different pieces um, to see what, like to keep that turnover of vehicles and to support that they have parking nearby, because understanding the historic homes, they might just not have that and they need access as well. Great, and and the level of nimbleness, like are we kind of, because what I, I genuinely, generally really like this idea of like, we don't know what the part, what the impact is gonna be until we try it. And I think you're right, we often make assumptions that don't, don't turn out to be true. At the same time, um, there can be impacts that are realized and need to be responded to quite quickly. So how how quickly, and so my I guess I have one worry is that let's say, again, we, we take the time and the expense of removing all of those signs, and then how quickly are we going back in with other mitigations, and then do, do we end up generating more costs by going back and forth? But I guess there's information we can't get unless we remove the restrictions. Yeah. And we can add that directly into the communication to mm. those residents too. So up front of saying we understand that historical homes, um, there might be some ongoing pieces that we need to support. So we can add that directly into our communications plan over the next couple of months, provide them um, a channel to be able to engage with our team and work th through those right away. And then just to clarify as well, um, so so folks whose areas are being removed, it, does that get removed in September or that gets removed at the end of April? Uh, removals will start as early as June. Um, okay, so June. it'll be June onwards for the removals um, and it'll go sort of neighborhood by neighborhood on that end. Okay, okay, well I, um, I think I'm happy to with withdraw this motion if anyone would like to make a, an alternative motion, but this has been a really helpful uh, discussion for me. Um, so just looking to one of my colleagues if they'd like to move, uh, sure. receive for information. I can move to receive for information. Thank you. Um, any further discussion or speaking to from any committee or council colleagues? Thank you, Councillor Knack. Yeah, I'll, I'll be, I didn't have any questions. I have a very, very small section within the one of the ward I represent, so I, I did want to jump in. I, I just want to say thank you for the report, all the work that went into it. Um, I think it's the right approach to go option three, uh, you know, even for the small area that that's, um, is within the ward I serve. Um, better to actually get some data to see how things would change, and I, I've heard that clear commitment over and over again about, you know, you're not just making this change and saying, hey, you're on your own. It's, you're gonna make a change, and you're gonna study it. You're gonna study it before, you're gonna study it after. We're gonna adjust, as we should with most of the things that we do. So, um, and, and I think what's particularly unique in the area I represent is it's part of a community that has the LRT running right beside it, so there's separate tools and opportunities to address parking concerns, and so, um, so I think this is a, a, a good change, a thoughtful change, one that's gonna be based off uh, actual measurements and data, and, uh, and worth modernizing this as we go forward. So I, I'm supportive of it, and uh, I guess it doesn't actually come to council, so I, I'll support it in spirit. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Knack. Um, yeah, I'll take a few moments uh, to speak to this. I really appreciate that this work has been undertaken. I know uh, when open option parking was being introduced back in 2020, 
um, this was a big piece of the, the pie or the puzzle, I guess, in terms of ensuring that we're managing both on-site and, and on-street parking effectively. So this is a great companion piece to that previous work and I think will further strengthen how we, how we manage uh, parking in our city. I'm really grateful for the thoughtful approach that's been taken and also the commitment to continue to adapt. I think, I think it's very true that that a lot of assumptions are made about traffic generation and about parking. So I, you know, when I was moving into to my condo building, um, you know, a, a very tall, I think a 35 story, yeah, I think 35 story tower was going in next door. Um, there was significant concern about traffic and parking. Uh, and to this day, um, I am always able to find on-street parking in, in a few blocks from my building. Um, I think though that uh, neighborhoods are constantly changing and there are a lot of nuances to consider. Um, I think about these heritage homes in, in Wequentowin and recognize that again, it's not that they're choosing to not make use of, of a garage space, for example, they just truly don't have another option. Uh, when we talk about mobility choice, that does still also mean driving uh, when, when people need to do that. So I appreciate the commitment to continue to adapt and to work with communities to, to understand what it is that they need. Um, again, I think about having to unload groceries uh, with a toddler and what that looks like if you maybe have to go two blocks away. That's, that is a really daunting proposition, particularly in the winter time. Um, I don't think that that means that there aren't other solutions, loading zones, time restrictions. And so again, really, really value the team's commitment to work through those. Um, I, look forward to to the continued data um, and hope that we can get you know memos and information back that we can share with residents as well in terms of how that analysis and data collection is going so that we can communicate that clearly. Um, I think anytime we are making decisions based on evidence um, we're in really good standing so I, I look forward to, to that ongoing work. Um, thank you to my colleagues for the, the great questions and also their commitment to uh, moving forward with this important step in managing uh, our city growth. Thank you. Councillor Tang to close. Very quickly. Um, we, we always say no matter what the issue is, it almost always comes back to parking. It's a joke, but you know, we talk about parking a lot. Uh, and I was happy to read about a very dedicated, thoughtful, um, approach uh, to to the parking management strategy. So thank you for this. I think the only thing I just want to say is um, the areas don't touch my my ward and many other wards. And I just know so many. Uh, you know, I, I hear about a lot from my residents uh, and people really wishing for some kind of program in place for their for their neighborhoods. And um, so I hope. Oh. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do you want to go after me? I'm closing. Okay. I'm going to vote no. Um, that I hope the, the parking utilization study uh, can kind of inform future developments. Thank you. I'm sorry, I had to step out well, on an okay. urgent, urgent matter. You know, I'm chair, so I'm just, I'm going to allow it unless <laughs> the world will end. <laughs> uh, so Mayor Sohi, happy, happy to turn it to you. Yeah, you know, I, I appreciate administration bringing this forward. I appreciate uh, uh, that uh, we want to have a plan to manage this uh, uh, this issue, and uh, and uh, I know there's impact on neighborhoods uh, uh, where they have you know significant uh, institutional presence, uh, and parking becomes an, an issue. But I would not support this. I think timing is terrible. People are struggling with affordability, uh, and this is going to impact um, low-income uh, Edmontonians. It's going to impact students, even though it's going to be at a discounted, discounted rate. I think uh, the uh, any time we raise fees, uh, uh, even though nominal, uh, even though impact is localized, I think we we come across not attuned to the realities of Edmontonians. Uh, I think it's, uh, from that perspective, I think timing is not not the right time at this time. Once maybe affordability issues are, uh, you know, more manageable, even $10 a month is, uh, is, is for some people, is, is a struggle. So I will not be able to support this. Thank you, please vote. I'm um, no. 
Thank you, Mayor Sophie. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. Thank you, and that's passed three to one. Uh, we'll go now, thank you again to administration for our delegation. Uh, we'll go next to item 7.2. Uh, does administration have a presentation on this? Great, so we'll start with the presentation from administration and then we'll, we'll go to our two speakers. Um, just for our speakers on other items, 7.3 and 7.5, um, my guess at this point is that we'll likely be getting to you after the, the lunch break. Um, just to give you a heads up, not that you aren't welcome to stay, but that if you were to tune out until 1.30, I would assume you would be safe to do so. Thank you, whenever you're ready, thank you. Good morning, uh, and thanks for having us today. Uh, I am Travis Pollock, the Acting Branch Manager of Development Services, and with me today is Lila Peter, Director, and Claire St. Oban as uh, Senior Planner. Uh, and we'll be here to discuss the regulatory options that will advance city centre vibrancy, safety, and beautification in relation to unpermitted surface parking lots. Uh, so through the report and presentation, administration has evaluated various different mechanisms through business licensing, taxation, and regulatory approvals. And ahead of us is our best advice to committee today. Thank you, Travis. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so the Capital City Downtown Plan and the Quarters Area Redevelopment Plan include policies or action statements that de-emphasize surface parking lots. This direction has carried through to the downtown special area zones and direct control zones that guide development across the downtown and the quarters, and they restrict the creation of new surface parking lots. Since adoption, there has been minimal growth in the amount of new surface parking in the center city, which suggests that the policies and regulations are working. Next slide, please. Not only have there been little to no new surface lots developed, surface parking in the core has been steadily redeveloped in recent years. And on the screen, you will see a map of the surface parking lots in Centre City. And so if you look at the downtown, the lots in purple existed in 2007. And if we could just get a click on the slideshow. Okay, thank you. You will see that those purple, uh, Lots have faded out um, and they represent 17 hectares of surface parking that has seen redevelopment. And this change can be attributed to substantial private and public investment in our downtown. Of note, Rogers Place, Marriott, Stantec Tower, multiple residential towers, new buildings for Norquist and McEwen and Alex Dakotu Park. Today, there are 24 hectares of surface parking in all of Centre City, which accounts for about 5% of the overall area after roadways have been removed. Next slide, please. To address these challenges, administration is recommending the creation of a program that would enable a pathway for owners and operators to obtain a development permit while requiring upgrades to the site. The goals of the program are to provide an equitable and transparent process to obtain a development permit, enhance safety and beautification in Centre City, and to ensure compliance to city bylaws. Next slide, please. <coughs> I'll now provide the general scope and timing of the phases that would constitute the program. As a first step, phase one would see administration-led text amendments and rezonings to introduce a new use. The use would be geographically restricted to Centre City and only apply to parking lots that already existed, and they would have to meet specific requirements for landscaping, lighting, pathways, and the use would expire, the permission would expire after a period of time. The time period has yet to be defined, but could be somewhere in the realm of seven to 10 years. This phase would also have the standard processes for engagement, which would give property owners, the public, and other stakeholders an opportunity to provide input. Next slide, please. Phase two is enforcement stage and would be contingent on city council approval of the text amendment and rezoning work. Phase two would start with outreach in the form of a letter to non-compliant surface parking lot owners or parking owners, letting them know that their development requires a development permit. The letter would then inform them of the temporary program, the timelines, required reg regulations, how they could apply for a development permit, and what enforcement actions 
that could be taken should they not obtain that development permit. The letter would also indicate that ceasing parking op operations is another option for them to bring their parking lot into compliance. Should owners continue to operate without seeking a development permit, enforcement would be carried out in the form of a written notice, fines, stop orders, and we could advance all the way to remedial action if necessary. Data on Centre City Parking suggests that there are 96 different landowners, and as this is an emergent program and priority, administration does not have the necessary resources to carry out this work unless resources were shifted away from other work or should um, further resources be um, provided through a fall supplemental operating budget, uh, budget adjustment. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, administration did meet with industry. Um, that included landowners, and we gathered early feedback on the framework of the program. Overall, we heard support for the concept, noting that it is equitable for all surface parking lots uh, to be held to the same standard for improvements. We heard from some members that the cost of improvements might be a concern, and there was a desire for further engagement if we were to progress with the program. Industry was also, convinced, uh, was also concerned that the participation rate may be low amongst owners. And given the number of landowners involved, administration does not expect 100% participation. And again, um, for those who would choose not to obtain a development permit um, and would continue their operations, we would advance with the enforcement. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so that is expected, that we wouldn't have 100% take up, but it does remain um, the best regulatory and licensing path forward to achieve the equity, beauty, and safety um, goals for the downtown parking lots. And if committee would like to see this work progress, um, a motion to directing admin to move forward is required. So thank you, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the presentation. We'll go next to our speakers. Uh, Alex Horitsu, are you joining us online today? Yep, yep, I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Yes, you're coming through. Please, uh, over to you. I know you've been here before, but just a reminder, there's a five-minute timer, and uh, committee and council members will uh, be available to ask questions of you at the end of your panel. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so good morning, Mayor and Councillors. I'll keep this very short. On behalf of the Downtown Recovery Coalition, we're pleased to support this report today and encourage approval of administration's recommendation. Um, this report empowers owners and operators of existing non-compliant surface parking lots to apply for temporary development permits. permits and through this initiative, um, we do agree that we'll see site upgrades to enhance safety and beautification. And we appreciate administration's thoughtful engagement and unique approach to addressing this challenge. This program isn't just about parking, it's about revitalizing city centre and improving aesthetic safety and overall appeal by aligning with broader goals of urban development. We have one additional flag around site improvements that would be um, the harmonization of signage. As you know, downtown has an immense amount of parking availability, but it's not concise or visually acceptable to visitors and newcomers to the core. So we'd really encourage committee to ask um, administration uh, some questions around um, additional signage like green peas, similar to what we see in downtown Calgary. Happy to answer any questions you have and again, reiterate our full support for this. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here today. Next, we have Panita McBrien. Are you with us this morning? I'm here, but I'm hoping to just be available to answer questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, any, any questions for our speakers? Uh, well, maybe I'll just start with a quick question. I'm sorry, um, uh, Speaker Haritsu, would you mind just uh, repeating what you were mentioning about Calgary? I just missed missed that that point. Yeah, so we just see um, an opportunity with this um, with this recommendation to harmonize parking lot signage. So right now, what we're seeing is just various different brands, obviously. Um, and it's not super clear where people can um, access parking throughout the core. And so um, we've seen Calgary's approach to harmonize signage with green peas um, as a part of their bylaw that just really obviously elevates uh, the accessibility to parking. Um, we know that Edmonton has more downtown parking than most downtowns nationally. And so just elevating that for visitors would be, uh, I think, really useful. 
Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, just wondering what your thoughts are in terms of, um, you just referenced the fact that, that Edmonton is well provisioned with parking. If, if there were a way to incentivize um, other uses of these spaces, so I'm thinking, you know, would there be a way through potentially property taxes or other approaches to incentivize people to convert the service parking lots into, let's say, usable green spaces? You know, I, I really take the point that we don't want them vacant, but if there were other options for animating them for different uses, is that something that you think would contribute to downtown vibrancy? I think so. I think the thing I would flag in regards to that is um, just the amount of underground parking versus surface parking we currently have. Um, and Panita might want to jump on this as well. Um, we know, especially during game. Oh, sorry, you're just cutting out there. We've lost you. I'm, I'm sorry, we can't hear you at all. Um, maybe while we're, we're resolving that, yeah, I'll just go and put the same question to Ms. McBrien. Uh, what are your thoughts if we were able to incent other, other interim uses so it wouldn't be vacant, but um, alternatives to surface parking in the downtown? Yeah, thanks for the question. I think it's, um, it could be a good option for certain owners. Um, like obviously there's been some success with Abbey Glen Park that um, mm. Melcor owns on mm -hmm. Jasper Ave. Mm -hmm. But the problem, I think, with majority of the remaining non-compliant lots we have, and, and the admin team will have better information on this than me, is that a lot of these owners are not in Edmonton. They're difficult to contact. We don't know who they are. They're not particularly present. And so for them, the idea of like having a green space that they'd have to maintain and manage and not gain any income from would probably be quite a stretch. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it'd be much trickier, I think, to manage and enforce and um, build a program around than to, you know, find a way to make the parking a better experience in the interim. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great flag. And I think certainly, you know, considering it as, as one of a suite of options or tools, recognizing that it may be may work well for some property owners, but not for others. Thank you for that. Um, I don't know if. Uh, Speaker Haritsu has been able to to rejoin us. And if there was anything else yeah. you wanted to add, oh, great. Yes, yep. sorry about that. No, no, I won't add anything else. Panita nailed it. And uh, I'd also just flag, um, we just have the issue with uh, service parking lots and, and underground parking lots and trucks for game and event nights. So just considering that also and the uses of, uses of them. Yeah, that's an interesting point in terms of some of the, the physical restrictions for underground parking. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, I'll go next to Mayor Sohi. Thank you, Chair Stevenson. Uh, it, I'll stay with Panita on, uh, so is it fair to say that uh, unsightly gravel parking lots are pretty detrimental to the vibrancy in the downtown? I think that is fair to say. I think the location of the lots plays a big role too. I know you um, had a discussion about the future ice district, village and ice district site um, previously. Those lots are, you know, north of downtown, um, fairly out of sight and actually um, provide a big need for game nights and event nights so that we have more parking available in the downtown core. So, and then there's other lots that are, you know, within the downtown core mm -hmm. and our some of our most highly walkable areas that um are definitely more of a detractor from mm -hmm. the experience and yeah. uh, should... perceptions of cleanliness and all that so some some are are for sure more detrimental than others yeah then should we have a di shouldn't we, then we have a different approach like uh parking lots that are unsightly not paved you know trees no pathways no setbacks but they're in the core of the downtown, say around Jasper Avenue, 102nd, right? Shouldn't we have a different approach to those? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's where like city admin has struck a really good balance with this approach. Like it's, it's certainly not ideal to be issuing new permits for parking when we decided to not do that, you know, 10 years ago. Um, but 
given market conditions and where we're at today and knowing what a detractor, a current state of some of these lots um, is right now. Mm -hmm. I think this is a really balanced approach to say, if they meet these requirements, if they make these investments, um, it'll be a much better experience for pedestrians uh, and their neighbors. Um, and, and by not forcing them to invest, you know, a ton of money on paving and that kind of thing, the hope is still that the lots will be redeveloped at some point in the medium term. Mm -hmm. And a lot that is, I just trying to understand this. I have this question to administration as well. Like what is temporary, right? Uh, maybe if a parcel of land has a development permit issued, maybe that's temporary. If they don't have a development permit issues and they're using that lot for permanent parking basically uh, under the guise of temporary parking shouldn't we have different rules around that shouldn't we uh, shouldn't we requiring them to pave maybe yeah it's a big question i think definitely one for admin um my understanding is that anyone who does have a development permit today and is operating a parking lot that most of those ones are actually not covered by this program? No, I was actually, maybe I didn't ask my question right, Benita. What I'm saying is that if somebody has a development permit to build a structure, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so most of those downtown, they do, I think, have parking as a permitted use in the short term, like it's part of their zoning. Okay. So a lot of those ones, if they have a development permit for, a, say, a residential tower, they're already not technically one of the problem lots. Most of these problem lots that we're talking about are ones that don't have a development permit at all. Oh, I see. Um, so yeah. So, and, and admin can, I, I could be wrong on that, so they can clarify. But the, the challenge is, I think it, it has to be temporary, let's say seven years, and then to be very serious about communicating to them that there will be enforcement action at the end of that. Mm -hmm. So they know that they've got a clock where they have to either sell the property or make development plans in the next five to seven years um, because they will no longer be able to operate their parking at that time. Like, I think we know that right now economic conditions are just not going to result in development in the short term. I know we're going to talk more about this tomorrow. Um, so but I of, think that... What of a sunset, of a sunset clause, right? Then, okay, yeah. you, you have yeah. this permission for five years but if you don't start developing or, you know, again, market conditions has a lot of impact on that. But uh, I, so that's what you're saying, kind of sunset clause in, in, the, yeah. in the approval. Okay. Yeah, that's how we, I see it, I think. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for joining us, for both of you. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Councillor Cartmel? Great, thank you. Uh, yes, thanks to both of you for joining us. I just want to build on that a little bit more, maybe to uh, Ms. McBrien. Uh, so presuming that there's a sunset clause on, on a permitted, either past permitted or, or about to be permitted parking lot, do you see that as better than an empty lot with zero activity? And I'm th the one that I have in mind is the old Bank of Montreal site. And I guess, yes, you know, we've had many discussions about that. Yes, site. yeah, our favorite site. Um, so I'm, what's better? If that site was yeah. used, like if it was somehow knocked flat and used for parking or to have it in its current condition. Yeah, so I, I think that's again, part. that's a, one of the main reasons we feel that this approach is um, a good one, despite it not being ideal, because truly a parking lot does serve a, an economic function and there is some activity there. And um, so definitely a surface a well-maintained well-landscaped surface parking lot is definitely better than a, a vacant lot um the problem is and i'm sure admin will speak to this 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 program is not designed to permit any new parking lots so that bmo site still won't be dealt with under this program like that will continue to be a vacant site um this program I understand is to address all of the ones that have been operating as parking lots for the last, you know, five to yeah. ten plus years. Well, unless we unless we tweak that for right. certain circumstances, and I'm I'm looking at the law. The one of the questions I'll have of administration or somebody might 
is we talk about center city, but I'm not I, like a, do we have a shared understanding of what center city is? Like that stretches all the way from um, the edge of Highlands to 124th Street, if I'm reading that correctly. Anyway, like when we talk center city in the context of this conversation, are we all thinking the same thing? Maybe that's rhetorical. Um, I had one more question for you, Ms. McBrien. Um, uh, Mayor Sohi talked about a sunset clause on this program. What do you think conceptually of a sunset clause on upzoning of lots like the Bank of Montreal building that would um, perhaps align or coordinate with a sunset clause on a temporary parking lot? Yeah, that's a really tough one. Yeah. I uh, that that particular site um, is just such a <laughs> a problem. Like, you know, we've had many conversations with the developer. I don't see any path to improvement on that site in the short term. Um, and I, I hate the idea of creating a new parking lot there, but if there was a way to make it a park, to make it something really beautiful with maybe parking on half to sort of cover some of those um, operating costs, I think the community, the community would be really very relieved to see something happen to that because it really is just the idea of having that sit there like that for another two to five to 10 years is just so painful. Well, I, you know, I suppose, it, and I don't know, I'm, I'm probably at risk of speculating in an uneducated way, but I wonder if, if there was a, if that's if if a spot like that reverts to its previous zoning, uh, and you know a different owner took a run at it, you know under different circumstances, maybe something would happen a little more quickly. But I I mean that's very rhetorical in the context of this conversation. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. I just have a couple of quick questions here. Um, Ms. Haritsu, you talked about the harmonizing signage and that, and I'm wondering, and you had suggested that it be put in the bylaw. As a, Would that be a requirement then of the landowner to make sure that signage was there? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. I just wanted to clarify that or whether it was something to be done by our administration. Thank you. And then uh, Ms. McBride, you mentioned something about the lot owners not gaining income, um, so they wouldn't want to sort of provide that beautification or that. Are these lots normally only used on game nights or special events, or are they used like throughout the day as well? Uh, it depends on the location. Um, it's actually fascinating, even just looking at our BIA uh, assessments on the lots. Like, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done to clean up and clarify you know which lots are being productive when but there are definitely some that fill up on game and event nights and are um pretty quiet otherwise i would say the the village at ice district site is as an example of that but throughout the rest of the core like with with the return to office state that we're at with you know people in the office kind of two to three days a week on average um there are quite a few of these lots that are actually full um at varying points throughout the week. Okay, so they do, they are deriving income maybe on a, not a consistent basis, but haphazardly? Yeah, like I assume for most of these lots, they're probably covering their, their property taxes and their base costs. Um, and some I'm sure are quite profitable. Okay, all right, that's all the questions I had. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Councillor Wright. Councillor Jans? Okay, and I just had uh, two last quick questions to our speakers. Uh, Speaker McBrien, just wanted to confirm, um, these lots currently don't pay any BIA levies? Uh, the unlicensed lots? Sorry, yeah, um, some of them do. This has been a fascinating thing to dig mm -hmm. into. So admin was very generous and helped me kind of dig into this a little bit and understand which ones are and aren't because Generally, they kind of they need a permit of some kind, like a business permit or development permit, to get assessed and then pay the levy. So, some of them are are paying the levy, and some of them 
are not, and then how much each lot is paying based on their assessment, I understand also needs a bit of updated uh, information and, and work because it's it's quite inconsistent and unclear um, where you know some of the numbers are coming from. Great. Okay. And so so regardless, um, taking a more comprehensive unified approach would would certainly remove some of that inconsistency um, for, for the BIA, for the DBA? Definitely, definitely, yeah. If we had a pathway to get um, all these lots permitted under some sort of program, that I'm sure that would make life easier for assessment and taxation as well to actually track which lots need to be paying the levy. Absolutely, and it would be, you know, I assume uh, given the, D the DBA's mandate that, that any of those additional levies would, would be reinvested back into the downtown to support vibrancy, support businesses, correct? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, great. Just finally, just wanted to ask, I know it, it sounds like you are comfortable with the recommendation that paving would not be required. I, you know, I have mixed feelings on that. Um, could you maybe elaborate sort of your, your, why you're sort of more comfortable with potentially allowing the gravel lots to remain? Yeah, we did request that grading um, mm -hmm. be added in there because I think that's a big challenge with um, some of the gravel lots is just the state they're in is so uneven and and they're just poorly maintained. But if a gravel surface uh, is, is properly graded and well maintained, it, it doesn't have to be the terrible state that we're seeing right now. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, chatting with admin and, and learning about what the costs are of paving um, I think you've got to just come up with a program and make decisions with the highest likelihood of compliance and participation, right? Like balancing, you know, the best possible outcome for the community and then also, you know, not setting the bar so high that it becomes just financially not viable because um, they are, you know, business and landowners. So I just think paving, you know, you're getting into the, I think hundreds of thousands of dollars in some case, cases for some of these lots that are really big. Mm. Um, that's where, you know, a five or seven year program even probably wouldn't make that worth it. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for your insights. And uh, I don't see any other questions of you, of our speakers at this point. So thank you again, both so much for attending this morning. We'll go now to questions of administration. I'm gonna give a moment for my committee colleagues to, to sign in. Councillor Tang. Okay, great, thank you very much for this. Um, uh, I recall uh, at the last time this came up for discussion, there was a landowner who came forward and talked about how he wanted to get license, but it was also quite a, you know, a prohibitive process. Just want to check in on that. Was that resolved? Or was there any learnings from that process to that kind of we've landed had, in this report? Yes, yeah, so we've had a number of conversations with that landowner, and the landowner was um, stayed engaged throughout the process. They um, indicated that they are looking forward to seeing some sort of program that could come forward. So there was you know, a level of support. Um, obviously, I don't want to say full-on support until they see the details of it, but mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. the generic... Um, happy to see progress being made that might offer them an opportunity to move forward to some sort of legal state. Yeah, and, and obviously I think the phase one, phase two approach is um, a lot of thoughts been put into this. And I'm, I'm wondering, do you see phase two, could that be somewhat self-financing? Is there a mechanism for that? Not necessarily on the enforcement side, because enforcement, we would be limited with the ticket revenue, like ticket revenue, if you want right. to call it revenue, probably shouldn't. Um, but there is an element of through business licensing, we would um, start to see some general tax revenue and tax levy revenue helps support the enforcement side. I don't know that we will get to a cost neutral situation on this, but it will overall potentially help the downtown and that right. might be the rationale versus cost neutrality. And then how long do you think phase one could take? I mean, a lot of it is kind of updating languages and policies, et cetera, but I, I guess I'm asking because I'm wondering could phase two potentially go into say the next four year cycle and from Councilor a budgetary Tang, perspective. 
Yeah, so phase one would follow our standard process for text amendments and zoning bylaw mm -hmm. amendments. So we're targeting the end of uh, Q4. Okay, and then, you know, if things get approved, phase two is 12 to 24 months. That's correct. So we'd build out the details of the program, mm -hmm. um, but that's exactly what we're thinking. There would be a limited time once it conditional on approval of the text amendments and zoning bylaw at uh, public hearing. Um, and there'd be a limited amount of time that property owners could enroll in the program. And then that clock would start on how long that temporary use is good for. Um, and then there would be an enforcement phase that's also limited in terms of time. So we'd be concentrated enforcing for about 24 months ensuring that the development permit conditions are followed through. Okay. Um, and I think, I think you mentioned the report somewhere that even if the program were in place, <clears throat> doesn't necessarily mean redevelopment will happen any faster and we hear from other stakeholders that there's market conditions a big part of it, right? And you, and you acknowledge that. No, go ahead. Yeah, so to be clear that this, this program is not around incentivizing redevelopment mm -hmm. of the lots. It's about improving the conditions. Um, I think we, we've heard uh, and discussed at length around uh, how the redevelopment of these lots aren't contingent on uh, the parking or condition yeah. they are in today, but uh, more, more around the, the, the market economy. I mean, there's going to be, a, I'm sure there'll be a pretty ex extensive conversation tomorrow around the CRL, which is another tool, but you kind of need all these tools to be lined up for some of them redevelopment happen and revitalization, et cetera, et cetera. Correct. I'll leave it there for now. No, I'm interested to hear what, other ha what others have to say. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Mayor Sohi? Thank you. Uh, and I think during COVID and since COVID, this council and previous council has invested close to $300 million in downtown. And that does not even include increased funding for police, increased, increased funding for transit, and also that does not even include investment in the Rogers Place, right? So we have invested millions and millions of dollars as a, as a government entity, and vacant parking lots are a blight on vibrancy. So what do we need to do to hold private developers accountable to do, the, to do their part to ensure that we are, they're not creating conditions that are go against the efforts of bringing more life back into downtown, more, vi more vibrancy back into downtown. Mr. Mayor, I think that's what's being presented here today in terms of moving the needle uh, around these parking lots. Uh, these parking lots are a historical issue. Um, a lot of them were created in the, the 1970s uh, in which buildings were demolished in order to get ready for development uh, through the late 70s and 80s and then it just didn't occur. Uh, so we've been in this, this state for a number of decades. Uh, we have policy around not allowing new parking lots uh, but within that policy we've created uh, a gap uh, that doesn't allow uh, parking lots uh, to become permitted uh, mm -hmm. and then be improved. Uh, so that's what this program is here to address, uh, is the fact that we do have a number of these existing lots and that we want to improve those conditions, uh, but we want to do it in a thoughtful manner so that we're also not encouraging new parking lots to come online. Yeah. Uh, and, that, and that's the, the sort of the balance here and the trick. No, I understand. I hope it will make a difference if this, these measures are are implemented, do we know how many of these uh, properties that are used for temporary parking are owned by non-Edmontonians or corporations? Well, we don't know that. Because I, I know Benita mentioned something about ownership that is not non-Edmonton own ownership, right? Will there will be, sure. what, what I know, we can't discriminate based on people's residency, right? But at least I just, I just want to understand, like if people are non-Edmontonians are holding property in the city for speculative purposes uh, and, uh, it, and not invested in, uh, in, in the downtown uh, in, in, in a way that Edmontonians would be. 
Mayor Solhi, through this program, we are going to make our best efforts to connect with every single owner and discuss these changes and the future of these parking lots. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Will that give us a data on uh, the ownership? So, sorry, we do know who owns the lots. That was part of the data collection. I just don't know at this time whether they're in Edmonton or not. Oh, I mean, I... And it, what size is the parking lot that they own, for example? Okay. There are some larger parking lots, and we know the owners, and they're, they live here in Edmonton. They're business owners. They're developers. Yeah. So 96 different landowners, we will get in touch with them. Okay. Yeah, I think just to add, Mr. Mayor, I think the, the ownership, um, it, it's mixed. Uh, so I, I wouldn't necessarily focus on whether or not it's uh, just external uh, landowners uh, that are uh, contributing to the to the issue. Um, I, I think it is uh, it is mixed in its okay. both Edmontonians and, okay. and outside. Yeah. Okay, got it, got it, okay. Uh, is there a way to, would this, the changes you're recommending, would they allow you to concentrate on, uh, say, more uh, areas that are maybe, say, business districts, right, uh, where up empty parking, gravel parking lot might be more blight than, uh, say, outskirt of the downtown, right? Does this allow you to focus on certain certain areas or have better standards in certain areas? Yeah, um, if I could just ask clerks to bring up the presentation again, and then we can be looking at the map together. Okay. So, I mean, we did take our boundary uh, based on the motion, which was center city in the quarters. The, the quarters boundary is very is, big. Yeah. It is, it is, yeah. but it also aligns with the city plan. So yes, it does, it, yeah. It makes sense in terms of a boundary um, that everyone can follow. I think we've got the downtown in there, part of Boyle Street to the east, you have Oliver. Oliver, you can see the surface parking lots, less of an issue. North of downtown, we've got a concentration there. Mm -hmm. So I think the boundary is a good boundary that everyone can identify yeah. with and follow it through from our municipal yeah, but is development. There, is there a way to prioritize within boundaries based on the, say, commercial activities, business activities, or tourism activities? There is, however, we recommend against that, uh, just oh. in terms of creating an equitable playing field across uh, the area, like the, the boundaries, uh, whether it's downtown all over central McDougal, they're, they're quite fluid. Okay. Uh, for instance, uh, anything north of the, uh, the arena is not downtown. Uh, anything uh, within Chinatown would not be downtown or in the quarters, etc. Uh, so I think because of the fluidity of people moving back and forth, we'd like to create that even playing field. Okay. Thank you. I'm out of time. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Councillor Cartmel? Uh, thank you. Um, appreciate Mr. Pollock's comments. I, um, as I understand, this is this program is restricted to existing surface parking lots. Is that true? That's correct. Is there any consideration of um, special circumstances where an empty lot might be improved by allowing it to be a new parking lot? No, we kept the scope of the program tight um, and in alignment with the downtown, the statutory plans for downtown, which do not encourage new parking lots. So, Councillor, um, yeah. I'll just go specifically to the, the site in question. Um, <laughs> the program's not meant to... My uh, question, not yours. Let's be clear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah the, uh, the program's not meant to, to address uh, the issues we have around uh, the demolition of vacancy or demolition of buildings and then the state of the, the sites. Um, in terms of what we're doing uh, to address that, we are looking to advance certain conditions to development permits so when uh, sites are demol demolished, uh, a certain standard has to be met afterwards uh, if nothing happens. Uh, the issue here is that there is very strong policy framework around not allowing new parking lots downtown. Yeah. Uh, so to reward certain sites for uh, not following uh, or not not providing a, a site with a good condition. It, it has its uh, sort of issues here. And I think that it's difficult to address that in a wider program. And I would, I would look to not have that uh, one site or a couple of specific, specific sites addressed through this. Yeah, okay, don't, yeah. 
don't rush to an alternative for one particular set of circumstances. Yeah, I, okay, I hear you in that. Uh, and we don't want to necessarily allow this on a, on a number of sites that might have had a building removed in the interim. We want to see them redeveloped into building sites, not parking lots. Correct. We want to remove that incentive to demolish your building in the first place for parking, um, or sorry, keep what that disincentive be. up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and you're, I, what I hear you suggesting is there might be other policy tools that would see those sites, you know, maintained in a better state until they are redeveloped, but not with a parking lot. Will that policy be able to be retroactively applied? <coughs> As, not as a condition of yeah. a permit, I'm guessing. Unlikely, because it would yeah. have, like the mechanism would be the condition of the development or the demolition permit, and that demolition permit's already been issued. That particular one has already passed. So right. I like it that you know forward thinking. I hear what you say. Do this, not that. Mm -hmm. I just not, and maybe it's for a different place. I'm just not sure how we solve. And there might be, there's certainly one that's top of mind for us because we walk by it every day. But there's yep. a few. There probably is a few others, but not a lot of others. Yes. Do you think? Correct. Um, and I would say we've administration's been actively involved in trying to improve that site. Um, yeah. And others around, like we, we understand the the negative impacts uh, that these unsightly areas contribute to downtown, especially ones in prominent locations. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Councillor Carmel. We're just coming up on the noon hour, and I would like to give some clarity for some of the other items on our agenda. So I'm going to move that we postpone, uh, that the following items be postponed to the April 9th, 2024 Urban Planning Committee meeting. Item 7.7, .7, the bike plan implementation enhanced lighting. And item 7.8, exhibition lands planning framework and outdoor festival space. Um, so just as a quick introduction, this is just recognizing that we're unlikely to get to these items today and wanting to give clarity to the delegations that are on these two topics that you don't need to uh, wait until until 5 p.m. tonight. So um, just looking to see if I have any questions for my colleagues. Councillor Cartmel. Thank you. Uh, my understanding is that there are external uh, partners on item 7.8. So I wonder if we can make that time specific first item of business next UPC. That's a great, uh, great point. And we could likely do that through a gender review committee. I'd uh, rather do it here if we could. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Yep, happy to amend that. I think that's quite friendly. We'll just wait for some suggested wording. That was all I had. I Yep, that's great. Trust that it's being amended as yep. we speak. Yep, thank you. Yep, that's great. Um, so we'll just get that wording back up, but appreciate the, uh, the amendment there. Excellent. Excellent. So I will ask colleagues now to vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. So we'll recess now until 1.30 where we'll come back to questions of administration on item 7.2. Thank you.
We are live. Thank you very much and uh, welcome back to the March 19th Urban Planning Committee meeting. I'll start with a quick roll call of committee members. Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Thank you. We're also joined in chambers by Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Salvador. Good afternoon. And online, I see Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Principe. Hello. And I believe that is it. Oh, uh, and I see Mayor Sohi is online as well. Not sure if he's um, uh, tuned in at this exact moment. Okay, thank you. So we were at questions of administration. I'm not sure if we have the uh, previous speakers list available. But I will, oh, I think I can do it, great. Okay, well, I, I, will, I will go next then. Um, so thank you very much for this report. Really appreciate the, the work that's been done to find a way forward. Um, so I actually wanted to pick up on a question that came up earlier in terms of this program only be avail being available for existing parking lots. And I, to be honest, I'm just struggling from an equity perspective. So if someone, you know, hasn't opened an illegal parking lot due to, you know, adhering by, by our bylaws, um, are they at a disadvantage now that others who, who did forego that opportunity are able to get permits and, and apply? So just wondering some thoughts. Again, and I, I appreciate the tension of not wanting to incentivize or encourage additional parking lots, but just really struggling with that, that equity piece. So can you just clarify for me, Councillor, what's the scenario that you're worried about? What, what kind of parking lot? So in response to one of the previous questions, so I had assumed that we would amend the zoning bylaw to put temporary surface parking lot as a permitted use in the downtown zones. And then any landowner would be able to come forward and apply for a permit based on that use. What I think I heard in a previous answer was that this opportunity would only be available to existing illegal surface parking lots. Right, yeah, so that is correct. We would likely pick a date, say December 31st, 2023. Okay, and so I'm just wondering, for me that raises a question of a landowner who, let's say demolished a building five years ago, you know, there wasn't the option to get a permit through zoning, chose to not do that and forego that revenue. They're now not going to be provided the same development rights as, as someone else who, who didn't follow the rules, who did apply, who did just have a service parking lot without permits in place. So in fairness, the rules weren't there for them to follow, right? The zones didn't have the rights, so we didn't allow well, and that's why I'm saying yeah. they followed the rules. They, yeah. didn't, they didn't open a service parking lot because that was against the rules. I mean, even for the existing parking lots. Well, I mean, I know some on further west that, that are new, like certainly within the last six months. So, I mean, I think some of that has happened. But what you're suggesting is that for the past 10 years, this has not been a, a scenario. Exactly. It hasn't been possible. So, I mean, we can't really judge them, like I know we've called them non-compliant before, but there was no pathway for them to be compliant in a regulatory sense. So also, it, I mean, to answer your question though, I mean, really we just take another look at the statutory plan, right? And like the intent of the statutory plans that cover the majority of this area are no new parking lots. But I just wanna make sure I'm understanding. So that statutory plan came in 10 years ago. So in the past 10 years, there have been no demolition of buildings. There have been demolition of buildings? There, ha there have been demolition of buildings, but what we have seen is that a large, like the, 
when those buildings have been demolished, we haven't seen new parking lots really start on those. And, and what you're pointing out is perhaps they were following the rules and didn't start an illegal parking lot. And therefore it's inequitable to um, exclude them from the opportunity to participate in this program is mm -hmm. what I'm understanding. Correct. And I guess to that, I the question would be then, ultimately like we're following the rules of the policy and the plan and the direction of committee with this program that we put forward but this sounds like wanting to expand that further yeah i'm not i'm not sure that 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 addresses the concern um and so maybe just just as a last clarifying question like do we have data on when each of these parking lots opened like do we have that those timelines we can get it okay okay let me reflect on that further that was that was just one question uh, so I'll be coming back for more but I'll go next to Councillor Salvador yeah thank you um, uh, so I'll start with some questions just around the temporary nature of the permit um, how do we determine the length of time uh, for that temporary nature? Is it going to be sort of a case-by-case -case basis? Uh, I know you had mentioned some potential parameters earlier, but looking for a little more detail there. Yeah, so right now we're considering something in the range of seven to ten years. And this is really just trying to balance a number of factors, number one being like the extent of time they've already operated. So say if we picked 2011 since the time of the capital city downtown plan and the rezonings. So some would already be operating for 13 years. Um, it's also relative to the proportion of the ask for improvements. So if, there, if it's not permanent, we do need a way to balance the improvements that we're asking for. Um, and yeah. I guess is there, so I, I, can, I can definitely see the rationale there. Um, what would it look like if it was shorter, uh, like shorter intervals, but with opportunities for extensions? Um, more time consuming for administration to administer the program. Um, a lot more detail. Right now, the way it looks is it would be a new use introduced into the zoning bylaw. It would have the requirements laid out right there. It would have the timelines it would have the sunset clause. You'd know exactly geographically who this applies to. Um, pretty straightforward. When we start to put in new timelines and horizons and different sets of improvements, it just gets more complicated. Right. Okay, and I guess one of, one of my other big questions is just around the fee schedule for the, the development permits. How would that work? It would be charged the same as any other fee um, that we charge for uh, the si similar use. So we wouldn't be looking to penalize or charge a higher fee for it. Well, and maybe, so what is the fee right now? What would the equivalent fee I be? I think it's about $900. So $900. For a development permit. And yeah. then I think 255 there or thereabouts for the business license on an annual basis. Okay. So I want to, I just want to dig into that a little bit because I... Like, obviously, we don't want to, and we can't get into the realm of penalizing. But we are in a situation where, you know, we have businesses that are operating in a way that is counter to our stated policy goals and objectives. We're trying to create a path to compliance. But at the same time, the effort we're going to to create that path to compliance, like, the, the fact that we are having this conversation today, there is a cost associated with that. And I, I'm looking to see how that is being reflected in um, the fee structure. Or maybe, maybe there's another mechanism, but i that's what I'm really grappling with. So we did explore this a little bit and whether or not we should start to look at different fees, but then we start each fee that we have through the zoning bylaw, fee schedule, and the fee schedule that we have for the business license bylaw is based on certain parameters that have been established associated with that bylaw. And um, developing this program and putting those costs into it and adjusting the fees, in theory, um, and talking to our taxation lawyers, have they've indicated that it is possible. 
but there's a lot of additional effort to do that. And that additional cost may be a further deterrent to people coming into the program. And so for us, what we identified was we really did want people, we have a goal here, we have a stated goal that if these parking lots can be improved, then that will overall benefit the downtown and the city of Edmonton as a whole. And so we put forward the same fee structure as what we have for those other uses. Um, there is a potential to look at it further without running into jeopardy of an illegal tax. But again, there's, I think, a lot of, a lot of effort for um, trying to recoup a small, smaller percentage of funds. Councilor, okay. just to add, just in terms of the fees and the fee costs associated with the service being provided, uh, one of the, the fundamental principles of our fee setting is that uh, the fees that are charged reflect also the, the service that is being provided. Right, and, and I think that's, that's what I'm struggling with, is we're going, right, we're creating an additional layer of service and an additional program, which I think should be reflected in that fee. Um, so I'm out of time, but I'll come back. We, we can Thank take you, that Councilor. away, though, Councillor Salvador, and look into that. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, Councillor Wright. Oh, thank you very much. I thought Councillor Cartmel was on committee. Uh, he is not meant to be on the list right now. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I do have a few questions. Um, so this is relates to existing parking lots only. What about, um, what about those that do do become vacant land? So that if they demolish within you know, the next year or two. What controls are in place, I guess, so that they don't just sit there vacant or become parking lots? So in terms of not becoming a parking lot, again, we've seen that there hasn't been an uptake of parking lots when they demolish. So okay. we would expect that that to carry through. Um, in terms of the actual site parameters itself, as Mr. Pollock pointed out earlier today, we are exploring this in the zoning bylaw as a potential amendment to set some minimum standards for what a dem demolished site that doesn't proceed to development um, should provide. So we are looking at that, but that doesn't address currently vacant lots. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, and then I'm also wondering the time frame for phase one, because that also needs to include a public hearing is that right that's correct and so when would uh, how long would this all take sorry we are tar targeting q4 q4 of this year yeah 2024 that's right okay and um thank you for that and then i'm also concerned about um and, and this i think came up last week about um, accessible stalls on these on these gravel parking lots, especially, um, and I, and I learned that it's only required if it, if the lot is connected to a building. Will there be anything so it, that would allow accessible stalls if a lot is not a part of a building? We can certainly explore that, Councillor Wright. It's it's a good flag. Okay, and then, um, and then, yeah, and as far as like being gravel, that's not necessarily good for for getting around in a wheelchair or walker. Do you know? So could a por could a portion be um, paved? And I know that's more expensive than gravel. Right. So um, I did a bit of research on this, and um, our access guidelines that only apply to City of Edmonton property, but they set out some um, good best practices and uh, some standards. It Gravel can be an accessible surface parking, or can be accessible for uh, wheelchairs or people rolling. So really it depends on how level it is and how sturdy it is. So the materials that are not recommended would be something that wheels can slide in, like sand or mulch. But if it's compacted gravel um, and it's graded well, uh, it can be accessible. And as long as it's maintained. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Um, that's, I think, all the questions I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Jans? 
Thank you. Um, I just wanted to understand better um, this question about cost recovery, um, because right now any costs on this industry or this business activity are being borne by everyone else. Councillor Jans, is there there a, a question that uh, is a little bit more? Yeah, yeah. In there? Yeah, sure. Like, um, how how was that I, earlier? I think I was um, maybe um, uh, Miss Peters or or, or uh, Miss St. Auburn who said that uh, they need we would not reach cost recovery, and I want to understand why. So. It will depend on how much um, we've identified uh, a base cost for this program. Um, and that is what that relates to the enforcement efforts that we have identified that this program could potentially uh, require. If we do not receive take up from the community and we go down a path of very heavy enforcement where we start to um, take things to court and we start to um, do on-site um, improvements or I guess not improvements, but basically Jersey barricade access and stuff, the costs will continue to go up. So the way to reach cost recovery would ultimately be to have a much longer program, which thereby decreases the ability to incentivize further development on the site. Um, isn't there also isn't there also the ability to charge uh, fees that are more reflective of the true cost? So, and that was the question that I was um, that we were trying to respond to, Councillor Salvador. So, we do have the ability to explore the cost of the program, and then to try and build in the fees accordingly. But again, we want to make sure that we aren't over. We don't want to disincentivize uh, uptake of the program based on costs alone, and. Um, so there's there's a very like in you know this whole conversation we are realizing how many factors go into gaining uptake and achieving the goals that were set out for the program, and we're trying to deliver and have that highest level of uptake for the program, considering all these um, tricky factors. And so again, we could look at exploring those costs. That in itself will increase the cost of the program as we set out different fees for it. But we do have to be very careful about not overcharging and creating that hidden tax. But I, I, I think we're well, well, well away from a hidden tax or overcharging. Like we are, um, you know, not only would be, um, well, I think the business license fees alone are not reflective of the true value of, of, of the business that's being undertaken. I mean, it's less than I think a, uh, less than like a garage renovation permit, right? Like it's, it's incredibly, incredibly low. And uh, I thought in general, when doing development, one of our principles is we want sort of the development service unit to be cost recovery like and and uh the you know the 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 rest of the tax base shouldn't be subsidizing uh a a development operation i i'm, I'm just wondering how we can extra like ensure fairness um like we all we all want these sites developed eventually we all want the non-compliant to be brought into compliant and we all want action against the non-compliant um, but we want to do so in a sustainable way. Like, I don't understand why a business on White Avenue now would have to pay a higher tax bill to subsidize paying to address the, this parking lot activity that's already, for, in many cases, has been operating non-compliantly. Does it, does it make sense? Like, I'm just looking for how do we balance the revenue question and looking for as many options as possible here. So we can explore changing the fees for the development permits for and the business licenses for these programs. That will expand the scope of the program. We'll have to make some changes. And it does start to change how we, um, we fee for these services overall. So it starts yeah, to change Yeah, like we could philosophy. have other inspection fees. Yeah, other inspection fees, other charges. We could have other, other like if the... You know, if the fire department charges when they have a false alarm, surely we can charge for the cost of certain inspections or things or or staffing work. Councillor, just just to add, uh, just in terms of sort of our overall compliance activities, uh, there isn't a way to be cost neutral on most, if not all, of our other compliance activities. So we'd be treating it the same way 
um, as these as those other files. Um, but we do understand the feedback here, and we can we can take that back. And if this does progress, we could uh, look at other options as we create and flesh out phase one. Great, thank you. Very yeah, much. absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor Cartmel. Thank you. Maybe just picking up on that. So, if, if a non-compliant parking lot now goes and gets its permits and becomes compliant, would that be considered an improvement? Like, does that mean that their property taxes would increase? Do we know? Could it? I think it could. It, it could, right? It could be considered an improvement, and now the value of the property goes up, so now the property taxes go up. Um, BIA levies, would there be a, a levy that they now pay because now they have a permit and before they didn't? It will definitely help with that process. So is there a bit of an analysis that could be made, you know, that revenue in versus, versus cost out? Because my understanding of, of in, in very broad terms, permits and inspection fees pay for the permit service and the inspection service, but not, I, I, you know, so it pays for the people that do the permits and pays for the people that do the inspections. If so, not not directly, but that's kind of the goal. Yes, through the reserve. Correct. Uh, compliance activities are, are different, and they're they're funded through tax levy. Right. So so if the permits are a wash, and the property tax is a net gain, and the BIA levy is a net gain, then somebody that's operating a parking lot, you'll, uh, an unpermitted parking lot, is now paying a lot more money to be compliant, paying more tax theoretically as, to reflect the value of that property and has a sunset clause. And an improved uh, lot that adds to the beautification and safety of downtown. Also at their cost, right? Correct. So, and I, like I, I completely agree with that, but we get something that is more aesthetically pleasing in the short term until development in the more medium term takes place. That's essentially the sort of the financial picture, is that right? Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Um, so recognizing we still have a number of items to get through, I do think there's some really critical things I want to dig into. So typically, um, we typically someone is charged uh, double the, the application fee for development permit when they have uh, an illegal structure. Is that correct? Um, sometimes, yes. It depends on how the path and the compliance occurred. But yes, that can, that is a practice. Okay, so is that something we would consider in this case? If that is what, if that we can, yes. Okay. Then just in terms of, I think Councillor Salvador was getting at this in terms of the additional service. We are talking about proactively rezoning these properties, right? So individual property owners are not having to pay for a rezoning application. So would that potentially be factored into the cost of the development permit as well? No, we were planning on using our standard fee schedule for this. Similar to what we have done in the past where we proactively zoned for things like cannabis stores across different zones, et cetera. We're creating opportunities for compliance. And then our fee schedule somewhat reflects that. I, I mean, but the, the, it was creating opportunity for new cannabis stores to open, not for existing businesses to continue operating in a compliant way, right? Like, I, I, the alternative is that we could not proactively rezone, but tell individual property owners that they can, could come forward for a tax amendment to the rezoning, right? And that would come at a cost to them. Like, I, I, I just think it is important to quantify that there is service that's being provided. Councillor Stevenson, I think it might be helpful to think of this as a reset. Right, we did rezone those properties in 2011 to take away those rights or to change the rights. Um, and it's created a situation that they're still operating. And now it's 10 years on, 10 plus years on, and this is an opportunity for us to refresh and reset. Mm. Councillor, I think the, the point is taken though in terms of the, the service being provided through the rezoning and how that can be reflected in uh, fee schedules, whether it's the doubling of the fees or because it's currently Ill illegal or how that service provision is being provided. Great. Thank you so much. Just in terms of, uh, again, that really tricky question of what temporary is. So I guess a concern I have around that is let's say we determine that the the temporary nature of it is, is seven years. So everyone in 2024 gets seven years. What do we see happening in 2031? 
the use expires. And then do we enforce, like again, if we're talking about like market absorption of land, um, having all of those lots become, like I feel like, in, like I'm not sure how we. I think as, as the program progresses, uh, we'll monitor it. Um, and it gives an opportunity for another discussion at council if we want to further increase the improvements on the site, uh, if, if it does come to that. Well, and that, that is exactly why I'm asking, because I, I think that, like, I'm, I'm leaning towards requiring hard surfacing because temporary always seems to last a little bit longer, right? Um, and so why not set that expectation? And in maybe a few scenarios, it, it is sooner than we anticipate, but thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's uh, sort of that next round of engagement uh, with parking suppliers uh, and landowners in terms of balancing out the the investment required to to meet the level or the expectation set out within the the proposed regulations, whatever those might be, uh, and then long and the longevity of that permit. Um, and then the the trick there is, um, and we get into some more of those equity considerations if we're giving say, if we demand meet the bylaw today, which is paved, uh, drained, uh, lit appropriately, et cetera, uh, then you have an outright permitted use, uh, and then it becomes more and more difficult to stop additional parking lots from coming online. Because then that use is outright permitted throughout the area, um, and it's not on this temporary provision, which we're still trying to respect that overarching policy of not allowing new parking lots. But it still wouldn't be outright permitted if we had the time restriction or right had to exist prior to December 31st, 2023. Like that would still be the restriction. It wouldn't, it wouldn't make new parking lots compliant if, if there wasn't a zoning provision for it. I think just the balance of rights is off now, right? Like a permanent parking lot, the zoning bylaw has requirements for. So now if we're getting a lot closer to that when we add paving. Okay, I see that logic. I guess we're, I, I'm not seeing anyone else on the board, uh, so I might just carry on with a, oh, I'll, I'll go to Councillor Salvador to break it up a bit. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, so, sorry, I just wanna come back to um, the seven to 10 year uh, time frame that, that's being discussed. So, um, what would happen in a scenario you know, we, we provide that temporary um, permit, seven year time horizon, um, if we're noticing like a year or two in that the required upgrades are not being being made. Walk me through that. Yes, so we'd be able to enforce on not meeting those development permit conditions. And so then again, we could start to levy those fines and ultimately if required, we could look at revoking that development permit if need be. Okay, and just from a, um, I guess from a resourcing and efficiency perspective, it is, it's preferred to do that route as opposed to shorter time intervals. Because I'm, like, I'm thinking if it was three years or four years instead of seven to ten, it's, there's almost like a, a check-in that's built into that. Mm -hmm. um, but you're saying that that permit can be revoked yeah, regardless. And, and so typically with temporary permits, we do usually have a five-year limit on them. Like it's about five. Um, so if we did do a five-year permit and let's say the program was 10 years, so they could come in for their first one, they could come in for their second one. There'd be some fees associated with that. Um, it gives them some certainty as well because again, we're entering into an agreement that they're going to do some development on the site, that they get that certainty for the longer period of time. The shorter the permit, the less certainty that, that they have, which will likely impact the uptake of the program as well. So again, it's this trying to find that right, um, the right investment and the right permissions to meet right. this program. Okay, and then just on uptake of the program, um, you might not be able to answer this, but what do we anticipate the uptake will be? We, uh, we don't have a number. Maybe we'll set a target for ourselves at 90%. Um, we're, not, we're really not sure. Yeah, okay. And yeah, I think that's, that's fair. Uh, I guess if we run into a scenario where we are completely unable to contact uh, some, of, some of these property owners, um, can you help me understand sort of the escalation of steps that would happen uh, and what would that result in? We're not 
concerned about not being able to contact the property owners. We have um, a really standard and rigorous approach to gaining contact with property owners. We have been able to contact property owners in the States before, so we, we do have that ability. It takes time, it takes effort. Um, so they will be informed. They would be informed about the program. They would be given all the details on it. And if they didn't come into the program at the timelines that we set out, we would then begin to start that um, enforcement action, which would typically start with tickets and then move through the escalation. So in terms of contact alone, we're not too concerned about that. Okay, um, and I, I believe I've asked this in the past, and I think the answer was that um, the team was gonna look into it, but uh, just the idea of au auctioned permits, um, was that ever contemplated? Sorry, auctioned permits? Yes. I think I might need some more. Oh, sorry. Um, so instead of basically having a 100% opportunity for all to take part in the program, um, having an auction style um, program or route in place so that there is a little bit more control over uh, the quantity that we'd be giving out. I think the, the issue that we're trying to tackle uh, through this is the the beautification of these parking lots and this increasing of safety and it's not necessarily uh, looking at it in a lens of who gets to operate it's about how to increase or uplift uh, the aesthetic and the safety of, of these parking lots while they exist right. and, and so through an auction you're gonna uh, by nature exempt some from not having to do it and then we would do the enforcement etc but we're still left with a uh, with an uh, unimproved lot. Right. Um, okay, I might give that a little bit of a think. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a way to provide an incentive through the length of the permit linked to the, to the level of improvement? So if you commit to paving, if you commit to X, you get a 10-year permit. If you're not committing to those things, it's a five-year permit. There is a way, but it adds further complexity, um, and then it also may take away from those redevelopment goals. Uh, the more improvements you put on a site, the less likely it's going to turn over faster. Uh, so again, like it, it's just, it's a it's a tricky balance. We're not saying we have it right uh, mm -hmm. because we haven't dived in to outside of a, a very broad framework, um, but it's an option that we can look at. Okay, yeah, I think that's worth exploring because um, I think, I mean, I think when we're talking about a 10 year permit and that you could come in for a renewal after 10 years, like we are talking effectively about permanent parking lots. And I think, I think being uh, honest about that and, and planning accordingly, there's, there could be value in that. Um, just in terms of the cost of enforcement. So I went back to the original report from September 19th and I didn't see a specific number related to sort of like a strictly enforcement approach. Did we have that in September? I think we outlined a large cost. Um, right now we were thinking it would probably be, um, if we were to get directed to put through a SOBA, we were looking at two compliance officers for two years. So about $240,000. There may be some additional costs that would occur as we go through improvements on site, but those would be charged back to the landowner eventually. Sure. So we didn't put that in. Okay, and so um, just for my memory, so the number that was in September 19th was higher than 220. It was like including proactively having funds available to do some of this on-site mitigation work, remediation work, sorry. Okay, I, I think the point I'm trying to understand is, is the advantage of providing a path to compliance is that we reduce the amount of compliance, which also reduces the amount of compliance resources that we need? Correct. Great, okay. Um, and then, again, recognizing uh, our fiscal position and some of the challenges we're facing, are there other ways to cover the enforcement costs? Are there projects that could be reprioritized or, or some consideration around that? So there are, um, and as we discussed back in September, right now, our enforcement team focuses on life safety issues, um, specifically with relation to the secondary suite, um, things like development without a permit, which I realize this is development without a permit, but it's not a structure. It's slightly less impactful, so to speak. Um, so we definitely can re we can pivot, we can redirect. Um, it will be a slower path. It won't 
um, because we're going to have to scale down on some of our files and we won't necessarily have that full scale force on it. Um, what 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 is the proportion to compliance officers? What proportion of your contingent is that? Like what proportion of work are we talking about? It would They would be focused solely on this work. Uh, of the total number of compliance officers you have, what, what is that Oh, number? okay. I think we have about, ooh, I think we have about 10 altogether. This is 20%. Yeah, because we'd work. be taking on 100 okay. files all at once. Yeah. But less than 100 because we would hope that 90% would not require compliance, right? Like that's where I'm struggling is if, if the, so I don't even know that we can quantify how many enforcement resources we need until we've provided people the path and then we know how many people have taken it up and how many haven't, right? So the, uh, the, the chicken and egg there is if uh, the signal is sent that we don't have sufficient compliance and enforcement resources, uh, the less likelihood of anyone entering into the, we'll call it the compliance program. Uh, to to move it forward, um, but yeah, there there is a a, a juggling there. Um, if directed to pursue this program, uh, I think there's there's two options. One there's there's looking for additional funding, and the other is to reprioritize our, our resources. And, and Lila said, what would likely happen here is we would still prioritize the life safety uh, issues, um, and then the other uh, developments without permits uh, would would take longer uh, to get to. Okay, that's really helpful. So life safety would still be prioritized. We wouldn't um, have any impacts there. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, I'm gonna take one more round, not seeing anyone else up on the board and hopefully not a full round. Just wondering, um, for those that choose to not uh, take this path of compliance, I think you know we did hear really strongly through this discussion that there is a concern around vacant vacant land so just wondering if we've explored incentives for other use so are there any tax incentives if let's say someone converted it to uh, a park space there isn't uh, any sort of tax subsidies or incentives uh, that can be applied to it we would have to look at a, at a grant program essentially to cover off any sort of tax uh, abatement that we would look at doing uh, so that that's not an option uh, in terms of looking at other ways of activating in terms of what's out there currently, uh, if landowners wanted to make it a park, uh, that could be an option through the downtown vibrancy fund. Uh, but in terms of short-term activities, the fund is sort of uh, pivoting to more long-term impactful uh, projects instead of short uh, actions or temporary actions. Well, I, you know, I would argue that ten having a park for ten years in the downtown would be would be a meaningful. No, I'm saying yeah, the par yeah. a park would uh, likely qualify. Oh, okay, uh, I gotcha. For an option. Okay, that sounds really good. Um, and and sorry, I don't know if we have anyone from taxation on the line, but is there is, is the property assessed differently if it's provided for public open space? We do have Cam on the line. I'm wondering if he wants to pop in. Give that a moment. In the absence of Cam, I can probably speak to that. Thank you, yes. Please. Uh, Anton from Assessment and Taxation. So yeah, so really when it comes to these kinds of lots, whether or not they're being used for parking or they're used, being used for parks uh, or any kind of other use like that, we're typically looking at them as vacant land parcels, right? So they're, for the most part, unimproved. What is the highest and best use of those properties? to sell them for development potential. So we're comparing them to other land that's being sold in the downtown and valuing them as such, typically. Would we have the option of introducing a, a subclass if we did want to incent the, the temporary uh, installation of parks? So I, I think I heard that question asked and answered previously, but I'll, I'll reiterate it. The challenge we have, and this is a broken record uh, when it comes to this stuff is, uh, under provincial legislation, any kind of non-residential tax rates in the park would be, there's no one living there, right? So it's not a residential use, it's a non-residential use, is very limited. We do not have the ability to split that non-residential rate into different components beyond the ones that have been outlined in the MGA. And a special rate, higher or lower, for parks or parking lots is not one of the ones contemplated in the MGA. Great, and, and that would stand even if um, there was a, a user agreement uh, with the city, for example, or the city was somehow not quite the landowner, but had had interest on title, for example? 
We are constrained by the legislation. Cam, did you want to speak any further on that? No, I mean, I think that's clear. Just wanted to, to explore that one last time. Um, okay, so just so I understand next steps, if we were, you know, I'm contemplating a motion at this point that's maybe looking at that uh, reprioritization approach. Could you just walk me through the timeline? So you have direction today uh, in terms of proceeding with, with this approach, but there were a number of details that sounded like needed to be sorted out. So yeah, could you, could you share some of that? When the next touch point with council would be, um, how we might go from there? Well, uh, we would start with uh, phase one, which is the rezoning and the text amendment. The next touch point with uh, council would be at that public hearing. Um, through during that time, we would be building out the program in more detail. We'd be doing engagement with stakeholders. Um, and I guess the next firming up those next time horizons. So the 24 months for um, compliance and the detailed steps for the property owners and operators, um, information about the program um, and exactly when <laughs> They can come in when the deadlines are, what the use looks like, what the expectations are. Um, so it's three years. Okay, great. And then I'm thinking just, so if our next touch point is public hearing, is it appropriate for us to talk about program parameters in the in the context of a public hearing, recognizing that we're usually limited to, to land use considerations? I think prior to that public hearing, we'd look to send out a memo outlining those details uh, so that we can keep that conversation separate and uh, focused on the, the regulatory process. Perfect, perfect. Okay, that's very helpful. Um, so I, I have a motion on the floor that I, or sorry, that I wish to put on the floor. I don't believe it would have a due date back to council. Just looking to clerk um, in terms of the question. I think it's just a, a, mo a direction, yeah? Okay. Okay, well, I will put that on and, and welcome discussion and comments. So I will move that Urban Planning Committee recommend to City Council that administration develop a limited program as outlined in the March 19th, 2024 Urban Planning Economy Report, UPE 011, oh, sorry, 1557 revised to regulate center city surface parking lots for a time period, oh, sorry, for a time limited period and to reprioritize resources within the development compliance and enforcement program to allow sufficient compliance activities. Um, as, a, as a brief introduction, I mean, this is not a motion I ever thought I would be making. Um, I think surface parking lots have detracted from the vibrancy of our downtown for, for many years. And looking for solutions to address them uh, is something that I hear from many, many Edmontonians wanting to hear. When we first talked about this back in September, I think, um, you know, the assumption is always, well, we could just enforce on these. I think the data and information presented to us in September did a great job of really outlining the scope and scale of that um, endeavor. And also that it may have outcomes that, that don't support vibrancy in the downtown. Um, converting all of these parking lots into vacant lots doesn't necessarily help achieve our, our objectives. Um, what, what this path forward for me offers is a way to improve uh, what we currently have. I really appreciated the point that these are lots that existed prior to our downtown plan coming into effect. They are legacies of that time and turning a blind eye or wanting them to not be there doesn't change the fact that they are there. Um, what this offers is a way to enhance those, beautify them without leading, um, again, with w while avoiding the risk of, of swaths of completely vacant land. Uh, I'm hopeful that we will see uptake of, of this program, um, but I'm also pleased that we are committing to strong enforcement for those who choose to not take a path of compliance. Um, that ensures that anyone who's not willing to make the necessary investments to, to contribute positively to the downtown, to also be able to contribute to the Downtown Business Association and the efforts that they make towards downtown vibrancy, uh, that enforcement would be actioned and, and actioned effectively. Um, 
definitely, definitely not a perfect solution, but I really appreciate the creativity of the team coming forward with a path uh, that we can take that I think gets us to a better outcome in the end. So happy to take questions and hear further discussion from my colleagues. Thank you. Well, I'm not seeing anyone. Uh, no? Okay. Uh, would anybody like to speak to this motion? I'm also not seeing anyone. Okay, then I'll ask my committee colleagues to please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. Oh. And that's carried. If I had closed properly, I would have thanked administration for their work on this and look forward to the next steps coming forward. Okay, with that, we are done our second item of the day and we are on to item 7.3, Heritage Places Strategy Options. And we'll go first to administration for a presentation uh, before we hear from our speakers. You've, you've cleared the house, Mr. Backstrom. Yeah, I don't know what that says about me. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks for your patience. Uh, all right, yeah, the presentation is up. Um, one of the guiding principles in the city plan is to preserve what matters the most. More specifically, the city plan encourages the identification and preservation of historic resources and cultural and natural landscapes. The city plan also, of course, calls for sig significant redevelopment in the older neighborhoods where historic resources are primarily located. This means that we need to be strategic about, about the heritage places that our community wants to preserve for future generations. Council has been alert to this tension between heritage preservation and redevelopment due to competing priorities and constrained finances. And uh, um, due to those constrained finances has been unable to provide new budget funds for a refreshed heritage strategy. We're now here with a report about preparing this strategy using existing resources. So uh, with, uh, with me here is uh, Kim Petron, De Deputy City Manager, and online um, are Kent Snyder, the branch manager, Rhonda Tui, Director Shauna Kuiper, and uh, the General Supervisor and Harm Lakit Rai from uh, Finance. So next slide, please. Heritage is our legacy from the past, what we live with today and what we pass on to future generations. Edmonton has close to 1,000 properties on the heritage inventory and 203 properties are legally protected from demolition. Heritage properties provide unique and exciting experiences. Their preservation also uh, contributes to our economy through re rehabilitation and maintenance of these structures. Non-residential properties in particular contribute to a vib vibrant local economy. Next slide. Events such as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Edmonton's Declaration of a Climate Emergency, and social change movements require us to evaluate what and whose heritage we preserve and how we preserve it. It requires us to ask if there is more that we can do or if there's something else we should be doing. While the city's heritage program has been successful in preserving buildings across the city and, and reflecting our past, our guiding heritage strategy, the Historic Resources Management Plan from 2009, is out of date. A new strategy is necessary so that we can evolve our understanding of heritage and its role in preserving buildings, cultural places, and natural sites, as well as 
defining a role for heritage in our climate resilience and energy transition goals. Next slide. To complete a new heritage places strategy within existing budgets, administration recommends a project with a narrower scope than presented to council in the 2023 and 2024 budget deliberations. As initially contemplated in those budgets, the strategy project was to include citywide engagement and the creation of a new permanent FTE and would have cost $781,000 over three years. The new FTE was needed not only to help undertake the strategy, but also to help implement it once completed. Administ administration's plan is now to limit engagement to key stakeholders and to reduce both staff and consulting costs. This would bring the cost down to no more than $490,000 with careful management, this reduced cost can be paid for out of the Heritage Resources Reserve. Council currently allocates $2.3 million annually to the reserve, which is used for the rehabilitation and maintenance of his municipal historic resources. Under current projections, adding in the cost of the Heritage Strategy would leave the reserve with a positive balance at the end of 2026 the city can continue to meet its legal obligations with existing rehabilitation and maintenance agreements while completing the heritage strategy. The absence of the new FTE in this scenario means that implementation of some aspects of the strategy may need to wait until additional staffing is available. Next slide. Administration does not recommend that the Glenora Heritage Character Area rezoning project be resumed. The project was initiated in 2019 and paused in 2021 at the direction of Urban Planning Committee. Without additional resources, administration cannot undertake both the Heritage Strategy and the Glenora Project. Doing, doing both would increase the draw from the Heritage Reserve um, and, uh, and strain staff resources. This would risk administration's ability to meet legal obligations under existing heritage designation bylaws and uh, to advance new applications to designate municipal historic resources. Administration is concerned about the ongoing demolition of historic resources in Glenora, but given our existing resources, it would be better to revisit the Glenora project after the new heritage strategy is in place. Next slide, that's, that's our presentation. We'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, really appreciate the presentation. Uh, we'll go next to our public speakers. Um, so I would like to welcome uh, first of all, Kyle Scholey. I always think I, I'm saying your name wrong. Are you there, Kyle? Kyle had indicated earlier that they may not be able to attend anymore. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Wendy Antoniak. Are you there, Wendy? Yes. Oh, hi. Oh, Good hi. afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, we uh, have... we... Oh. If you can just if you mute can yourself, just mute you've yourself. got a bit of, a bit of, a bit of a echo. Okay. Oh. Sorry, I thought you were saying I should go. Oh, sorry. No, just checking in to see who we've got with us. Uh, Lynn Odinsky. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, good afternoon. And David Ridley, I think I just saw you there. Good afternoon, Councillor. Great. Oh, we, uh, David, can you just do a mic check? We couldn't quite hear you there. Uh, good afternoon, check. Okay, you're quite quiet, um, uh, okay, but we'll see, if see if I can bring it up here a bit. That's better. Thank you so much. Okay, Thank you. well, um, I believe many of you have spoken at committee before, but just as a reminder, you'll each have five minutes to present. Um, at the end of each of at the end of the three of yours presentations, members of committee and council will have an opportunity to ask questions. So please stick around. Um, Please stay on mute when you're not speaking and uh, refrain from using the raise hand function. And we'll go now to uh, Speaker Antoniak. Over to you. Over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to participate. I'm Wendy Antoniak with the Old Glenora Conservation Association and the Civics Committee with the Glenora Community League. With these two groups, I represent over 500 members in Glenora. I'm here to specifically address the direct control zoning for the Glenora Heritage Character Area that I think was shortchanged in administration's report. The motion from Councillor Knack last year asked for options 
Admin only was able to say they do not recommend because they currently do not have enough money in the heritage budget. Um, that was money to cover one FTE. Um, according to the auditor's report, it's 100 to 150,000. So I ask, what about other options, actual options like moving money from another budget area, secondments, uh, waiting until the fall budget cycle, or even to next year? Not funding no and just say no is not an option. It's an opinion to end it. This needs to be a council decision. Not funding the completion of the Heritage Zone project will result in half a million dollars that's already spent to be completely wasted. Not to mention the staff time that worked on it over six years. It's especially egregious because this project supports the city plan. It 1.2, which celebrates unique heritage, 1.3, Edmonton City designs, fosters a place of celebrating unique attributes, diversity, etc. 5.2, Edmonton protects and enhances its images and identity through heritage. So this is your challenge, I think, as councillors. You need to follow the city plan, the whole city plan, and make decisions that uphold those six stated values and the 24 city building outcomes, three of which I just mentioned would be accomplished with pursuing this project. The heritage character area is not a new concept. It exists in cities all over the world and exists in Edmonton, in West Mountain, Alberta Avenue, Garneau, Old Strathcona, 96 and Church Street. And I take great exception, actually, to admin statement in the report says these residents, Glenora, look to neighborhood character heritage characteristics to protect it from redevelopment. Instead, I'd rephrase that. I'd say these residents are passionate to preserve heritage, their unique heritage. Heritage preservation isn't a tool for us. It's to preserve the heritage. That's our motivation. So you're probably asking, why should Glenora have this heritage zoning now? Because Currently, Glenora, unlike on any other area, other areas in the city, has no protections. Nothing is mentioned about heritage in the new draft district plan. You know why? Because there is no heritage zoning. All the other heritage areas have some mention. It has strangely been left out, despite Glenora having 20% of the city's heritage homes. It's past time we in Glenora need equity. Edmonton Heritage is disappearing. National Trust said this area is one of the most at-risk historical resources in Canada. In 2015, Council agreed to fund the consultants the city hired who completed their report. Sorry, am I out of time? Oh, there no, I see it. Good. Okay. Um, consultants uh, re report in 2017, they identified that 1911 Glenora subdivision with had its high level of integrity and preservation is one of the best preserved garden city neighborhoods in Canada and that it should be protected. They proposed the whole area be a historical zone. Then another group of consultants in 2019, again that the city council approved, worked to come up with the heritage zones with input from a working group that comprised developers, young parents, gender diverse people, women and seniors. And, and a survey was done by the city, which found overwhelming support from within and outside the community for heritage. But suddenly in 2021, a letter from IDEA made its rounds to councillors and the project was halted upon IDEA's recommendation. Since that time, as was written by administration in the report, they have heard from developers who do not want area specific development restrictions in Glenora indicating that such restrictions would limit opportunities for housing densification. So I wonder who these developers are. It's kind of a, some people say, non-substantiated argument, I'd say. I doubt these developers or many objecting to heritage zoning have actually read the heritage zoning. Oh, I lost my notes. Um, because in the heritage zoning, it allows for all kinds of increased density. The new builds just require some creativity. The motion asks, what is the impact of funding the DC heritage zoning? It's not addressed. What it would do is, is preserve at least three, pursue three outcomes of the city plan. It would increase density while preserving the garden city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll go to Speaker Odinsky. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Time and time again, members of this committee, along with other members of City Council, have consistently and repeatedly emphasized their commitment to the City Plan. 
As you know, and as Eric Baxter stated, the city plan has as one of its key goals promoting Edmonton's history and encouraging a sense of local identity by preserving and enhancing heritage. The new zoning bylaw identifies heritage areas such as Waha and West Ingle, but excludes ex establishing the recommended heritage areas in Glenora, even though that recommendation was made in 2017. As well, the city plan is clear that Edmonton will consider, enhance, and preserve historic resources through ongoing redevelopment processes. This is a crucial point. Heritage structures and spaces cannot be recovered once demolished or covered if they've been covered with concrete and steel. Once heritage resources are gone, they are gone forever. <clears throat> council, it is not like a bargaining process where council can intervene at the last minute and save the day. Turning a blind eye will only mean the continual loss of heritage and its eventual demise in this community. What we desperately need now is a plan for how we will protect and enhance Glenora's professionally documented historic resources throughout the redevelopment and densification process. Just so you know, none of the RF3 or RF5 zoning approvals that you've made since your, you began your term have been developed. All of them are currently on the market for resale. There is a huge problem in Glenora uh, people see it as an opportunity to make money rather than an opportunity to densify. And the heritage plan that was developed provided opportunities for both densification and heritage character maintenance. <laughs> Unfortunately, the report continues recommends that we continue to sacrifice heritage to density. The rationale being that the city can't possibly find a hundred to $150,000 to complete this project. This despite the fact that two weeks ago, city administration recommended and you approved subsidizing the private development industry by assuming the business costs infill developers Will normally would normally pay to the city to develop a piece of land in a priority growth area. My question to this committee and to any councillors listening in is how can this city in all good conscience find the funds to subsidize private developers already making billions of dollars and somehow not be able to find a hundred to 150 grand to address the heritage needs of one of its communities that have been formally documented and recognized as a key historic resource. The draft Glenora Heritage Character Zoning did enable affordable densification, and it did so while enabling the community to retain its heritage character. What it didn't do is give the infill development industry carte blanche to destroy its historic value. By not funding this draft heritage character plan, you will be giving carte blanche to the development community to destroy the historic, the historic value located here. 5.2.1.6. Of the city plan states the city will incorporate and reflect the diverse heritage of local communities through stories structures and spaces surely this requires more than a the blanket approach put forward in this community in this report heritage is clearly delineated in the city plan we urge you to finish the heritage character zoning for glenora so you can see for yourself that density and heritage can go hand in hand in this community, regardless of what some developers say. Thank you very Thank much. You.
Thank you. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, now our, our last speaker, uh, Speaker Ridley, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Councillor. And uh, I hope I'm coming through all right and thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak briefly. Uh, I'm Executive Director of the Edmonton Heritage Council. Um, I'm speaking today in support of the report, um, notwithstanding the, the uh, legitimate concerns of our colleagues from uh, Glenora. But really, um, I think the preferred option that's presented here, and I applaud administration's work um, on, on this, uh, is a really a prudent and responsible approach to advancing and extending the, uh, and updating and refreshing uh, what's now referred to as the Heritage Places Strategy. I think that's a great way to go about it. Um, and we've been, along with the Edmonton Her uh, Historic Board, Historical Board, I gotta get these things right, I really should, um, support for an update and a refresh for some years now. So um, this will really help extend the thinking and the approach to this program out further into the city. There's lots of work that, that can be done and it's going to result in something that's going to certainly enhance the connection with heritage um, across the city as, it, as it's implemented. Now, it's always a matter of resources and of course that's, that's key. You know, the, the program, uh, the Historical Resources Management Program that was established in 2009 was well recognized. Um, it was uh, received awards for its um, time, but it's, it's overdue for this, uh, this um, refresh. I think what's interesting though and important to keep in mind with this report is that nationally and internationally, uh, what's called the Heritage Reset is, is already substantially shaping the agenda. And so the option that's provided in this report will really help provide a, a, a really great Edmonton fit for what's emerging as the broader agenda and some of the shifts in terms of heritage, um, co conservation, preservation thinking. Um, and it'll it'll actually strengthen the alignment that already exists, has been pointed out today by, by all speakers with city councils and the city of Edmonton's priorities. So these are, you know, as we've, as we certainly see today, managing conflicts and change. So balancing heritage conservation and other community values. It's an important element of the heritage reset. And really the that their staffing and heritage professionals are prepared uh, in helping communities identify and balance competing values. Um, heritage conservation and climate action is another essential tenet of the um, heritage reset, as we call it. So learning to speak the language of carbon conservation in buildings, upfront carbon, embodied carbon, time value of carbon, carbon, carbon budgets, and so on. Um, so this is really important to be brought into the current um, current strategy. Not that it's not there, but again, some refinement and some um, strengthening. Uh, of course, the economic value of heritage, um, whether it's a commercial or as it as it works in a, a range of neighborhood situations, and the benefits that come of that, which are both social, cultural, and clearly economic. Um, an essential tenet is really to do with truth and reconciliation and the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People um, and, and how uh, heritage places should, should uh, work reflects um, in the Indigenous uh, community. Um, I'm, so, I'm so proud uh, here in Edmonton when I, we can point out what's happened at Kichikaski and then the adjacent um, uh, ochre uh, deposits, just as one example of something that, that um, you know, the approach as to how to preserve that, um, how to work with it um, needs to be updated, but I really applaud administration for working with the resources they have in order to advance um, thinking like that. And there's more to be done on that. And then finally, heritage conservation, broadly speaking, um, equity and inclusion. And so that this work really reflects the breadth of the city, um, as well as continues the reflection of previous chapters and the stories of, um, er, uh, of, of the uh, earlier settlement as well. Um, so all of this will lead to, uh, I think, a more strongly aligned, it's already strongly aligned, but even strengthen the uh, approach to historic resource inventories um, and the related programs that are supporting Edmontonians in preserving the places and the related heritage, the heritage, the stories, the traditions, um, the events and people that they most value. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will ask my colleagues to sign up to ask questions of our speakers. Thank you all for joining us.
Okay. Well, maybe maybe I'll just start with a, a couple of questions. So, um, Speaker Ridley, thanks so much for being here this afternoon. Um, you know, I do just want to expand on some of your comments. It did, does seem like there's a great opportunity um, for the Edmonton Heritage Council to support some of the work ahead and um, just wanting to confirm that you see, see good alignment for that and maybe a way to that your organization can help enhance what again is maybe a bit more narrow in scope from a city side but could still be uh, you know uh, uh, part of that broader conversation I guess. I think these things sit together um, so that there isn't uh, really a you like tangible or built and intangible or mm. um, di different approach. So, um, you know, I, I think the balance in this is um, important. Um, and as the Heritage Council, we've done the work we've done, but um, would really see this as integrated work. Great. And therefore this, this report really uh, brings that um, fully, more fully into play. Excellent, really appreciate that. Uh, maybe to, um, Speaker Antonia, you know, really, really appreciate the passion of the, the community and, and your deep and commitment your deep to, commitment the, to the, the, the... Oh, sorry, I'll just need you to stay muted. Stay muted. There's a funny There's feedback. A funny feedback. <laughs> Thanks. Um, you know, really, really appreciate the, the commitment to conservation. You know, I think, I think we've had this conversation before, and, you know, my understanding is that, uh, you know, a historic area doesn't preclude buildings from being demolished. Um, there are, there's a historic area in Westmount, for example, and, and buildings are, are demolished as part of that. Uh, the only zoning tool that I believe we have that prevents the demolition of buildings is the designation of, of homes. So just trying to understand again, sort of the, just wanting to ensure that we have a shared understanding about what, what the heritage area zoning can and can't accomplish. Thank you. Um, yeah, one of the things that it would accomplish, absolutely, we've talked to people, uh, what it would accomplish is a recognition of the heritage area. And then that will, uh, there will be a huge flow through of people. People are waiting to designate their homes. They need a sign of support from the city. So the designation will flow from, from having, a his, uh, having the area, a, a historic area. So, so that please, will happen. Please. Plus, at the same time, there are three uh, city-owned historic properties that uh, the city has. So we're hoping that the city will designate those properties. They actually told the people that they purchased from that they would look after the historic designation. So I hope that will happen as well. Um, so you're right, but... The, if, if you were to read through the the heritage zoning, there are a lot of things. It doesn't ensure that home stays, but it, in, it ensures that there's some contextual development, that the, the uh, historic home, I'm looking right across the street, a clinker brick home, won't have a massive... Um, interference on that homes you know the, the shadow the all of the the um, brick basement and so on so there'll be some preservation for that so there'll be some contextual development thank you that's sorry. what happens if you don't mind sorry, me if you don't mind me then. Me then. <laughs> thank you so so again i i guess in the absence of the city undertaking this work. I just want to ensure that the community understands that that designation is still a, a, a very effective, and I would argue more effective route to achieving the outcomes that, that I hear you expressing on behalf of the community. Uh, no, it, the, the community does not feel designation is, is more effective at all. Can uh, if that, understand, why? understand why? Uh, because a, a designation of one home with no contextual uh, awareness of the rest of the developments around it will just mean that that home becomes the little box. And many of our historic homes are very small. They're not large, like new infill areas or new new areas. There many. It's a misnomer that Glenora homes are huge. They're not. But if um, there's, so a there's a degree, degree, of, degree of agreement along agreement neighbors, along neighbors would you, as, you a as a collective be able to provide, to provide that. that uh, no, that? no, there would be there would be nothing with a historic with a historic designation for area designation. 
designation, then there's contextual development. But um, without it, um, designating a home, you you are, are then uh, probably at a loss for the, your property value and uh, around you are okay, thank you. Okay, know, thank huge, you. huge buildings. Okay, thanks very okay, much. Thanks for very much for adding time. time. And I'll just ask you and to meet again. Sorry. again, sorry. Speaker Antonio, could you, oh, thank you so much. Okay, Councillor Nack, over to you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Thanks everyone for coming and, and sorry uh, and, and to Wendy, I only got your email late last night to call, so my apologies for not getting to call at a time. Uh, I, I figured you probably didn't want to call after 10 o'clock at night. Um, and, and Lynn, thanks for your emails and sorry I didn't finish, I'll, I'll try to reply to your, your reply later. Um, I actually want to ask Mr. Ridley questions because I, I get a chance to chat with folks from Glenor for a bit, but for quite a bit. But Mr. Ridley, I, I guess I want to, you know, I hear I hear your suggestion around, okay, the, this this body of work, this citywide body of work, albeit on a narrow scope, is is a good step forward. I think it's an important step forward. I, I'm actually really, it's a creative way forward, I think. I guess I'm still worried about what happens two areas, I'm, I'm going to pick on Glenora because I happen to represent it as an area that, that what do we do in the meantime and how do we finally get to a point where we're starting to address very specific situations that we see in a, in a handful of communities across the city and I guess I wanted to get your sense on, on how we get there and, and when we can start providing a bit more of that, that certainty and, and, and protection where protection is needed while recognizing not everywhere you can have full protection. I wish I had the answers to that, Councillor. I think, I, I think um, you know, there, for fairness for all communities, um, that there has to be some potential for them to enter into the conversation. Obviously, Gnora has done that in a deep way. Um, I, I, I am sympathetic to the challenge that Glenora has, but I but I also I also look at it and go, yes, designation is a le legitimate way to preserve. And I'm I'm a bit puzzled, although I haven't spoken directly with uh, Ms., uh, with our um, colleagues here today. Um, and I understand some of the issues as to why there hasn't been any designation in the neighborhood. It seems to me, uh, and this is, I guess, right at the heart of your your question, Councillor, which is how do you balance those things? I, I, I think ultimately some of this is also rooted in Alberta's um, needing to be updated historic, historical resources act, which um, certainly prizes uh, private property. Um, and I, though I know the city of Edmonton has done and can do things that, that can help in this, um, you know, I guess our provincial colleagues have, have, have not been overly helpful. Uh, and the legislation in other provinces is more accommodating of this. So, there's my, I'm sorry, my non-answer. No, uh, well, and even that actually is a little more, help, uh, is, is helpful for me, I guess, and, and maybe you don't have to share it right now, but if there's an opportunity at some point to get a bit more information around the differences between the provinces, because if I can further advance in, in a variety of ways, I, I'd love to have a better understanding. So, so maybe something we can connect on uh, separately, and uh, I'll come to Ms. Odinsky right away here. Just the last question for you, Mr. Ridley, is, is um, are there opportunities, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, you know, and I'm going to spend some of the questions of our administration asking to see if we can try to continue to advance some of this work in Glenora to see if there's a way forward on it. Um, but, but are there opportunities through the Heritage Council to work, you know, to come together with some communities where there are a lot of historic resources to talk about different ways we might be able to help advance some of these goals? I, I don't know if that's something you've done in the past. No, uh, we would we would only at this time, um, you know, in this budget year, be able to do that in a limited way. Um, in the last budget cycle, I think there was a, a creative and innovative proposal uh, from administration to, um, with neighborhood renewal, mm -hmm. to also go into communities at that time or work with communities in terms of having those discussions about the values and the the balancing and the challenge that that were there. Um, so we we would have some capacity to do that, but certainly not in that. To, to the extent that um, that proposal sure. suggested. Okay. But it needs to be done, I agree with that. I'll follow up with you on that separately offline. Okay, and, and sorry, uh, Ms. Odinsky, I know you had so, some thoughts. You can take my, my last 45 seconds there. I just wanted to answer your question, Councillor Nack. The, the issue for residents of historic homes in Glenora is that 
that the Lenora heritage character is not only dependent upon the structure, structures located here, but also on the space. And the space is clearly one of the best preserved examples of the Garden City layout in Canada. And those need to go hand in hand. If you allow big uh, structures to come forward on the property and obliterate the ribbon of green that reflects the river valleys, you will obliterate the Garden City streetscape. If there is no guarantee that that will remain, people are not going to designate their homes. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm out of time. I'll tell you all of me. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm not seeing any other questions of our speakers, so thank you again all for coming this afternoon. We'll go next to questions of administration, if colleagues want to sign up. Um, I just had a few very quick ones. The uh, one of the speakers mentioned three city-owned properties in the area. Could you clarify what the, are those private buildings or? I don't have an exact answer. I know that the city has bought at least one property as part of the LRT project that is on the inventory of historic resources, and so that's probably what they're alluding to. Um, yeah, we could we could definitely look to see what the status is and whether there's potential for the city to designate them. Okay, interesting. Well, I mean, I think the other city-owned infrastructure in the area is, of course, the streets and the parks. That, for me, is what lends so much of the the character of the neighborhood. So, wondering, um, recognizing that that it's sort of acknowledged that this is important um, historical character in the public realm, uh, would the city look to preserve that? Like I'm thinking of our, our boulevard tree guidelines, for example, our public, you know, would you anticipate that the character of the, that public infrastructure sort of remaining as is? Yes, yeah, the, the, uh, the, city, the city takes care of its trees pretty, I think, pro proactively or tries its best. Um, yeah, when we look at Glenora, we've, um, we've had some initial conversations with some residents about Alexandra Circle. Alexandra mm -hmm. Circle is just this beautiful, uh, unique in Edmonton example of Garden City design that, uh, you know, that the, the, um, the, the park inside is city owned. And so we've had conversations about whether that could be designated. And that would, mm -hmm. I, think, I think, would just set a, a beautiful example as to the, uh, the, the value that the city places on that green space yeah. that Ms. Odiski was talking about. Yeah, that's a really that's a really interesting point um, because I think if I'm if I understand correctly, a historical designation um, typically applies to to lauded properties, not to sort of the streets and the boulevard trees, for example. Cor yeah, correct. And and uh, in Edmonton, all our designated municipally designated properties are are structures. And so, but we have started working. We're working with the Windsor Park neighborhood on um, uh, the, the the Windsor Park. The park in Windsor Park has been added to the heritage inventory. Oh, interesting. And uh, the Alexander Circle would be another great example where it's you know we under our legislation we can designate more than just a structure. We can des designate a landscape. Okay, really exciting. I mean, I think, and so would that be work that you? would need direction to do, or is that, that would be part of the normal course of the heritage groups? I, I would love direction. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, there, there might be, I, you know, I don't, th there may be different feelings in, in, the, in the neighborhood, but if that's something that, that uh, you want to give us direction on, we'd, we'd love to have that conversation with the residents. Sure, and you know, and happy, happy um, to defer to the, the ward councillor about the, the appropriate way uh, forward on that. I just uh, had some further questions too on just the reserve balances. So I guess I was surprised to see that the current reserve balance is so high. I would have thought that it was fairly sort of in and out each year. And recognizing that it doesn't seem to be the case, I'm just wondering what the impacts are of it getting, you know, not, not to zero, but fairly low in 2026. Uh, recognizing that it is quite high now. Is that just for, I think there have been some fairly unique commercial properties that we've made commitments to. Can you just walk me through? Uh, sure, sure, and, and colleagues from finance can jump in as well, but just to, just to begin, yeah, like for example, there's a significant commitment to Hangar 11 that we haven't, uh, that's, that's been designated, but uh, there have been some, um, some, some delays on that project, and so that's money that hasn't been paid out yet. And, uh, uh, last last fall, council approved the designation of Boardwalk and Revlon, which is a million dollars, and we haven't paid out on that as well. 
there, there just seems to be a, um, the, uh, during the pandemic, less was paid out. And so um, I don't know if we're still riding that bubble, but definitely there are, there are a number of properties where uh, we're still waiting to, to make payouts. Anyone from finance want to add to that? Well, I think, I think that provides me with the clarity that I need. And, and so just really wanting to re, really ensure that I'm understanding that if we were to proceed with option one, um, we, we do sort of regular course of business in terms of smaller properties coming forward for designation that I think the report speaks to us being able to, to keep up with that of accepting new, new ones. The reason that we can do that with four hundred and thirteen thousand dollars versus six point three million is that this is just kind of a bit of an outlier of the next couple of years. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I, I think that's fair. The um, we, we we think that as the report states, we think that with some careful management, we'll be able to continue to accept new applications. The the process of getting a property owner from like an initial conversation to designation is often takes years. Okay. And so we don't want to, uh, we want to give them certainty that, that there'll still be money around when they're ready to actually go ahead with that. And we, we feel like we can, it will, it will pinch us in 2026, but then the, the reserve looks like it will bounce Replenish. back. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that. I'll go next to Councillor Tang. Um, yeah, great. So for example, some of those, um, like money that hasn't been paid out is that like for example is that one of the thirty or so um, what did you call it the um, rehabilitation incentive and maintenance agreements is that exactly yeah yeah so, there's around thirty and some some are small just like two thousand yeah. dollars in some cases up to five million dollars gotcha and so uh, I guess you know if we with the option one then there wouldn't be any impact to the to like all of them. Yeah, so we, we track the, uh, our obligations under those legal agreements. Every quarter we meet with finance to update them. Okay. And these, these are the latest projections showing that to even doing the heritage strategy out of the reserve, we'll still be able to meet those obligations and, and accept new designations as well. Yeah, and, um, and so essentially the, the heritage places strategy would, would be essentially replacing the last one since 2009. Correct, yeah. And do you have a sort of like, this is a strategy for the next 10 years? Uh, well, good question. <laughs> it depends how quickly the world changes. Um, yeah, I mean, the, uh, uh, we, 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 we try to look, with strategy projects, we try to look out as far as we can, 20, 25 years. Um, so I don't know that we'd put a time limit on it, but uh, there's the, the, the world has changed a lot since 2009 and we need to reflect that and, uh, um, and, and hopefully give us mm. good uh, trajectory going forward for at least the next decade or two. Yeah that's, yeah, that's good. I mean, I think about the conversations around heritage even five years ago and until now, it's, it's, it's quite different. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't actually, I thought it was a pretty clear report. I, you know, I certainly can, well, I, I won't speak, but I thought it was a very clear report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Nack? Uh, thanks, Councillor Stevenson. Thank you for the work and, and sort of as mentioned in my introduction on the questions, just want to thank you for the creativity of, of advancing some of the citywide work. I think that's that's really positive. And so I, I don't have much in terms of questions on that other than I, I guess, you know, at this point it's tough to say because the work hasn't started. <laughs> but sort of how do you envision the work and like from, from when you get to the end, what happens after that? Because it's a narrow scope. And I, I'm, I'm leading into the what happens in these specific communities where we have consideration. So how does this work ultimately get us to an area where you start addressing some localized concerns? Yeah, it's, well, it's a good. Well, just it's a good question. Is 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 to what extent do we address localized concerns? Because as yeah. we as we talked about, there's there's uh, you know there's pressing uh, you know climate change and mm -hmm. uh, you know reconciliation issues that are you know sort of transcend neighborhoods. Uh, that we want to address, and and I think the strategy will just help us to find the right balance there between those 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 bigger global issues and and local issues that that uh, such as like we've heard from Glenora, which are which are legitimate. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Nack, this is uh, Shauna Kuiper here. I just also the the neighborhood context will will have to be considered in the larger context of all of the uh, notions of heritage, whether that's building. Um, natural or cultural. And so in terms of the priorities that the strategies lays, lay out, um, like neighborhoods will fall within that. 
within the larger context. So this goes beyond the neighborhoods um, and focuses on the larger notion of heritage across the city. No, I appreciate that. And, and I guess, so the, as I focus on sort of the localized piece and, and obviously Glenora is one of them and that's the one that I'm particularly interested in uh, as, as a council representing that area. You know, there has been a lot of work done to date and I guess my question is, and I don't mean to oversimplify it, but essentially in your mind is, is the work that is done to, bit, to date sort of throw away at this point? Like I, I'm trying to get a sense of do you still see value in some of that work, even if there's some differences? And I know that's been part of the conversation from when it was paused in the first place to saying it needs to better incorporate a variety of elements, but do you still see value in some of that work? And, and let's start there. Sure, yeah. So, so the work included uh, a, a Glenora Heritage Inventory, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that added over 130 properties to the, to the city's inventory. I forget the exact numbers, but there's now, I think, 132 properties in Glenora that are in the inventory, even after having accounted for demolitions. And so that is not throwaway work. That was like great, detailed, historical, archival work. And uh, and now those, like, we know a lot about properties in Glenora. So any time that Glenora, Glenora residents are ready to move to designation, we're set. And so that's that's wonderful work that is uh, going to, I hopefully, stand us in good stead for a long time. The um, no, the zoning work I think is what you're more specifically Correct, asking about, yes, yeah. and and I would say that the world has changed since the project was initiated and then and then paused, um, in that we now have a new zoning bylaw, and so um, uh, you know like that's like um, looking at what that would look like in the future in, in light of the new zoning bylaw and the adoption of district plans. Those those are some good questions. Like we. Uh, as part of this heritage strategy, as, as Ms. Kuiper was talking about, is we, we have taken a neighborhood by neighborhood approach. Um, and now like there's some, there's some um, you know, uh, and Mr. Ridley talked about them, diversity and inclusion and truth mm -hmm. and reconciliation and climate change. We've got we've to see, we've got to factor those in and, uh, and see how, uh, what we can leverage with the resources we have. Yeah, and, and, and I'll come to the resources piece probably in my second round, I guess, I guess the, the only other question I have on, on this side and the planning piece is that appreciate the overall picture that I think and, and that the next body of work is meant to help provide a, a more clear picture about what that broader piece works right around yes. climate, around the, what the modern heritage considerations. Um, but as, as we've heard, and, and it is something that we talk about quite a bit in the city plan uh, around the preservation of heritage, what I I'm still feel like I'm missing a bit in, in, in I'm just trying to get a sense of, we talk about preserving heritage and then I don't necessarily, besides the grant, I don't know how we help further that conversation right, right now. I'm not seeing where, where that conversation continues, whether it's locally in one community or broadly across the city. Yeah, well, we're, we're trying to be creative. We established a, a, Her a heritage endowment fund with the Edmonton Community Foundation and the EHC. Um, uh, there are, um, uh, we're working with IAS to, to build heritage into neighborhood renewal, and that's something that won't take additional grant money, but just re, like reuse that that uh, infrastructure money better. Those are some examples. Okay. Do you have more questions? I do. I have I have more questions. Yeah, happy for you to start another round. I'll it's, click on it's all you. Question. Thank you. Um, so I want to just ask about you know the budget piece, and so. The work had been that had been done to date is you know half a million dollars, approximately a hundred thousand dollars was supposed to be remaining to finish this work. What would be your understanding if you were going to finish that type of work right now? What would that look like? And and what's the best way? You know, and I appreciate I'm not on this committee, so I'm trying to get a sense of if there was ever going to be consideration, what would that look like today if we were trying to do that? Yeah, as we, as we said in the report, uh, to, to do the, uh, like to, if, if we were to restart the work in Glenora, we, we've scoped it at around $200,000 just because the, 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 the policy and the regulatory environment is, is different than, um, than it was in the past. And so with that 200000 and and I, I know today the, the challenges I get that we don't have money really in our operating budget, so we are looking for creative solutions to, to advance this work. You found one specifically for the heritage strategy. Um, like, I don't want to lose it, so I'm trying to, I, I appreciate that it might be hard to 
ask to get this approved right now on March 19th. But if we approve the heritage strategy work and begin some work this year, if this came back at fall, and I think Ms. Odinsky even referenced that about if something came back in the fall, we would A, have a better sense of what's our heritage um, fund, reserve fund like. Maybe there weren't a lot of extra and maybe there's some additional funding that could be there or council could through some additional prioritization exercise have a conversation about some localized work. Like, I want to keep, I, I don't want to lose this work and so I'm just wondering if there's a way to at least, at least keep it alive, <laughs> even if you're not working on anything. You can come back in the fall, you might have a better sense of the citywide work around what that might look like and how you might address localized issues. Is that a reasonable ask? I'm just trying to, without yeah. losing all of this work? Sure, yeah, I don't, I don't think we'll have a, an answer on that that localized versus global issue thing by the fall, but yeah, um, yeah I mean, there's, there's probably ways to keep alive. Was someone else gonna comment? Yeah, yeah I would just add to that, Eric, thank you, that um, the. Our best recommendation is to hold off on Glenora until the strategy is done so we have an understanding of where that local um, heritage character falls within our larger priorities. And if we were to advance uh, the work at this time, we would, be need to, we would need to take resources away from our heritage program. And we would have to um, really look at whether or not we can honor our agreements that we have in place. So our advice um, and our strong advice is to proceed with the strategy. Um, let us see where uh, local uh, buildings fall within our larger priorities in terms of equity and as well as our, sorry, nature and culture um, priorities uh, for heritage. Um, yeah, so that's our, that's our recommendation. I appreciate that. And uh, the, I'll, I'll ask this, which is that, you know, and I know we don't think about this when we have land use hearings regarding the, the caveat, but I, I wanna bring this into the equation in part of why I keep pushing on this, which is that for, ha for a large chunk of this community, pretty much everything on the other side, on uh, south of Stony Plain Road, we have a caveat that, that really does prevent any change. And from what I understand, the caveat has continued to be upheld in court, including with one that got uh, upheld, I think, in July. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I, I worry that, you know, we, while we're trying to modernize heritage, and we should do that, and I, and I, I don't at all want to take away from that, we're, we've got a community that is going to continue to use that tool to, to prevent change from occurring until they feel that there is likely a, some type of, of different path forward. And I can't, I can't blame them. If they're trying to preserve, they're going to use the available legal mechanisms. That's, that's their right. Um, so I guess what, what role does that play in this conversation, which is that we, we can say we want a different situation, we can say we want different changes, incorporating new world, but, but they've also got a tool right now that is, it is stopping anything from the city plan advancing in, in a large portion of that community. That's, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the Carruthers KV is, is a reality um, and uh, our, our best tool is, um, and the best tool available for residents and landowners in Glenora is uh, designation. Um, we're not a party to the caveat, and so we can't uh, really comment on that. Yeah, I hear you. Um, maybe one, a couple more questions. Sure, please, yeah. please carry on. Sorry, I know you got a no, lot on your agenda, right. but I want to exhaust this we one made here. Room. Yep. So I, I know I know we try not to get involved, I, I, and and I'm not asking for us to get involved. But what I guess I'm I'm sort of reflecting on is that this does prevent much from happening in the neighborhood, uh, including an advancement of our city plan goals. And, and being that heritage designation uh, has not been seen as the perfect tool, I, I'm trying to figure out what's that, what's that better way forward that isn't the caveat and that isn't the zoning piece, which I understand Min has some hesitation on. What, what's the new What's the new one in the middle? And, and, and how do we get there? What, what's the path forward to that, that, new, that new promised land of heritage yeah. preservation? That's, that's a great question. I don't know that there is um, like a mythical answer to that one. Um, we, um, we definitely, if we proceed with the heritage strategy, um, like we, we're not gonna be able to do citywide engagement, but we, we're happy to, to have conversations with 
uh, with with parties that we're able to, you know, that we, we, we have resources to talk to, and that can include Glenora. So that was going to be my question. If you're starting some of the strategy work, a group like the Conservation Association might be part of the work you're doing. I recognize yes. you can't go into every single yep. community, nor... I mean, again, most of the word I represent, it probably wouldn't make sense, but you've got a body here that has done a lot of work, and, and I, I could see value in making sure that the work they're doing is is being discussed as part of your broader strategy. So you would see that as a... We, we can definitely do that. Yeah, we've been talking to the Glenora, old, old, old Glenora Conservation Association and the Community League for the last several years, so okay. we can continue to do that. Okay, so I guess then the the only other thing I'm trying to figure out is again how do how do I make sure we don't lose it? I, I I'm I'm hearing you and I'm you know I I'm not sure there's going to necessarily be a motion from committee to to advance the remainder of the work today and I I mean as much as I would like that so but I do you do you need direction to at least keep that on the books or can I I'm trying to figure out the next time I can bring this up because I'm not a member of this committee and I don't want to lose it. Is it, is it at fall when we're having the, the supplementary up operating budget adjustment as a way to bring it forward? You might not have answers from the strategy completed yet, but there might be some guidance to, to shape what a, a different path forward could look like. Um, yeah, like I, I just know if we get going on the strategy, we, it, like there's, a, there's an onus on us to respond to this question because it's yeah. one that's been raised um, by, by members of this committee and council and, and, the, and the public, and so we'll need to respond to that. And so like I think uh, Ms. Kuiper was talking about, the best time is probably once we've got the strategy done, and then we can say, and this is, this is the implication for neighborhoods like Glenora and others that are concerned about their localized heritage issues. There'd be nothing. Oh, sorry, Mr. Schneider. As well, Kent Snyder here. Um, probably this this budget this year in the fall would be a bit early, but we can make a commitment that as if the strategy work does um, go forward, that we monitor and assess. And if there are certain uh, more local tools or opportunities that seem to be coalescing and before the strategy is approved, um, we can bring that forward as updates to say, hey, we think we may have something here that could be applicable. Uh, in a particular area ahead of strategy being finished. And that would then um, allow council the opportunity to look at potential um, direction and resource needs uh, based on that. And that's something I can also, if you're going to engage with the Conservation Association, I can hopefully stay connected with and, and try to bring, if, if we feel like there's some progress, maybe an opportunity to bring it forward separately. So. Okay, um, I think that's it other than I just wanted to go back to Councillor Stevenson's piece around uh, Alexander Circle and so you said you might want direction just to, to do that. So just like I, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't do that. Um, at least that's <laughs> one, one thing we should be working on is uh, do you have, I have not written a motion because I've been asking questions for three rounds, but any guidance on what you would need for that? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, if, if there was an interest, uh, um, it could be a motion just uh, directing us to, to talk to uh, residents and groups in the, in the neighborhood about that designation. Okay. Yeah, I think we should, I, I would hope at a minimum I'd ask committee for that, if, if not anything else, to, to do some work somewhere. So, okay, I think those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Knack, for that. So, I, I'm not seeing any other questions on the board. So I'm happy to move uh, the recommendation of the report and then could take my hand at, at a part two of that motion. So I'll move that option one to advance the heritage places strategy with a narrow scope as outlined in the March 19th, 2024 Open Planning Economy Report UPE 02240 be approved. And would you recommend that other piece to be a subsequent motion? The clerk or just a part two of this? Let's make it a subsequent. I was thinking subsequent because it is separate. Today. Very separate. Okay, sounds good. Um, any questions, comments, or speaking to the motion? Councillor Knack? Yeah, thank you for the chance to speak. Um, so again, first, a, a huge thanks to administration. I, I, I think this is actually a really positive piece, particularly around the Heritage Place's strategy. I think that's a great way forward to do something um, using a, a funding resource that doesn't involve going back to the tax levy at a time where we really can't <laughs> go back. Um, so, so appreciate everyone's openness who worked on the report, who came up with that idea and, and brought it forward. I thought that that was a, a wonderful path. Um, 
and, and is truly needed because I, I do feel like there is still a gap right now, um, both citywide and I'll come to the local consideration right away because I think citywide, you know, we have a very generous grant that we have. Um, and you've heard us talk about this before. It's like one of the, if not the most generous in the country. And yet we still have challenges in preserving uh, in, in certain areas. Um, and and I also appreciate through the questions that we've heard in the presentation that, that the way we look at heritage needs to be broadened a bit in certain ways. And, and so it shouldn't be exclusive to one specific thing. But we also needed to actually do some work on that and figure out how we're going to to uh, start doing some uh, citywide work. So I think this is this is great because we've been talking about it and talking about it, but we just actually haven't done anything about it for years. And this is the first chance to actually start doing something about it for years. Uh, and I'm saying council hasn't done anything about it, not administration. They've been working really hard to try to do work within what they, they can and can't do, but um, we hadn't given any um, direction for the last couple of terms on this. Um, so this is a, a big step forward and a big positive. Just focusing on the localized piece, and and uh, I, I appreciate that you know this motion doesn't include anything uh, for Glenora, and and you know I there's a lot of conversation about community specific piece, but I do think we we still have a lot of work to do there, um, you know, and yes, we need to modernize and incorporate some of the new. Uh, components that we're going to be working on with with some local issues, but I my my big concern is I still don't know how we're ultimately going to deal with a community specific or even an area specific plan um, for heritage preservation. And hopefully, this place the heritage places strategy gets us there. Um, but I feel like between now and then, there's still a lot of uncertainty, and, and it's not just Glenora. Obviously, it's the area that I represent, but I know there are communities across the city that have been talking about this, thinking about this, and trying to figure out how, how we get to a different place than we are right now, which, which appears to be focused more on, uh, you know, we, we, we talk about heritage in the city plan, but I think it, it is more focused on the, the development goals of the city plan, and, and I'm still not sure we have a a clear path on how we deal with the heritage elements of the city plan. So uh, I would like to see this work finished in Glenora, um, even uh, incorporating sort of the modern context on it. Um, if it's not gonna be in the motion, my commitment will be that I'll continue to, to raise this um, uh, and I'll bring it forward in the fall, noting that I've heard today that our city staff as part of the place's strategy work are going to engage folks like the Old Glenora Conservation Association on what that new strategy looks like. And then through that work over the coming six, seven, eight, nine months, uh, an opportunity to revisit that when it comes forward, when we have our, our fall supplemental budget adjustment, because I think it was Ms. Odinsky that said, you know, in the end, yes, we're tight on funds in a lot of areas, but if we, if we do want to, um, address some priorities, and I think heritage preservation is, a, is an important priority. Um, we also might want to just look at for some other ways to, to um, creatively fund that work, whether it's through the reserve, if it turns out we don't have as many applications, or whether it's through um, a tax levy conversation. So I'll, I'll continue to make that commitment to bring it up as we go forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Not seeing anyone else, I will close. Just briefly to say, you know, a huge thank you to administration for coming forward with this option. Um, you know, it's it's it has its trade-offs, absolutely, and and there's part of me that worries about um, you know emergent uh, designation opportunities that maybe we may be more constrained to address. But when I look at the overall cost of option one um, and the portion that that is of our annual reserve contribution and knowing that that reserve contribution is ongoing and, and will replenish, uh, you know, I feel feel more confidence in, in moving forward with this approach. I think it's a great way to elevate the, the discussion of the importance of heritage places in Edmonton and to engage more Edmontonians in that discussion. Um, I think that will contribute to the preservation of both the built heritage and our, our cultural histories and stories as well. So very, very excited for that. 
I also appreciated it in the conversation sort of hearing how some of the work that's happened in the past can be carried forward. So it's encouraging to know that a lot of the, the research that has already been conducted in Glenora is there and available to support designation applications. Again, for me, this is the most powerful tool um, and truly the only way to, to avoid demolition of, of these buildings, which I hear are, are so valued by community members. Um, and even recognizing that uh, buildings alone uh, don't make the full character of the neighborhood. I think that's a really important consideration and, and something that I think is very true. Um, I think that what previous work has shown is that there's huge architectural variety within, within the Glenora neighborhood um, and that the character really emerges through other elements of the community, most specifically in the public realm. So I, I do plan to make a subsequent motion that would direct city staff to look at some of the city city owned assets um, in the neighborhood that contribute to that character and look for what uh, uh, conservation and preservation measures can be taken. Um, I truly think that that's, that's where, you know, so much of the, the character comes from um, and can be, be preserved moving forward. So I will close there and ask my committee colleagues to vote. We have all the votes. Thank you, please display the vote. And that's carried. And I will move a subsequent motion that administration connect with Glenora residents to explore advancing a municipal heritage designation of Alexander Circle and other city owned historic assets in the Glenora neighborhood and uh, provide a memo to council on this work. Uh, I, I think I've already spoken to this, but happy to take any questions if anyone had questions. Not seeing any, anyone to speak. Okay, I think we're ready to vote then. Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. Thank you very much. That completes our item 7.3. We'll be going next to item 7.5, transit priority measures implementation update. We'll just give a moment for our delegation to get set up. Uh, we'll hear their presentation and then we will hear from our very patient speaker on that item. Over to you when you're ready. Thank you. I'm here today with Kerry Hot, McDonald Branch Manager of ETS, and Natalie, Natalie Lazurko, Branch Manager of Infrastructure Planning and Design. We have others online to help us answer questions as well. This report provides an interim update uh, to you about the approach for transit priority measures to improve the transit network. Uh, this follows an approval of funding during the 2023-26 budget process for planning and design and implementation. I'll turn it over to Carrie and Natalie for a short presentation. Thanks, Eddie. So Edmonton City Plan outlines the role that transit plays in a growing city to 2 million people. We have an ambitious target of 50% mode share for public transit as well as active transportation to help lower our greenhouse gas emissions and help people move efficiently across the city. Edmontonians have regularly shared with us that fast, reliable transit is a critical lever for using transit. It helps people to depend on the service and incorporate it into their daily routines. Transit priority measures play a role in creating that experience. We currently have them at a number of locations across the city. So it includes things like traffic signal measures, including bus detection, transit specific traffic lights and queue jumps. We also have some transit lanes on several corridors. Any efficiencies that we can find in our service hours uh, that are gained by adding more transit priority measures could then be reinvested into the network to address any service gaps that we have. 
Next slide. So as outlined in the report, there's three main types of transit priority measures that we wanted to highlight. The first is regulatory measures. So they can be implemented through existing or new laws and regulations. They're often uh, relying on a combination of signs and pavement markings as examples to indicate priority for transit vehicles. The second type, traffic signal measures. They involve modifying the timing or sequence of traffic lights as an example, again, to give preference to the transit vehicles. And the last are physical measures, so changes made to the physical infrastructure to create dedicated spaces for transit vehicles. For example, dedicated bus lanes that we all get excited about. This reduces their interaction with other traffic, aiming to improve travel times and reliability uh, for public transit. I'm now gonna turn it over to Natalie for the remainder of the presentation. Thanks, Carrie. A study was completed in 2019 reviewing potential locations for transit priority measures across the city and it examined potential measures. The findings of this study were reviewed in the context of the Mass Transit Planning for 1.25 Million Population Report related to Mass Transit Routes B1 and B2, which had been funded for planning uh, in this budget cycle. Um, they were reviewed as well in alignment with the city plan. Based on this review, the locations shown on this slide have been identified as the first phase of locations that will benefit from transit priority measures. Next slide, please. We're currently, currently in the planning phase. Once that phase is complete, we'll be moving into design. The project includes further evaluation of transit operational issues on the seven corridors that were identified on the previous slide, identification of appropriate transit priority measures, evaluation of the high level benefits of these measures, estimation of costs at a concept level, and prioritization of the locations for implementation. The delivery of transit priority measures will be staged. Each location that warrants improvements such as signal retiming or upgrade, upgrades will be sequenced earlier than more complex improvements such as bus right turn lanes, lane modifications or other similar measures. If further information is desired as this work advances, we can bring forward another update to committee or via memo in Q1 of 2025. Next slide, please. So that brings us to the end of our short presentation. We're happy to answer any questions that you might have after the speaker. Thank you very much. And um, speaker rates, we will fit you in before our break. Um, so over to you. Oh, well, are there gonna be questions? Are committee members able to stay? Okay. Uh, so over to you, uh, speaker rates. I think you know the drill. Yes, uh, good afternoon uh, committee and council and administration and everyone else who is here today. Uh, my name is Stephen Rates. I wear a couple of different hats, but today I'm here on behalf of my position as the University of Alberta Board of Governors student representative. So just to clarify, I sit on the Board of Governors at the University of Alberta as well as the Students' Union Council, and I'm not here affiliated with either of those places today. I just speak on behalf of the uh, thousands of undergraduate students on the University of Alberta campus. Uh, that's where I'm speaking on behalf of today, but not the formal bodies like the university or the students union. And so just to move past that into some of the key messages that I want to stress today. Uh, I first want to really emphasize the importance of this work to students, the community, and to our city's broader goals of becoming a more sustainable and resilient community. And then I also just want to highlight some concerns around contingencies along key corridors. Um, and so, you know, I'm here on behalf of today representing a student perspective, and I think we can all agree that students rely on transit, the sky is blue, this is not information, I have some stats, but we don't need to go there because I think we understand that transit is really important to students. What I would like to emphasize here is that post-secondary institutions all across Edmonton are going to be experiencing a demographic bulge, uh, incredible expansion over the coming years, and so this work really needs to be a priority because of that. Uh, for instance, the University of Alberta's strategic plan is setting out a growth, uh, a a path to grow to 60,000 students by 2030. And that's from our current student population of just above 40,000 students. So growth by 40% over the next year, that's envisioned um, over the next six years, pardon me. Um, and so other factors that, you know, all post-secondaries are growing, we should also consider that more post-secondary students uh, experiences are being oriented towards providing work experience or cooperative work education. 
students don't need to just get to campus nowadays. They need to get to campus and then get to work or to a community involvement and then back to campus and then back home. So the transit service that we need to be providing for students needs to become that much more cohesive because students aren't just going in a singular direction anymore. It's uh, much more multipolar. Um, and additionally, we want to be making these kind of investments because it's great that students currently ride transit, but we want to convert students who ride transit and keep them on as they become professionals within the community and become regular users of transit going forward. So we want to provide a um, strong, under, uh, strong service that keeps them on board. And so just to briefly outline, uh, you know, the city plan is envisioning within that first phase of uh, 1.25 million that uh, White Avenue is a primary corridor and that there is some investment uh, expected there and the University of Alberta major node. Um, and so it's just so important that mass trans these mass transit investments are being made because it rolls out a system that improves transit service in a comparatively quick manner that supports growing ridership, reducing congestion, and improving the overall transportation corridor or system, pardon me. And so to bring it to some of the specific concerns, I would acknowledge that to students, especially at the University of Alberta, they come from all across Edmonton. And so all these corridors are really important and I would only encourage more work to be done, but I'll just flag some specific concerns around White Avenue that I just want to stress in my last little bit of time. Uh, you know, the old Strathcona public realm plan is identified as a contingency and I, I've been involved with some of this work with, the, with Paths for People. And so I laud the efforts that are being made there. But I'm just concerned with, um, and this might be able to be explained by administration too, but some of the timelines within the public realm strategy make me concerned that we're not actually going to see improvements over the next uh, six years when we're supposed to be growing by 40% at the University of Alberta specifically. Uh, the public realm plan, which I acknowledge is draft right now, identifies reconstruction of White Avenue occurring in 10 years. And I understand that there might be able to be some shorter term fixes. And so I'm just really here to encourage that work maybe prior to some of that wholesale reconstruction of White Avenue that sees mass transit improvements uh, incurring at an even accelerated pace within the next six years as the University of Alberta really swells in size alongside all the other institutions, post-secondary institutions uh, across Edmonton. And so I'll just briefly conclude here and thank uh, committee and council and administration for time to present these views and just really re-emphasize the importance of this work and especially the importance of prioritizing measures along White Avenue where we'll see considerable growth over the next six years. Um, thank you so much again. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions for our speaker? Not seeing any, I think that speaks to the clarity of her presentation. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us all day and uh, your comments are really appreciated and I'm sure we'll, we'll pick up um, those threads when we, when we turn to administration, when we come back from the break. So thank you so much again, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Uh, I mean, you're welcome to stay for the conversation, of course. Uh, we will now be on recess until 3.50. Thank you.
it's online. That's good. Thank you. Welcome back uh, to the Urban Planning Committee meeting. I'll just do a quick roll call of committee members. Uh, Councillor Tang. Hello. We are delighted to welcome Councillor Salvador to the Urban Planning Committee meeting. Oh, and there's, nope, you're off again. Uh, no, it's all right. Councillor Carmel. Sounds good. Um, we're also joined online by Councillors Rice, Wright, Principe, and Paquette. And with that, we will go to administration for a presentation. Oh, no, sorry, for questions. Uh, colleagues, if you'd like to click in. Councillor Tang. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the, the report and presentation. And um, I was pleased to see the list of um, priority locations. And can you just highlight how those some locations for the 2024 was determined? And, and are they in that order of priority, would you say? So the locations listed aren't in any priority order. They are our top priority locations for the funding that was approved as part of the 23 to 26 um, budget, budget cycle, yep. uh, but not in any particular order. They were identified um, using a, a few different pieces of criteria. One of them, as I mentioned in the presentation, was uh, starting with a study that was completed in 2019. Um, and then they were built upon and, um, and refined based on uh, conversations with ETS, some of the higher delay locations and so on. That's, that's great, thank you. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I think a lot of them were quite central. I was pleased to see the one uh, you know, near the end, the end of the line for the Valley Line, so that's great. Um, for the service hour efficiencies to be achieved, um, how many are we, do we anticipate and redirecting for 2027? So we don't have a sense of that yet. So once they get through the detailed planning and actually have a more concrete outline for each location, and then they're implemented, we're gonna monitor really closely and then we'll follow up with council through the annual uh, service planning cycles to identify if we have any efficiencies that we can reinvest. And so what do you think is the is that checkpoint? When do you think is the next, that checkpoint you're talking about then? Yeah, we were talking as a team, we think it'll be sometime around 2027. Um, it's contingent really on the work of Natalie's uh, area okay. and getting them implemented and um, sequenced. Okay, great. Um, and then you reference the, the, the non-writer survey and kind of top of the top two and th the second and third reason and part of the improvement, you know, part of the improvements here will help with that. What was the number one? I don't know if we have that in front of us. Okay, that's We'll okay. find out for you. <laughs> um, I believe it's changing needs actually. I believe in uh, the list, because okay. I read it recently and I'm pretty sure it's that I no longer have the need, i.e. I I'm, you know, let's say I found a different job or something uh, okay. has changed my circumstances. Cool. That's, that, that, that's also good to know. Um, and, um, and then when, so you're gonna do the planning and then you're gonna implement it and put it in place. Um, I guess, how, can you talk a little bit about the communication about some of those changes? So we're still a little bit early at this point in okay. time. Um, the, the planning is still, um, we're in the midst of planning and looking at the end of Q2 for having that planning done. As part of the, the planning, we're also looking at how, like what type of measures and when they would be implemented. And so that'll inform the communications planning moving forward. Okay, no, that sounds, that sounds good. Yeah, I think this is uh, quite needed. I guess, uh, can you speak to a little bit about the point around um, that the speaker brought up around the, you know, the Old Strathcona Public Realm strategies uh, right now is a contingency for some of this work, but you know, and his caution against that. Just wonder if you can speak to that a bit. 
Happy to speak to that. Um, I want to just reiterate that it isn't either or in this case. This is uh, the work that we're doing now in terms of the transit priority measures, planning, design, and implementation is for the here and now. The work related to the old Strathcona public realm um, and the, the mass transit planning that's underway um, as well will we'll inform the future. So we're looking to improve things now with the transit priority measures and, and things will continue to evolve as funding comes in place for those other those other um, strategies that are in development at the moment. And so there may be changes uh, to what we implement in the future, but this uh, the timelines are, are quite different at this point in that the mass transit study that's, that's starting up is just funded for planning and the old Strathcona uh, public realm is is tied to our uh, future renewal of, of White Avenue. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Those are all my questions. Thank you very much. I have a few that, that tie in to that. So um, again, really great work. Exciting to see this move forward. Just wanted to confirm, uh, yeah, how these uh, priority measures, particularly along Jasper Avenue, are going to align with um, sort of the Imagine Jasper vision. I think this is the next unfunded segment but you know the next uh, desperately needed um, upgrades um, how that's all being balanced I'm just gonna call on Matthew Ivany who's online to see if he can speak to that yeah sure thank you councillor and Natalie um, so yeah I know what you're saying uh, 95th and 97th Street we just renewed up to 96th Street on Jasper Ave uh, through the new vision and and that was just streetscaped and then we're starting to do the preliminary uh, and concept validation for Jasper from 109 to 102. Uh, definitely on 105, uh, 106 Street, we have a good opportunity to plan for the longer term uh, transit improvements in that area. Um, and but we'll still, as there's no timeline for construction um, and based on the CRL funding, we're not sure when we're gonna build that section permanently, but we'll still look at interim transit uh, priority measures. So either Q jumps or something like that. So we're still gonna look at it, but we might not build the ultimate right away, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm thinking, um, you know, I think a lot of the intent of what's been happening on Jasper Avenue is creating more of that, you know, walkable public realm, um, just making sure that we're not sort of exchanging, you know, car speedways to bus speedways, if that makes sense. Yeah, 100%. Um, we'd be looking at even like rationalizing parking along there, not widening. And mm -hmm. definitely we'll look at the number of lanes. I think it's still going to be two, but we'll may do queue jumps or like permanent queue jumps or other transit measures as part of the concept or the prelim update as well but right. yeah we don't want to make it an expressway it'll be 40k and uh, still and we want to make sure it's good for transit too right and and people yeah and people yeah and, and you know i think the other element there too is we we've been seeing more of the um uh, patio programs sort of taking up the parking lanes which you know again i would be really reticent to to lose so is the intent to continue to allow that alternative use of the the curbside I can't speak to the interim. I don't know if Shweekar is on the line. She might be able to speak to the interim situation where they can use the parking, but long-term either like that space could even be permanent. You know what I mean? A wider sidewalk with no parking and they wouldn't need to do the temporary measures. Um, but in term, I think uh, Shweekar could probably speak to that better. Sure, thank you. <laughs> yes, hi, Councillor. Um, I apologize, are you, sorry, can you repeat the question for me? <laughs> no, no trouble at all. Thanks for popping in again. Um, just wanting to ensure that the temporary measures wouldn't come into conflict with the patio programs that allow restaurants to, to use some of the, or to shift the sidewalk into the parking space to enable. Yeah, no, absolutely. That would be something that we would take a look at. I think right now it's a little bit tough until we know exactly what are the measures that are planned in the spot, but that would be something that we would um, take away and see how it would um interact I guess with the patios or if there's an alternative type of measure that would be considered that wouldn't interfere with the patio space that's available on the curbside so but the short answer is yes like we would have to take it at, um, like sort of a case-by-case -case basis okay great and, oh just sorry just to, to jump in for for one final thought on that so I, I just want to reiterate we are just at the planning stage so that's one of the things that we'll take back mm. as, a, as a piece of feedback to inform the planning 
um, and we'll make sure that that's being protected for um, as part of the work that we're doing. So again, um, I know that this is pretty high level at this stage, but um, as we're just working through the planning, all of those kinks will, will be worked through over the next little bit here. And um, we'll, we'll bring back an update if, if needed on that item. Perfect, I really appreciate that. And, and I, I'm hearing that there is this tension between sort of current state, future state, because um, the, the next question I had was just around how much change we anticipate on bus routing on Jasper Ave once the Valley Line West is, is operational? And are we taking that into consideration in terms of how we've prioritized the, the areas? Yes, thank you, Councillor. We're still working through what the ultimate routing will be once Valley Line West opens, but we expect we would still need Jasper Avenue because we do still provide uh, the Route 7, for example, that mm. goes from downtown to West Edmonton Mall would still be in place. We'll still have at least one frequent bus route and some express routes that go to different destinations, um, not directly serving, not paralleling the Valley Line West, but doing other Perfect. destinations. Okay, I'll, I'll maybe just come back for one one further thought on that, but I'll go next to Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you, um, and thanks so much for the report. Uh, I was just curious, the so the seven corridors um, for the first phase, I uh, appreciate they were listed on the slide. Do we have a map version of that as well, or is that maybe something that could be uh, included in, in a future update? We, we do have a, a map of, of the locations, and yes, we can provide that. Okay, that would be super helpful. Um, yeah, because one of, one of my primary questions, I, of course, see the priority measures, um, and then trying to sort of overlay that onto the mass transit strategy and think about, uh, I mean, my interest is BRT in particular, and um, how we might be able to, um, yeah, use the transit priority measures as a means to uh, get to some version of BRT a little bit faster. I know we're advancing the design work on B1 and B2, but can you just walk me through how those two intertwine? So the, the two are meant to complement one another. Uh, the locations um, have been have been vetted in terms of the, the mass transit work that's underway. Um, as the planning hasn't gotten too, too far for the mass, uh, mass transit work just yet, it's hard to, to really um, un unpack that in a lot of detail, um, but more will come as we as we get into the planning study for the the mass transit B one and B two. Um, these oh, it looks like Carrie okay. also has something to add. <laughs> sure. So I was just going to say it's the exact same group of people that are collaborating for both. So there is intention, and I think the objective of. Are there quick wins we can achieve? And when we talk about implementing these, I don't want people to think that they can never ever change and evolve. We have needs now that are long overdue. And that's what Natalie's prioritizing is how can we help, but at the same time consider that mass transit plan and if there are like um, opportunities that we can find that check both boxes, obviously we're gonna do that and whatever we put in place as mass transit evolves, we can always adjust. Um, so they are talking to one another and it's the same group of people working on both. Okay, that's, that's super helpful to hear. And um, I guess as things get, get a little bit more refined, um, like do you think there's, how should I ask this? When I think about BRT, when I think about B1 and B2, um, to get there in, a really fulsome way, I see that as a much longer longer term conversation that will require um, potentially a fair amount of investment. Like, is the work we're doing through the transit priority measures kind of like um, almost a precursor or could it be viewed as a precursor to some of that work? Like, is the intention to end up with sort of a north, south, east, west um, corridor as we see with B1 and B2? I think it's probably difficult to answer at this stage of sure. the planning. I think, I think if I follow what you're saying, yes, in the sense that these elements, as they're implemented, there are things that we gain from that. And if the locations, once they're doing that detailed planning, again, if they can complement one another, I mm -hmm. think that's something Natalie and team would pursue. Jump. I would I just also add, I think from a rider perspective, it helps to start to build that expectation that along right. these corridors, that there's some level of transit priority. Yeah. These might be the, the first measures, and then the long term, as the B1 and B2 come in, there's already that expectation that these are important corridors that should have priority for transit. 
totally. Okay. And just to, to add to that as well as the, the mass transit planning for B1 and B2 is really early. Mm -hmm. um, we do expect, as you had mentioned, that it could be a significant investment to implement and perhaps there may be options within, within that, uh, that planning for um, staged implementation or perhaps something similar to the active transportation uh, work that's underway in terms of rapid or adaptable measures. So we'll see as that planning evolves, there may be options to get there faster, just in a slightly different fashion. Okay, fantastic. Um, with 40 seconds left, um, one of the things that our speaker brought up uh, just around the steady growth that U of A is experiencing and student population uh, honestly got me thinking about um, the mass transit plan targeted out to 1.25 million and how fast we're approaching 1.25 million. I know we're having that conversation in parallel when it comes to district planning. Is that a consideration, just how fast we are going to get there? Um, I know that opens up a whole bunch of things and I can come back for a second round, but maybe I'll, I'll give you time to ponder. That sounds great, <laughs> a good uh, foreshadowing of the conversation to come. Thanks, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Wright? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, looking forward to, to these measures being put in place. Um, and I, I can't believe I'm saying this because I always appreciate the attention that's given to the Southeast, but I'm just wondering about um, the Hughes Way. Uh, it, if some of the information that was, was gathered from the 2019 transit priorities before the, the Valley um, LRT line came on, are, is it still applicable? Like, like, are we updating what our needs are in that area? I'll, I'll thought, try this and see if Ms. Um, as Natalie wants to add. As she mentioned, that there was a 2019 study, but the most recent prioritization has taken into consideration our current delay information. So the information we have now about how our buses are performing, where they're late, where they could be use some more investment for reliability. So we've updated the priorities from that study to reflect current state. Okay, because I had also heard Carrie say something about some, the highest response or something was about no longer needed. So I was just wondering, it, it's been determined that it's still needed there, right? Do you want me to go like that? Yeah, to clarify, so that was like the question from Councillor Tang was from our non-rider survey. And the question we ask there, among the other questions in that survey is, what measures would bring you back to transit? And I've now looked it up. So in the report, we talk about number two and three being around uh, more direct routes and, and faster routes. Number one is actually around safety and security. So I'm um, improving oh. um, safety for riders. Okay. Awesome. Okay. I just want to make sure that we were using the funds in, in the best place. So yeah, put it on Hughes way. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess similar vein. So just my last question, uh, appreciate that's really helpful just in terms of, you know, this is based on data of where there are current delays, room for improvement. And just want to confirm that again, even if routing were to change along Jasper Ave in the future, the time horizons, like the, the return on investment is still there in terms of the scope and scale of what we would be fixing or investing in? Yeah, <laughs> I'll start, Natalie can, can chime in. We have uh, a lot of different local service routes that I think are still important and carry lots of people. Um, so I'll keep it at that, I think. Yeah. Great, okay, that, that's all I had. Um, I'll go now to Councillor Salvador. Um, yeah, so just to follow up on that and maybe ask a more specific question, given the rapid population growth we are experiencing um, and that the mass transit plan is targeted out to 1.25, um, is the intention for um, the uh, priority measures to, I guess, relieve some of that pressure as population is increasing? So I think I alluded to it a little bit in the report. We have to wait and see what gets implemented. Any efficiencies we gain are going to help address the service deficit we have. The pressure is accelerated. The gap is growing. And our next report in particular, we've got some really big challenges and constraints to work through from a service perspective to be able to, you know, provide service to meet the standards expected for that population. Right. Okay. But until we actually know what exactly is going to be put in, it's hard to say what, to what degree that Exactly. Will, yeah. To be able to quantify it, to say we've gained an extra 100 service hours yeah. a week 
because buses are faster, they're more reliable, et cetera. We're not quite there yet at that level of detail. Gotcha. Um, and I know it was mentioned there's a possibility of bringing forward a memo Q1 2025 with additional updates. Do you need direction for that from committee or can that just happen? Yeah, we're happy to do that. Don't need direction to do so. Okay. Well, I know I'd, I'd appreciate seeing that one. Um, that's it for me. Thanks so much. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Tang? Um, I'll just put the motion on the floor to receive this information, this report for information. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Any questions on the motion? Anyone wishing to speak to the motion? I'll, I'll briefly add, you know, really appreciate this report. Exciting to see this work moving forward and look forward to the improvements uh, to the reliability of our service moving forward. Thank you. Not seeing anyone else? Councillor Tang to close? No? Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. Thank you very much. We're now on to our last item of the day. Um, 7.6 Edmonton Transit Service Bus Fleet Replacement Plan. I believe... <laughs> buses. Um... I'm not sure if administration has a presentation, but happy to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, Councillor Salvador's comments are a good segue into this presentation. So, um, so our presentation today is an opportunity for us to dig a little deeper into transit fleet renewal. Uh, this is a topic that's really critical to city operations. Fleet age impacts and reliability. Our fleet age impacts our reliability, the reliability of our service and how much service we can put out on the road. Uh, the challenges we face as an organization around all of the renewal budget uh, has been uh, discussed with council on a few occasions during the development of the full year budget and, subs and, uh, and subsequently. This particular report uh, stems from some of the ideas we've had around how we address the challenges in, in bus fleet. So I'll pass it over to Carrie and uh, she'll walk us through the presentation. Thanks, Eddie, and sorry you're stuck with me again. Um, in August 2023, uh, as you recall, we presented three reports that day, and we talked about service hours, and we shared that transit service levels have not kept up uh, with the city's population, and our planners had determined there was a gap of 260,000 annual transit uh, bus service hours between our service levels and our transit service standards. So in one of those reports, we outlined four opportunities to address that service gap. So it included repurposing the temporary Valley Line Southeast uh, precursor bus service hours to permanently add them to the bus network. The second one was adding service hours through the use of a small satellite transit garage and uh, procuring some buses for that service. The third was focused on the new Southeast transit garage that'll open uh, in a few years time uh, down towards Ellerslie. And then the fourth was looking at fleet renewal to see how we can lower the fleet age of our buses which would reduce the number of buses used as spare buses for service, and I'll explain later what that is, and allowing them to be put back into regular service. So again, that efficiency piece that we talked about earlier. So the first two of these opportunities have moved forward, so thank you so much for uh, the support during the fall budget adjustment process. The third item with the new big garage uh, will be underway, and we'll uh, talk about that in, uh, as things unfold. Um, and then there was this motion to come back with the information today, which is why we're here. Next slide. So I'll just paint a picture for you of the current uh, bus fleet renewal context, uh, just to be um, kind of really transparent about um, the situation that we're in. So our conventional bus fleet consists of 968 buses, and most of those, about 797, are 40-foot buses. We have a smaller number of 60-foot articulated buses, and we have a small fleet of 30-foot buses, that we use for very specific service needs. The North American average for retiring 40-foot buses is 15.1 years, with 81% of these buses adhering to a 12-year age standard. So the vast majority adhere to that 12-age standard. In Edmonton, we're currently retiring buses at 18 years. Our fleet renewal plan uh, is based on conventional 40-foot buses having something that we call a midlife refurbishment. Think of it like a makeover for the mechanical aspects and the body of the bus. And that's typically scheduled around the nine to 10 year mark and it helps enable a longer useful life. Over the last 17 years, ETS has consistently replaced an average of 48 conventional buses per year. 
There have, however, been some peaks and valleys, which are really hard to maintain. So there was, for example, a large purchase of buses in 2007 and then again in 2009. So what that meant was 355 buses purchased in those two years. And guess what? Those buses are now 15 to 17 years old and will need to be replaced over the next four years. When we buy buses in big numbers at once, it puts pressure on future budgets to maintain that same level when we need to replace them, which is what we're seeing now. Next slide. So in this report, we shared the fleet renewal plan looking at 2024 through 2030. For the period of 2023 to 26, the plan uh, requires a replacement of 322 conventional buses and the cost estimate is about $257.6 million for that amount. This amount would be higher if the buses are replaced with zero emission buses as we've discussed previously. In the next budget cycle, an additional 233 buses are slated for replacement. In the 2023 to 26 capital budget, uh, the profile was funded at 40.8 million, which is about 24% of the ideal renewal investment that we require. So this funding supports replacing 22 of our 40 foot buses. So that leaves a gap of 300 buses between the renewal plan and funding. So when we look a bit further ahead in 2027, we will need to replace an additional 103 buses in that year. And that's due to the large peak in vehicle purchase that I talked about uh, between 2007 and 2009. So the number of buses to replace over the next four years represents almost half of our 40 uh, foot bus fleet. Next slide. So why is fleet renewal important and how can it help uh, us add more service? So a lower fleet age increases service reliability as there are fewer issues with vehicles breaking down and fewer issues with uh, vehicles running late. So transit agencies reserve a portion of the overall fleet that we refer to as spare buses. It's essentially a small pool of buses available at any given time to respond to things like breakdowns, provide bus contingency if there's issues with LRT service, and allow time for our maintenance, cleaning, and fueling. Since older buses require more maintenance, we need to have a higher ratio of those spare buses to accommodate all of those activities. So there's fewer buses available for ETS to schedule into service. Our current spare ratio is higher than normal at 24%. With a younger fleet, however, we would reduce that spare ratio and it would free up more buses that we could use to put on the road to address some of our service gaps without actually increasing our overall fleet size so it becomes more efficient. More service means more ridership and of course that helps contribute positively uh, to our climate goals. A younger fleet also costs us less to maintain overall and these are real savings which we could then harvest and again consider redirecting back into service and, or back into the renewal program. I'll now pass it back over to Eddie to wrap it up. So in conclusion, our, our report today was really about sharing with Council the context around the renewal plans, the approved funding, and how improved renewal plan can contribute to more, a more reliable uh, service or more reliable service growth. And we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I believe this was selected by Mayor Sohi, so happy to go to you first. Yeah, so if we were replacing 48 conventional buses, uh, in the past, right, over I think about 17 years. So what would change then, like why would we not, why was not recommended to carry on with replacing those 40, continue to replace 40 every year? We would for, love to have continued. We would have. Uh, it's our capital renewal budget. So the capital renewal budget just wasn't there to support uh, the fleet numbers that we typically replace each year. Yeah, but I know we put a lot of money into LRT cars replacement. So it was that choice that we, you have only so much money allocated that you had to determine whether you want to use that money for bus replacement or LRT car replacement. They were both standalone profiles. I'll okay. Turn it over to Eddie. I would say the LRT situation is worse than the bus situation. Okay, so, so that. We look at prioritizing the work. Okay. The LRVs are uh, 46 years old. Yes. Okay. So that's why we put, I think, two hundred forty-one million dollars into, into that, right? Uh, so, is there a way? I know we do this midlife refurbishment after I think ten or twelve years of uh, a bus's life. Is there a way 
Are there any other kind of interventions or maybe second refurbishment that extends the life of the bus? I think our Director of Transit Fleet Maintenance is on the call. I'll get Derek to chime in. So we're actually, which we haven't ever done before, we're doing a, we're calling it a life extension program. It's actually a second midlife on the bus. A number of the buses that you're seeing uh, in this presentation will be at 25 years or older by the time we get to 2027. So we're, we're at that point where those buses that have already received a midlife, they're now getting a second uh, mechanical overhaul. Okay. Yeah, but with that, you've got your original electrical components on the buses. You've got fuel tanks and things like that that aren't necessarily replaced during a midlife because the midlife is your major components. So we're we're stretching these vehicles as long as we yeah, possibly can. And just to be clear, it's it's a new program for us. This is new territory for us. Okay. I've been in transit for 22 years. I've never run a bus over 20 years. Okay. So I this see. will be the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, the the federal government's uh, new permanent public transit program kicks in 2026, right? They're saying it's 26, 27. Uh, okay. So it's in that, that cycle. Are there any opportunities to tap into that fund? For example, the way we built the South LRT, we had a federal gas tax funding. We borrowed money against that. Like, you know, that became a funding source to pay off the debt instead of coming out of tax levy. Are there opportunities for us to maybe use that future revenue as a source of, to pay off the debt if, you, if we borrow money right. and then it becomes a self-sustaining debt in, instead of a tax levy supported debt? Yeah, so I think the federal program hasn't actually received treasury approval yet. So that's a bit of caution. It's not technically signed off. Um, they haven't communicated all of the details yet to us uh, about that program. There is uh, apparently one of the streams will support some of our renewal activity. I just don't know the extent of it. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be allocated based on just like the previous programs, ridership and population. We'll and we'll do, we'll probably do better on, now that our ridership is actually better, Fingers covered crossed. better than uh, Yeah, other, it's just a bit of unknown right now. And then finance, uh, I don't think they're on the call okay. unless I'm mistaken. So we might oh, have to follow up on that piece. Okay. So what is the, like, what is the plan? <laughs> so I think we wanted to be transparent about the situation. Yeah. And then I think it's meant to be, so we're all on the same page as we navigate next steps, as funding programs become available, as other opportunities come up. Um, so when we follow up with you, we can just kind of, similar to the service hour uh, discussion we had last year just wanted us all to have that shared understanding of what the situation was and some of the risks and trade-offs with it. It's not great news and I apologize for that, but we wanted to be really open and transparent about the state of the, the bus fleet right now. Okay. So this is kind of awareness raising a report that yes. coming to common understanding and then you'll come back with some options for well, I think as we learn of funding opportunities, we will certainly advocate uh, about those opportunities and council can then direct if that's something that makes sense or not for you at that time. Okay. Um, again, we just wanted to kind of be really transparent about, yeah. about the situation okay. and jump in, Eddie. Yeah. Okay. okay, great, thank you so much. Um, I think this exercise and this report is very useful because as you will tell from the questions I have, there is, you know, a period of denial and and struggling to really wrap our heads around the, the situation that we're in. So am I, just, just for total clarity, recently we did approve the purchase of 20 diesel buses. Is that in addition to the 22 that were f the funded renewal? Yeah, it's separate. So that was okay. to support the additional service hours that are gonna get added. So that's, Great. those buses are specifically for that in intent. Okay, so we are gonna buy 40 new buses, but they're not, but 20 of them are not gonna be replacement. They're gonna be growth buses. There are buses. only 20 buses that were purchased. We didn't purchase 40. Oh yes, in yeah, addition yeah. to the renewals. My apologies. Okay. Yes. No, that's, that's like, 
poof. But but I think that's also the other clarification is that when we talk about, um, you know, the number of buses that we need, that is strictly for replacement. None of that is growth for new service hours. Correct, which is why we wanted to show you, especially the visual of as if we can lower the age, it will free up buses that I can put back into service. Mm -hmm. There is an efficiency factor. Well, and so talk me through that. So you mentioned there's a 24% sort of ratio. How often yeah. is that 24% fully utilized? Well, right now, because of the condition of the buses, that's where we're at today, which isn't great. So ideally, we want to bring that down to somewhere around 18% would be a higher spare ratio. Um, we okay. want to lower it as we improve the age of our fleet. But 24% is because of the aging fleet and the issues we have with the existing buses. They're not as reliable, and we need to have, have that level. So I think maybe, maybe I'm misunderstanding the difference between, um, and I'm going to use the wrong terminology, so we have 24% of our fleet that is sort of um, on standby, or or we have 24% that's currently going through maintenance. It's a little bit of both. So 24% oh, okay. covers the maintenance that is required. So obviously, the older fleet is going to have more vehicles in the in the garage being fixed. So there's a, a higher portion on on that realm. And then with, there's also standby buses that we use to cover off any fleet breakdowns or things like that that might happen in, in on the road. Okay, so when we look for that that contingency that's, um, you know, to, to be able to rapidly respond, again, do we have a utilization sense on that? And, and would there be other methods in terms of some sort of outsourcing? Could we make more use of that? How idle are those buses or are they, they pretty well needed? I think we can say they're very well utilized now. We had a bit higher number um, with the Valley Line uh, since the Valley Line opened, and we're going to bring it scale it down a bit because we haven't need that many. But they're very well utilized, and it's a very small portion of the overall spares. So when we talk about um, twenty four percent spares, only a handful of them are used for that okay. rapid response. Most of them are for cleaning, maintenance, that sort of thing. Gotcha. Perfect. Um, I I saw a hand raised from uh, Derek Hansen. I think I don't know if you wanted to to jump in there. Sorry for raising my hand. I was just going to add that it's we use our, our vendor contract to full capacity as well. Okay. Okay. That's really helpful. Thank you for that. Um, do we have any revenue possibility through the selling of old buses? Is that a market or any sort of strategy or is the resale just too low? Derek could probably answer that question. So we're working through that right now. We typically... It's, I don't know if we not want to go through the values, but we definitely start with other municipalities um, in the Alberta region in terms of disposal. So typically on a disposal, we get between five and $18,000. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, those, and then, and then again, sort of on the balance, and this is such an impossible question, but but would there be any value of revisiting the LRT replacement approach with more of a balanced mixed replacement between those two assets? So our poor old U2 train cars are falling apart. Okay. I'm not going to lie. So the level of disruption we're going to have is going to continue to escalate. I would not recommend that. Okay. Nope. Perfect. Yeah. Great clarity. Be far greater on the LRVs than on the buses, actually. Yeah. So. Okay. And if I could... We all want to speak to this. Yeah. Uh, replacing an LRV is sort of, um, it's different from buses. You, you um, have to do a larger purchase, and it's sort of a point in time, whereas buses, it's a more sustained overtime strategy. So I think replacing the U2s are, is a once-in-a-generation kind of big investment um, that's really needed at this time. Really appreciate the clarity on those questions. Thank you very much. Councillor Salvador? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the clarity and... Uh, and how upfront this report is about this challenge. Um, so I hear, I hear you exercising caution related to the federal um, permanent public transit fund. Um, are there other opportunities that you see potentially on the horizon? Because my concern is that even if, even if we decided, you know, we want to move forward on replacement immediately, our debt room is pretty tapped. Um, so if we don't have partnered funding, I'm not sure how we'd move forward. I think we share your perspective. And I think 
It would be a good conversation to have with our finance colleagues because that's my understanding of the debt room as well. Um, and I'm sorry if I seem very doom and gloom. I'm very grateful for the permanent public transit fund. I hope it comes to fruition. I hope we have access to all three streams, ideally. Um, it's just right now they don't have official treasury approval. They've been very careful in sharing information with us. It's been a slow trickle where we thought we would be much further along in the application processes. I think it's fair to say. So I'm cautiously optimistic. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I... I was also curious with the leasing option. Can you walk me through that? I mean, I digested what was in the report. I guess that's sort of a new. I haven't. I haven't seen that done. Yeah, it, it's done mostly in Europe. Um, so obviously, we're going to be when we talk about options. This is one of the options we'd like to explore. So coming out of this this meeting here it gives us the opportunity to kind of look into that, see what the options are, see what other people are doing, and and provide those options back to council at some point. So we have permanent tra transit funding that we can look at. Uh, this leasing option is something we want to explore um, and see if there's ability for us to do that. Obviously, you know, um, get build that on that reliability of the transit system side of it at a cost that's more palatable to the, uh, the taxpayer. So uh, we'll be exploring that option as well as we get out of this, uh, out of this meeting. So. And would, like with the leasing option, would those be considered capital assets anyways? Like would we run into the same issue, I guess? That's our understanding from finance. So um, Bill, uh, Michael, I'm sorry he's not online with us, um, but that was his advice is that they are a capital asset. So again, we'll have to, I think we can explore and then engage our finance partners and then bring forward uh, any recommendations to council. Okay. Sounds good. And then uh, maybe just a final question. Um, I know we have the hydrogen bus pilot through um, uh, the Alberta Zero Emissions Hydrogen Transit Initiative. Uh, any any indication about opportunities for maybe um, larger scale replacement or or partnership there beyond uh, the the two buses? Yeah, from a strategy perspective, I don't think we're there yet and haven't seen those opportunities. Um, and I think there's a lot of moving parts and different technologies that are emerging. And again, we want to make sure we have really good data and then we'll bring forward recommendations to council as we navigate this. Still committed to zero emission buses and it's just a matter of figuring out the right path totally. to okay. get there. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Tang? Yeah, I had a similar line of thinking about the leasing option, but I think it's too early to know like what's the best and no matter which option we go with, there'll be trade-offs and what we'll just does not feel like we can catch up without a significant injection of cash, right? Yeah, I think you're absolutely correct. I think that the reason why we have such a bubble right now is because we're in the same situation 20 years ago. So significant, uh, significant investment in, in cash came from the, the federal government at that time. We're kind of banking on, on permanent transit fund, obviously, uh, to help us with this problem. Um, but obviously, we're looking at those other solutions, too. So yeah. if there's an opportunity for us to kind of look at the leasing option that makes sense for us, I think that, that we'd explore that option and bring that to council with, with all the other options that we have to address this issue. Not something we can ignore, obviously. Yeah. Um, the more we ignore it, the more less reliable the transit system becomes, and you know, that'll be problematic for service. Uh, fortunately, right now we're we're able to maintain our service delivery, but we are seeing those impacts um, this year. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I never love when we bank on one option. So it'd be good to know that there's like other options, even however less desirable. Um, I guess first thing I'll do is put the motion on the table is to just accept this for information. And then speaking of the permanent transit funds, perhaps it's more a question for InterGov, but like, do we know the conversations like for expediting that and not wait until 2026? Yeah, there's been a lot of advocacy happening by different groups, including the Canadian Urban Transit Association. Um, and I know I was speaking with Yatende, there's a, an update coming from InterGov in general. I believe it's in May. Okay. So our thinking was to give you a really detailed briefing at that time of what we know. Okay, uh, so, on this so, fund. so this fund will be part of that. Yeah. That's that's good to know. Thanks. Um, and then, so just um, so I'm clear then, we're accepting this for information. Then what, um, and the next step is just to look into the leasing option, for example, just look at some of those numbers in place, right? Exactly. I think we will have that uh, public transit fund update for you likely in May with uh, the InterGov update. We'll do more research on this 
uh, leasing option and we'll make sure that finance is engaged uh, whenever that comes back and talk about the capital asset side of it and what it means um, and then any other funding opportunities that come up for us we'll be sure to bring it forward yeah and I think just on the public side of things you might see a request for information around the leasing option go out and I didn't want council to be surprised by something like that and something we haven't done before so mm. uh, part of being here too is is, is informing you folks of of that that may that we might see something like that come out uh, request for information to get us more information on, on how to proceed if a leasing option we could put in front of you okay so, so I guess okay um, I mean I feel like this is kind of a long-term planning anyways so we'll have something may and then you'll, you'll be putting out some of these RFP and then will, will you at some point come back to council and give us an update on what you've learned through all this yeah, absolutely we will. So I think that uh, part of the op like having options in front of you to, to be able to use and, and under us to understand what that looks like, I think um, putting that in front of you with some informed uh, ability for us to inform you better, I think is, is something that we need to do too. So uh, okay. we'll be in front of you with a, a report that kind of d details all that out. Okay, great. That's, that's it. <laughs> well, thank you very much. We've got a motion on the floor. Did anybody... Oh, no. <laughs> uh, did anybody have questions of the motion? Any last questions for administration or anybody to speak? Okay, well, I, Councillor Tang, would you like to <laughs> just maybe thank you to administration? Um, you know, we, this, this has been a very good conversation, uh, but doesn't detract from the seriousness of, of the situation that we're in. Um, this is the information that we need brought to council so that we understand um, what, what gaps there are in our system. And so I'm really grateful to the diligent work that's been done by the team to quantify and document this for us. Uh, we certainly have a challenge ahead, uh, but for me it speaks to the critical importance for continued advocacy on our part to the federal government to, to get this program going. Um, so thank you again for sort of um, providing us with the information that we need to have those uh, effective advocacy conversations. Councillor Tang, any further comments? Thank you very much. I know this is like super tough and um, uh, but I, I look forward to future updates that perhaps will keep our hopes up. So good luck with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. So it's a bit of a cheat, but we are at the end of our agenda, a bit ahead of time. Um, recognize we've postponed a few items to our next discussion on April 9th. Uh, just wondering if there are any notices of motions or motions without customary notice. Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you uh, to our team as always for keeping us on track.